Number five, Ashley Freeman and Laura Bible. On December 30th, 1990, 16-year-old Ashley Freeman had her best friend, 16-year-old Laura Bible, sleep over at her family's trailer to celebrate her 16th birthday. Sometime in the early morning, someone armed with a shotgun broke into the Freeman's trailer that was located outside of Welch, Oklahoma. Ashley's parents, Danny and Kathy Freeman, were shot to death in their bedroom and then the trailer was set on fire. After the blaze was put out, the ruins were searched, but no trace of Laura or Ashley could be found. It's believed that the girls were kidnapped, however, their whereabouts, and if they are alive or dead, is still a mystery. Number 4. Mara Murray In late 2003, 21-year-old nursing student Maura Murray was going through a tumultuous time in her life. First, she got into legal problems for using a stolen credit card. However, the court dismissed those charges after three months due to good behavior. Then, on February 5, 2004, a co-worker found Maura crying at work, but she wouldn't explain what was bothering her. On February 7th, Maura's father came to visit, and together they went shopping for a used car. They had dinner together, and afterwards Mara left her father at his motel room and she borrowed his car to go to a party. At about 2.30 a.m., Mara was driving back to the motel when she hit a guardrail. When the police arrived at the scene, they didn't make Mara do a breathalyzer, and so they dropped her off at her father's motel room. Her father then left the next day. In the early hours of February 9th, Mara emailed her professors at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and her work supervisor saying that there was a family emergency and that she would be gone for a week. She then called different numbers looking for hotel information in Vermont and New Hampshire. She also emailed her boyfriend saying that she wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone, but she would call him the next day. She then packed up her black Saturn sedan and at 3.30 a.m. she left her apartment. About 10 minutes later, she withdrew money from an ATM and she bought some alcohol. At about 7 p.m. that night, the Saturn was in a single car accident. The car was spun around and the windshield was cracked and both of the airbags had gone off. A resident who lived nearby offered to call the police, but Mara, who appeared to be uninjured, asked him not to because she had already called AAA. The area where the car was located had very poor cell phone reception, so the witness phoned the police anyways. When the police arrived, they found the car abandoned. In Mara's car, there were still all her belongings, but her cell phone and debit card were missing. Also, there was no record of a call to AAA. The man who called the police was the last person to ever see Mara. Police think that Mara wanted to disappear because she was acting despondent and it turns out that there was no family emergency. She had just used that as an excuse to get away. Mara's family, on the other hand, believes that she is a victim of foul play, although there is no evidence to back that up. It is as if Mara Murray disappeared into thin air after being involved in the accident. Her cell phone and debit card have never been located or used after her disappearance. Number 3. Karina Sagers Molinsky and Annette Sagers. Karina Sagers Molinsky lived in a cabin on the Mount Holly Plantation in South Carolina with her husband Stephen, who was the caretaker of the plantation, her daughter Annette, who was a product of the previous marriage, and her two sons, who were fathered by Stephen. According to Stephen, on November 21, 1987, Karina left the cabin sometime between 11 and 11.30 p.m. to go for a drive. The next morning when Karina didn't show up for her shift at the convenience store, the owner of the store went looking for her. He found her car parked outside the entrance of the plantation. The area was searched, but no trace of Karina could be found. Things took an even stranger twist 11 months later. On October 4th, 1988, Annette was seen standing outside of the plantation, not far from where her mother's car was found. She was seen at 7 a.m. by a bus driver, but when her bus came at 7.20, she was nowhere to be found. The only clue in Annette's disappearance is a letter that read, Dad, Mama came back. Give the boys a hug. Handwriting experts determined that Annette did write the letter. What isn't known is if the note was written under duress or if Karina really did come back for her daughter and leave her two sons behind. There is also some speculation that Annette knew something about her mother's disappearance and she was killed in order to silence her. However, without any evidence, it is unclear what happened to the mother and daughter. In 2000, the police got an anonymous call saying Annette was dead and she was buried in a wooded area. However, when the police searched the area with cadaver dogs, they could find no trace of Annette. Number 2. The Beaumont Children January 26, 1966 was a national holiday in Australia and the Beaumont children, who consisted of 9-year-old Jane, 7-year-old Arna and 4-year-old Grant, went by themselves to the beach not far from their home in Adelaide. 
When the children didn't return home at 2 o'clock for lunch, their mother contacted the police. Eyewitnesses were interviewed and they confirmed that the children were at the beach. However, they also let the police know that between 11 a.m. and noon, a man was seen playing with the children. He was described as blonde and lean and he was wearing a blue bathing suit. A short time later, the children were seen using a one note pound to buy some treats, but they didn't go to the beach with that much money, suggesting that someone may have given them the extra money. The last time they were seen was by a postman who knew the children well. He said he saw the children walking away from the beach at 3 o'clock and they were all in good spirits. After that, the three Beaumont children simply vanished into thin air and no trace of them has ever been found. An unfortunate footnote to this story is that two months after their three children disappeared, the parents got a letter saying that their children were alive and they'd be released at a certain time and place. However, when the parents went to the location specified in the letter, no one was there. A short time later, a second letter came saying that the parents had violated the rules and that the letter writer would be keeping the children. Years later, investigators concluded that the letters were a hoax. Number 1. The Sodder Children It was Christmas Eve, 1945, and the Sodder family of Fayetteville, West Virginia, returned home after attending celebrations. By midnight, all nine of the Sodder children who were home that night were in bed. At half past midnight, the phone rang and the family matriarch, Jenny Sauter, answered the phone. The caller was a woman who sounded like she was at a party. Jenny crawled back into bed and just as she was falling asleep, there was a loud thud on the roof and it sounded like something rolled off of it. Moments later, the house was on fire. Jenny, her husband George, and four of the children got out of the house safely. The family lived in a rural area with no immediate neighbors, but when George tried to start his truck to go get help, it wouldn't start. For the next 45 minutes, George and Jenny watched as their house, presumably with their five children inside, who ranged in age from 5 to 14, burned to the ground. The fire department didn't arrive on the scene until the next morning. The records were scoured, but there was no physical trace of the children inside. The obvious explanation is that the children's bodies were burned to ash. However, that doesn't seem likely because it's really hard to turn a body to ash. Usually it has to be heated to at least 2,000 degrees for at least two hours. The Sodder's house burned down in less than an hour, and house fires usually only reach temperatures of no more than 1,100 degrees. Therefore, there should have at least been some trace of bone or teeth, but there was absolutely no trace of them inside the house. Amazingly, things only got stranger from there. The fire department concluded that the fire had been started because of an electrical malfunction. However, a telephone repairman who visited the site after the fire said that the electrical wires to the solder house had been cut. Therefore, it was impossible for it to be an electrical fire. Another clue found at the site was a chunk of burned rubber. There was some speculation that the rubber was part of a firebomb and that was the loud thud that Jenny heard on the roof just before the fire started. A third oddity is that a man was seen with a block and tackle that was used for car repair not far from the Sodder's house before the fire started. Could this man have been the reason George's truck wouldn't start? Another clue that suggests that the five Sodder children were kidnapped instead of perishing in the fire is that five hours away from Lafayetteville, a waitress at a restaurant said that she served a man and five children who matched the description of the Sodder children breakfast on Christmas morning. The last, and by far the strangest clue, was mailed to the Sodders 23 years after the fire in 1968. The envelope had a Kentucky postmark and inside of the envelope was a picture of a man who looked like he was in his early 20s. On the back of the picture, someone had written, Louis Sodder, I love brother Frankie, Ila boys, A90132 or 35. At the time of the fire, Louis Sauter was nine, so his mother was unsure if the pitcher was Louis or not. No other mail came, and the sender never came forward. George and Jenny Sauter did not believe that their children died in the fire, and that they were alive somewhere else. Sadly, they both died before definitively learning what happened to their five children. Number 5. The Boys from Hannibal On May 9, 1967, 11-year-old Joel Hogue and his 13-year-old brother, William, came home covered in mud. The brothers were two of 11 children and they lived in Mark Twain's hometown, Hannibal, Missouri. When their parents asked why they were so muddy, the boys explained that they were doing some cave exploring. Their parents scolded them and the next day when they wanted to go out and play, they were told that they weren't allowed to leave the backyard. But sadly, boys will be boys, and the two Hogue brothers left the backyard. The brothers were last seen by firefighters heading towards a cave on the south side of Hannibal with shovels and a flashlight. 
When the family didn't find the boys in the backyard, they searched the neighborhood for them. They weren't found in the neighborhood, so they contacted the police and a larger search was launched. Around the same time that the police started searching for the Hogue brothers, the parents of another boy in Hannibal realized that he was missing. 14-year-old Craig Dowell was an acquaintance of the Hogue brothers, and a few witnesses thought that they saw him with the Hogues as they walked towards the cave. There were two problems facing the searchers. The first was that the caves were a series of tunnels, and in the tunnels there were several deep pools of water and steep drop-offs. The second problem was that thanks to nearby construction, there was a cave-in in the area where the boys were last seen. The initial conclusion was that the boys got trapped in a tunnel after the cave-in. Expert cave searchers and skin divers from around the country came to Hannibal and helped search for the boys for 38 days, but no trace of them has ever been found. 39 years after the disappearance, a construction project caused a new entrance to open up on a tunnel and on one of the walls someone had painted an arrow. The families were hoping that it was a tunnel that had not been searched. The tunnel was searched, but again, there was no trace of the three boys. Since absolutely no trace of the boys' bodies or any of the equipment that they had with them on the day that they went missing has ever been found, it has led to some speculation that the boys aren't in the tunnels at all and they were kidnapped instead. But again, there is no physical evidence to back up that theory either, and the whereabouts of the boys remains a mystery. Number 4. Leslie, Julie, and Timothy Gunthry In early 1977, 29-year-old Leslie Gunthry and her husband, Tim Sr., were living apart. Tim Sr. was living in Katona, New York, and Leslie was living with her mother and the couple's two children in nearby White Plains. Although the couple was split up, they still had an amicable relationship. At 1.30 on the afternoon of February 5th, 1977, Leslie picked up her daughter Julie, who was six, and her son, Timothy, who was three, at their father's home and they drove off in Leslie's 1974 green Ford Maverick that had a white roof. And that was the last time any other family ever saw them again. In over 40 years, not even their car has been found. At first, the police thought that the most logical explanation is that their car crashed into one of the lakes that are beside the highway that leads from Cantona to White Plains and their car is still submerged. But according to historical weather forecasts, 1977 was a cold winter in that part of New York and the ice on the lakes would have been thick enough for a car to drive on. The next theory was that Tim Sr. was responsible for their disappearance. After all, he was the last person to see them alive. The police quickly ruled him out as a suspect, and in the ensuing years he spent his life savings hiring private investigators and personally following up on tips and possible leads. The police thought that was possible that since their bodies and their car weren't found, that they are still alive and either chose or were forced to disappear. Just a year after they disappeared, a tabloid newspaper published a story about a hermit who lived in Utah near the Arizona border with several wives. There was a picture of the wives and one of the women looked like Leslie and in the caption it said that the woman's name was Leslie. The woman in the picture looked enough like Leslie that Tim Sr. and a detective flew out to Utah to check out the hermit and his wives. By the time that they got there, the hermit and his wives had left the area and no one knew where they went. Over the past 40 years, there have been several sightings of Leslie, but none of them have ever been confirmed and there have been no sightings of the children. If they are still alive, at the time of this video, Leslie would be 69, Julie would be 46, and Timothy Jr. would be 43. Number 3. Dalru Fallet On July 29, 1965, three men armed with guns stormed into a bank in Gothenburg, Sweden. They were dressed in women's clothes and they had blonde wigs on. One of the robbers watched the door while the other two walked into the bank firing wildly into the ceiling which sent many of the employees and customers scurrying for cover. One of the customers didn't flee and instead he tried to wrestle the gun away from one of the robbers and the robber ended up shooting himself in the leg. After robbing the bank they ran to a nearby river and discarded their disguises. Underneath the women's clothes they were wearing wetsuits. The plan was to jump into the water and swim to a getaway boat, but they were all arrested before making it to the boat. 
Later that same night in Gothenburg, the family of 16-year-old Shell Johansson became worried when he didn't come home. Then, over the next several days, the families of 22-year-old Gay Carlson and 21-year-old Jan Yolof Daswu also noticed that they were missing. The three young men were acquaintances and worked together. Months later, the authorities realized that they were all together when they went missing. They were all seen in a midnight blue 1956 Volvo PV444 on the day of the robbery. The young men in the car have never been found. But the story only gets weirder from there. In July 1965, Hubner Lundquist was hitchhiking from Skane to Lou Cecile, and when his parents didn't hear from him after a few weeks, they contacted the police. The last time that Lundquist's family heard from him was a postcard that was mailed from Gothenburg on July 29th, which is the same day that the three young men disappeared, and it was the same day as the robbery. This has led people to speculate that the four disappearances and the robbery are all connected. One theory is that the young men saw the robbers prepping for the heist, and the robbers killed them to keep them quiet. Another possibility is that the three young men were actually involved in the robbery and chose to disappear when it went wrong. Lundquist may have either been killed by the six of them, or he wasn't involved and his disappearance is a total coincidence. Or it is wholly possible that the disappearances of the three young men and Lundquist and the robbery aren't connected at all. Perhaps the three young men got into a car accident in a remote area or crashed into the water and their car just hasn't been found. Lundquist was hitchhiking, so it's even possible that he was in the car with them. It's also possible that Lundquist is still alive. There are two people who said that they saw Lundquist after he disappeared, but their claims have never been verified and he has never returned home or contacted any friends or family. Sadly, the families of the four young men have been waiting over 50 years to find out what happened to them, but they are no closer to any answers. Number 2. The Jack Family The Jack family of Prince George, British Columbia were a young Aboriginal family that were struggling to make ends meet. On the night of August 1st, 1989, the family's patriarch, 24-year-old Ronald Jack, was seen talking to a Caucasian man at a local pub. After talking for a little bit, Ronald left the pub with the man. Ronald then went home and told his wife, 26-year-old Doreen, that he had gotten them jobs at a logging camp out of town. They were apparently great jobs that included daycare, but in order to get the jobs, they had to leave that night. So they gathered up some of their belongings and got their two sons, 9-year-old Russell and 4-year-old Ryan, into the car, and then they drove off. At about 1.30 a.m., Ronald called his mother and told her about the jobs. Ronald told his mother some details about the jobs, but it didn't say where the camp was located. He also said that the family would be gone for 10 days to 2 weeks. Tragically, that was the last time anyone heard from the family. After the call, they disappeared and not even their car has been found. After the family was reported missing, the police went to their home in Prince George and it looked like the family planned to return after a short time. Next, they traced the call that Ronald made to his mother and they learned that the call was placed about 30 miles away from Prince George near Bedasti Lake. But in terms of clues, that was it and the case quickly froze over. Nearly seven years later, on January 28, 1996, the Prince George Police Department received a call from an anonymous man. The voice was muffled and it was hard to hear, but the man said that the family was buried at the south end of a ranch. After cleaning up the audio, they couldn't say for sure, but they thought that the caller said Gordy's Ranch. Based on the call, the police did end up searching a ranch, but there was no trace of the family. They also traced this call, and it came from a home about an hour away from Prince George. On the night that the call was made, there was a party happening at the house. The party guests were interviewed, but they all claimed that they didn't know who made the call. Where the Jack family went missing suggests that they may have been victims of foul play. They were heading west on British Columbia Highway 16 on a stretch of highway infamously known as the Highway of Tears. The Highway of Tears is a stretch of 450 miles of Highway 16 that runs between the cities of Prince George and Prince Rupert. Since 1969, nine confirmed women have gone missing or were murdered while hitchhiking on Highway 16. 
but Highway 16 isn't the only deadly highway in that area of British Columbia. On Highways 5 and 97, there are another nine confirmed missing or murdered women. However, many people think that the number of victims is actually much higher than that, quite possibly in the 40s, and that includes the Jacks. Many of the victims are Aboriginal women, and for years neither the Royal Canadian Mounted Police nor the Canadian government put a lot of effort into solving these cases. For example, Stephen Harper, who was Canada's Prime Minister from February 2006 to November 2015, continually rejected pleas for an inquest into the missing and murdered women. When Harper was asked about doing an inquest into the missing and murdered Aboriginal women in the run-up to the 2015 election, he said, Um, it, it isn't really high on our radar, to be honest. You know, our ministers will continue to dialogue, uh, with, uh, those who are concerned about this. Despite indifference from the government, in 2012, the RCMP announced that they had a suspect for some of the Highway of Tears murders, and he was quite possibly the person who was responsible for the disappearance of the Jacks. His name was Bobby Jack Fowler, and he was a transient who traveled extensively through the United States and Canada for over 40 years. In 2002, the RCMP announced that Fowler's DNA had been linked to one of the cold cases from 1974. 16-year-old Colleen McMillan was last seen hitchhiking on Highway 97 in August 1974 and her body was found a month later. Unfortunately, by the time the police learned that Fowler was McMillan's killer, he had been dead for six years. He died in prison in 2006 while serving the 10th year of a 16-year sentence for raping a woman he met in a bar. The question is, was Fowler the man who was seen talking to Ronald Jack on the night that he disappeared? That question may never be answered with certainty, because it's unclear where Fowler was in 1989, and the police are still trying to piece together his past. Fowler would move from town to town, sometimes staying no more than a day. He lived in rundown motels and made money by doing odd jobs. The police in Canada and the United States think it's possible that Fowler is responsible for over 20 murders. That being said, it's not possible that Fowler is responsible for all the Highway of Tears murders because at least three happened after 1996, which is when he was incarcerated for rape. Meaning there is at least one other killer who used the interior of British Columbia as their hunting grounds and they are still possibly free today. Number 1. Ann Miller, Patricia Bluff, and Renee Brule On the morning of July 2, 1966, 21-year-old Ann Miller picked up her two friends, 19-year-old Patricia Bluff and 19-year-old Renee Brule at their Chicago area homes. Brule and Bluff were friends from high school, and they met Miller because the women all boarded their horses at the same stable. They were heading to the beach at the Indiana Dunes, which is about an hour's drive from Chicago, and it's on the shores of Lake Michigan. The women arrived at the beach at about 10 a.m., and since it was a hot day and it was the Saturday of a long weekend, the beach was very busy. Many hours later, as the sun started to set, a young couple on the beach flagged down a park ranger. The couple told the ranger that they saw three young women go into the water at about noon, and while in the water, they talked to a man on a boat. Another set of witnesses described the man as well tanned in his early 20s with dark, wavy hair. The boat had three hulls, an outboard motor, and it was about 16 to 18 feet long, and it was white with a blue interior. The three women boarded the boat, but they didn't return, and their belongings were still lying on the beach. On the blanket were the women's purses, shoes, and clothes. The ranger gathered up the belongings and took it to the ranger's office where they were forgotten about because it was a busy long weekend. Two days later, the ranger's office got a call from Renee Brule's father, and he sounded panicked. The ranger checked the belongings and found a set of car keys that belonged to a car that was in the parking lot that had not moved since Saturday. The ranger called the Chicago police and found out that the car belonged to Ann Miller. He also learned that Miller and her two friends had been reported missing two days earlier. Searches were conducted on both land and the waters of Lake Michigan, but at this point the young women had been missing for 48 hours. During those 48 hours, thousands of people visited the beach, so finding any possible clue at the scene of their disappearance was impossible. At first, the police and the rangers thought that the boat that the women were on sank. Not far from where they were last seen, 
Searchers found pieces of what they believed to be seats of a boat, some oil and gas cans, and an oil-soaked piece of wood. But it was hard to tell how long the debris from the boat had been in the water, and the Coast Guard had no records of a boat going missing that day. Also, two of the women were very strong swimmers, so the police don't think that they drowned. The next theory is that the women wanted to disappear. Out of the three women, only Renee Brule was married. In her purse that was found at the beach was a letter addressed to her husband of 15 months. Brule wrote that she was leaving him because he spent too much time working on his cars and hung out with his friends too much. The letter was dated two weeks before she disappeared, and it's unclear why she never gave it to her husband. The husband was interviewed, and he said that he had no idea that she was unhappy. Burrell's family thinks that she may have written the letter in a fit of anger and then decided not to give it to her husband. She may have even forgotten that it was in her purse. The police concluded that all three women had personal problems, but nothing serious enough to fake their death over. If the three women didn't drown and didn't choose to disappear, they may have met with foul play. If they did meet with foul play, there are two very different sets of suspects. The first set of suspects is a pair of abortionists. Just before the three women disappeared, Miller told friends that she was three months pregnant. Patricia Bluff may have also been pregnant. At the time, abortion was illegal in Illinois, so it's possible that the women went to Indiana to meet a husband and wife team named Helen and Frank Largo, who performed black market abortions. On the day that the women went missing, the nephew of the Largos was at the same beach, and he matched the description of the man seen on the boat. The theory is that the nephew picked up the girls at the beach and then took them to a houseboat where the Largos performed the abortions. They think that something went wrong and all three women were killed to ensure that they would stay quiet and then their bodies were dumped in the river. This is only speculation and there is no evidence implicating the Largos in the murder of the three women. The second theory about who may have killed the three women is based on the stable where the women kept their horses. Four months before she disappeared, friends and family of Patricia Bluff noticed an injury on her face which could have been caused by a fist. When she was asked about the injury, she said that she was having some problems with some syndicate people. How this is linked to the stable is that the stable was owned by a man named George Jane. His maternal half-brother was a rival horse breeder and a stable owner named Silas Jane who went by Cy. Cy thought of himself as a businessman, but he was actually more of a psychotic gangster than a businessman. Specifically, he was the head of a criminal network called the Horse Syndicate. The criminal network consisted of riders, trainers, owners, and veterinarians who developed plans to kill horses to collect insurance money. Cy hated George because in 1961, one of George's horses beat one of his in a competition. After the loss, Cy swore that he would kill his half-brother. In June 1965, George asked a riding instructor named Cherry Rude to run an errand for him and to take his car. When Rude started the car, a car bomb exploded and she was killed instantly. The police knew that Cy planted the bomb, but they couldn't prove it. Since the bomb was planted at the stables where Miller, Brule, and Bluff boarded their horses, the theory is that one or all three women saw something that they shouldn't have and they were killed to silence them. Besides trying to kill his brother, Cy did have a reputation for violence and he has been linked to some of Chicago's most notorious crimes. Cy's criminal history dates back to when he was just 17 years old. He was convicted of rape and he was sent to a state reformatory for a year. The first major crime that he was connected to as an adult was the murder of 14-year-old Robert Peterson and two brothers, 13-year-old John and 11-year-old Anton Schusler. On October 16, 1955, the boys went to downtown Chicago to see a movie and they didn't return home. Their nude bodies were found two days later. They had been severely beaten and strangled. While the case wouldn't be solved until 1994, what happened was that the boys were hitchhiking and they were picked up by a horse trainer named Kenneth Hansen. Hansen took the three boys to Cy's stable where he was an employee. Once at the farm, he killed all three boys, and then Cy apparently walked in on the murders. Cy was worried that the scandal would ruin his reputation, so he helped Hansen dump the bodies. Then, eight months later, the stable where the murders took place just happened to catch fire. It's believed that Cy ordered the fire to be started to destroy any evidence of the murders and for the insurance money. 
Then, over the next 10 years, Sai continued to threaten and harass his half-brother. He also hired several people to kill him. In 1966, one of the men who Sai asked to kill his half-brother went to the police, but when it came time to testify against him in court, the man said that he had amnesia. The man was sent to jail for 30 days for contempt, and Sai was acquitted. Obviously, George was nervous and feared for his own life, so he had a tracker placed on Sai's car. On January 19, 1969, George had 28-year-old Frank Michelle, who was the son of one of his employees, go to Sai's house and change the battery on the tracker. Hours later, Michelle would be dead. According to Sai, he was watching TV when someone rang the doorbell. He grabbed a gun and asked who was at the door. Sai said the man fired three shots into the door, so he fired back. Sai then went upstairs, grabbed two more guns, including an M1 rifle, and continued to fire at Michelle from the second floor as he was trying to flee. Sai then walked outside and found Michelle bleeding to death. From eight feet away, he fired his rifle twice, killing the already dying man. The shooting was ruled self-defense and Silas was never charged. On October 28, 1970, Sai finally managed to kill his half-brother George. As George was playing cards in his home with his family on his son's 16th birthday, a bullet fired by a hitman hired by Sai came through a window and he was fatally wounded. Sai was arrested and in 1973 he was only convicted of conspiracy to commit murder and not the murder itself. He was given a sentence of 6 to 20 years in prison and he served under 7 years. Sai was released from prison in 1979 and he died from leukemia on July 13, 1987. After Sai was dead and there was no longer the fear of reprisals, witnesses started to come forward about crimes that Sai and the syndicate were responsible for. One crime that tied all the syndicate crimes together is one that they may not have committed. That is the case of 65-year-old candy heiress Helen Brock, who was last seen alive on February 17, 1977, leaving the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Jack Matlick, who worked as her chauffeur and houseman, claims that she was home for a few days and then he drove her to the airport so she could go to Florida. He didn't report her missing for two weeks, and during that time he had two rooms repainted in Brock's home and the carpet in one of the rooms was replaced. He took two polygraph tests about her whereabouts and he failed both of them. He also admitted that he got into a fight with her before she disappeared and that he stole money from her. What's interesting is that the investigation led to a second suspect, a gigolo and a horse seller named Richard Bailey. Bailey's business partner in the horse business was Sai's nephew, Frank Jane. Bailey had been dating Brock at the time of her disappearance and he was selling her horses at inflated prices. The police thought that Brock found out that Bailey was swindling her and she was going to tell the police. The police said that Bailey arranged to have her killed, quite possibly on the orders of Sai, who was in prison at the time. In 1995, Bailey pleaded guilty to 16 counts of racketeering and fraud, but he denied swindling Brock and he swore that he didn't have her killed. Amazingly, even though Bailey was in charge with Brock's murder, the judge thought that it was more probable that he committed the murder than not, so he sentenced Bailey to 30 years in prison. Bailey has been in prison ever since and in 2017 he asked for a clemency hearing. Malik was never charged in connection with the disappearance of Brock and he died in a nursing home in 2011. The investigation into Brock's disappearance uncovered more of the syndicate's crimes which included killing horses in horrific ways for insurance money. It also led to Kenneth Hansen being charged in 1994 with the 1955 murders of Robert Peterson and John and Anton Schusler. During the 39 years that he spent free, it's suspected that Hansen abused hundreds of other boys and teenagers. He was convicted of all three murders in 1995 and he appealed the convictions. He went to trial again in 2000 and he was found guilty yet again. Hansen died in prison in 2007. Today, it is unclear if Silas Jane or anyone else involved with the horse syndicate is responsible for the disappearances of Ann Miller, Patricia Bluff, and Renee Brule, and the case is currently cold. Number 5. Alyssa Turney May 17, 2001 was the last day of 17-year-old Alyssa Turney's junior year at high school. It may have also been the last day of her life. On that day, Alyssa's stepfather, 
Michael Turney, says that he picked her up at her Phoenix, Arizona high school and they went out for lunch. Michael said that Alyssa became angry during the lunch because she wanted to have more freedom and Michael said that wasn't going to happen. He then drove her home and he left the house again at 1 o'clock, leaving Alyssa home alone. Over the next four hours, Michael said that he ran some errands and they picked up Alyssa's younger sister, Sarah. When he returned home with Sarah, Alyssa was gone. In Alyssa's room, there was a note with her handwriting that addressed Sarah. It read, Sarah, you wanted me gone. Now you have it. The note said that she was running away to California. Michael also said that a week later, he got a call from a telephone number in California. He said that he could barely hear the caller, but he was pretty sure it was Alyssa, even though he said her voice sounded different. Michael tried to file a missing persons report on the night that Alyssa went missing, but the police didn't investigate the disappearance because they thought that Alyssa had just run away and she would return at any time. Alyssa's family and friends said that it was very uncharacteristic of her to run away. She was close with her younger sister and her step-siblings. She had several close friends and a steady boyfriend, and she didn't tell any of them of her plans to run away. They also said that, like other teenagers, Alyssa had a rebellious streak. She occasionally smoked marijuana, and every once in a while she would skip classes, but for the most part, she was responsible. She was a good student, and she had a part-time job at a fast food restaurant. Finally, when Alyssa supposedly ran away, she didn't take the things that most young women would take with them if they were to leave the house for an extended period of time. This included items like her cell phone, makeup, and her hairbrush. Also, she had $1,800 in her bank account, and there was no activity on the account after she went missing. In 2006, five years after Alyssa went missing, a man named Thomas Heimer wanted to talk to the authorities about her disappearance. Heimer had been arrested seven months after Alyssa disappeared and he was serving a life sentence for a murder he committed in Florida. For no apparent reason, Heimer strangled and stabbed a woman companion to death and then stuffed her body under a motel bed. In 2006, he mailed out letters to several police departments around the country, proclaiming to be a serial killer that claimed the lives of 21 women who were never found. He said that one of his victims was Alyssa. When the police looked into his claims, they concluded that he was lying about killing Alyssa. For example, he claimed that Alyssa was a heroin addict, but none of her friends and family said that was remotely true. Heimer eventually took a polygraph test regarding Alyssa's disappearance, and he failed. The police think that Heimer probably saw Alyssa's picture in the newspaper or on the news, and he made up the story about killing her. Or he possibly killed another girl and mistook her for Alyssa. It's unclear if Heimer was responsible for any of the murders he took responsibility for, or if he was just confessing to get attention. While Heimer most likely wasn't responsible for Alyssa's disappearance, the confession got the police wondering who exactly was responsible for Alyssa's disappearance. They started by looking at the most obvious suspect, which was the last person who saw her alive, and that was Michael Turney. Alyssa's mother, Barbara, met Michael when Alyssa was three years old. They got married not long afterwards, and Michael ended up adopting Alyssa. Barbara died in 1992 from cancer, and Michael was left alone to raise Alyssa and her younger sister. Michael was a very strict parent who wanted to control Alyssa and her sister. He would go through their computers and their phones, and he recorded all incoming and outgoing calls. Michael also set up surveillance cameras both inside and outside the house. Some of the cameras inside the house were hidden, and no one else knew that they were there. When the police dug a little bit deeper, they had several witnesses come forward and they believed that for many years Michael had been sexually abusing Alyssa. A year before Alyssa disappeared, Michael did something rather unusual. He called Child Protective Services and he told them that if Alyssa did call and accused him of sexual abuse, that they shouldn't believe her. Finally, Michael also wrote out strange contracts which he made Alyssa sign. One contract, 
dated a year before Alyssa went missing, stated that Michael had not sexually abused her and Alyssa had signed it. This led the police to believe that Michael killed Alyssa because she threatened to expose the sexual abuse. The police tried to interview Michael, but he refused to cooperate. He would only talk to them over the phone or through email. He also refused to take a polygraph test. The police asked Michael if he had the surveillance footage from the day that Alyssa went missing, and if he did have it, would they be able to see it. Michael said that he did have the footage, but it didn't show anything of interest, and he refused to hand it over. Instead, he gave them video clips from months before the disappearance that showed some teenage boys talking to Alyssa outside the house. Finally, they asked Michael for a DNA sample, and once again, he refused. At this point, the police were tired of getting stonewalled by Michael, so they got a court order to get his DNA. When they went into his house, they made a startling discovery. Inside the house, there were 26 homemade bombs and 19 high-caliber rifles. A van on the property was also rigged with gas canisters so that the van would burst into flames. This led to the neighborhood being evacuated while the explosives were cleared out and Michael was arrested on weapons charges. Once all the explosives were cleared out, the police continued to search the house. They found video footage of Alyssa all the way back into the 1980s, but there was no footage of the day that she went missing. They also found a 98-page manifesto written by Michael called Diary of a Madman Martyr. In the manifesto, Michael says that assassins from the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers killed Alyssa. In the 1980s and early 1990s, Michael was an electrician. He stopped working in 1992 because he was injured, and then in 1993 he was laid off. Three weeks after he was laid off, his wife and Alyssa's mother, Barbara, died of cancer. In the manifesto, Michael said when he was working, he complained about safety conditions. In retaliation for his complaints, the union kidnapped Alyssa, killed her, and buried her in the California desert. He also wrote that he had killed the two assassins from the union who killed Alyssa, and that he was going to get the ultimate revenge. He was going to drive his van, rigged with the bombs, into a meeting at the Union Hall. He was planning on shooting as many people as he could, and then he was going to set off the bombs. The police think that it was an incredible stroke of luck that they went to Michael's house when they did. They went to Michael's house on December 11th, and the next Union meeting was on December 15th. Michael said that the bombs weren't his, and they were planted there by the police. He did admit that he planned on committing suicide because he thought that it would bring attention to Alyssa's case. In 2010, Michael was convicted of unlawfully possessing destructive devices and he was given 10 years in prison. Michael has always denied being involved in his stepdaughter's disappearance and Alyssa Turney's whereabouts are unknown to this day. Number 4. Deborah Poe In late 1989, 26-year-old Deborah Poe moved from Virginia to Orlando, Florida. In Orlando, Poe had two full-time jobs. During the day, she worked at the Orlando Sentinel in the retail sales department. Then, overnight, she worked alone at a Circle K convenience store. Poe's boyfriend was worried about her working alone at night at the store. On several of her shifts, men harassed her. In January 1990, a naked man came in and chased Poe around the store. Luckily, she was able to lock him out of the store. Two weeks later, in the early morning hours of February 4th, Poe was working alone in the store. At 4 a.m., a call came into the 911 dispatch from the store. A customer had come into the store and found it empty. The police arrived at the store a short time later. They found Poe's car in the parking lot, and inside of it was her purse, her paycheck, and her keys. In the store, they found Poe's smock, and behind the counter, they found a cup of coffee and a carton of chocolate milk. As for Deborah Poe, the 26-year-old was nowhere to be found. There were no signs of a struggle in the store, and nothing was stolen, so the police weren't even sure if Poe left on her own free will, or if she was physically forced out of the store. The police brought bloodhounds to the store, 
and they found Poe's scent. They followed her scent to the rear of the store, and then over a fence, and then at a nearby road they lost the scent, so the police think that she either got in or was put in a car that drove away from the scene. After the disappearance hit the news, some witnesses came forward. One witness said that they were at the store sometime between 3.15 and 3.30 a.m. on the morning that Poe disappeared. She said that Poe wasn't in the store, instead behind the counter was a young man. He had long black hair and dark eyes. He was wearing a black Megadeth t-shirt that featured a dragon spewing fire, a skull ring, and in his right earlobe he had a wire earring with a cross. The witness wanted to buy a pack of cigarettes and the young man wasn't sure where they were. The witness had to point out where they were and then she paid the man who rang up her purchase on the cash register and then he gave her some change. Half an hour later the store was found with no one inside of it. The police do not know if the young man with the black hair was involved with Poe's disappearance. Another possibility is that he was just another customer. But why would another customer pretend to work at the store? Also, if the man did kidnap her, it doesn't make sense for him to leave the store with her and then return a short time later. That would suggest that Poe was somewhere inside the store or at the rear of the store when the witness came in to buy cigarettes. Unfortunately, the police have never been able to identify the young man in the Megadeth t-shirt. Deborah Poe's friends and family are hoping that one day the man will come forward and maybe he can shed some light on what happened to Deborah. Number 3. Robert Dunbar The strange case of Robert Dunbar started on a fishing trip at Swayze Lake near Opelousa, Louisiana on August 23, 1912. At lunch, the Dunbar family walked back to their cabins and they realized that four-year-old Robert, who went by the name Bobby, wasn't with them. The family searched the immediate area, and when he wasn't found, the police were called in. The search of the area was extensive, but the only trace of Bobby that could be found were a set of footprints that led to a swamp. Witnesses said that they remembered a strange man hanging around the swamp around the time that Bobby went missing. Since no body was found, the police concluded that Bobby had been kidnapped by the man in the swamp. Eight months went by, and then suddenly, there was a break in the case. Not only had the police made an arrest, but they said that they found Bobby as well. William Cantwell Walters was arrested in April 1913 while traveling in a tented wagon with a young boy who matched Bobby's description. When the boy was brought to the Dunbar family, who lived in Opelousa, the town threw a parade and the boy rode in on a fire truck. Newspaper reports from the time contradicted each other, but apparently Bobby's parents, Percy and Leslie, weren't sure if the boy was their missing son or not. A major problem was that the boy didn't respond to the name Robert or Bobby. Another troubling aspect was that the boy didn't seem to recognize Bobby's older brother. Yet, the boy did look a lot like Bobby. Leslie was given the opportunity to bathe the boy, and when she did, she said that she recognized some birthmarks and claimed that the boy was her missing son, Bobby. Walters, on the other hand, was adamant that the boy wasn't Bobby. He said that the boy was Bruce Anderson, and he was the son of a servant who worked for his parents. Walters said that the mother gave him Bruce to be a traveling companion, and they had been together for over a year. At this point, the story was making national headlines, and that's when a woman named Julia Anderson from Barnesville, North Carolina, came forward and said that the boy was her son, Bruce. Just like Walter said, she was a servant of his parents, and she did give Bruce to him. She said in February 1912, she gave Williams permission to take Bruce for a few days, but instead, he kept him for 14 months. She just had never reported Bruce missing, and thought that one day, Walters would return with her son. The case fascinated the country, and a newspaper in New Orleans paid for Julia to travel from Barnesville to Opelousa to see if she could identify her son. The boy was put into a room with four other boys that looked similar, and then Julia was allowed to enter. The boy didn't recognize Julia, and she wasn't sure which boy was her son. Eventually, Julia did pick the correct boy, 
but she couldn't say with certainty that it was Bruce. Since she couldn't definitively pick the right child, and since the boy didn't recognize her, the lawyers declared that Julia had failed the test and this made headlines across the country. She begged for a second chance and she asked for permission to undress the boy so she could check him for birthmarks. After all, at this point, she hadn't seen her son in 15 months. The lawyers agreed to give her a second chance and she was able to undress the boy. This time, with much more certainty, she said that the boy was her son Bruce. But unfortunately, not being able to recognize Bruce the first time damaged Julia's case too much. The authorities didn't believe her story, and they refused to give her the boy. Julia was poor, and she didn't know anyone in Opelousso, so she was forced to return to Barnesville, and the boy was given to the Dunbars. Walters was convicted of kidnapping in 1914, and he was sentenced to life in prison. His lawyer appealed the conviction, and it was overturned on a technicality. He was released after spending two years in prison. The town decided not to retry him because the trial was so expensive the first time. As for Julia, she had two other children in Barnesville, but she lost both of them not long after she got back home. Her infant son suddenly died, and she had to give up her daughter for adoption. She would go on to marry, and she had seven more children. She told her children that they had a half-brother who was stolen from her and given to another family. The boy grew up as Robert Dunbar, and he had four children. During his lifetime, he gave one interview, and he said that he remembered being kidnapped. However, many people who knew him said that he struggled with his identity his entire life. He died in 1966, and he was buried under the name Robert Dunbar. 33 years later, in 1999, Bobby Dunbar's granddaughter, Margaret Dunbar Cutright, started to look into the case. Four and a half years later, she got a DNA test, and it showed that her grandfather was not Bobby Dunbar. That means he was most likely Julia's son, Bruce Anderson. As for what happened to the real Bobby Dunbar is unknown. No trace of him has ever been found. Number 2. Nicole Morin In the summer of 1985, Nicole Morn was 8 years old and she was living with her parents in a penthouse in an apartment building in the Toronto, Ontario neighborhood of Etobicoke. On the morning of July 30th, Nicole put on her favorite bathing suit and sandals and said goodbye to her mother. She was going downstairs to the lobby to meet her friend to go swimming at the building's outdoor pool. The friend waited for Nicole for 15 minutes in the lobby, but Nicole never showed up. So her friend called her apartment on the intercom, and Nicole's mother, Jeanette, said that Nicole had already left for the pool. The friend waited for a few more minutes, and then she just figured Nicole couldn't come swimming for some reason, so she just went to the pool by herself. Hours later, when Nicole didn't return home, Jeanette knew something was wrong. The building was searched but Nicole was nowhere to be found. The police were called and it led to one of the biggest and most exhaustive searches in Canadian history. But sadly, not a single trace of Nicole has ever been found. It was as if she slipped through a crack in reality once she left her apartment. But of course, that isn't what happened. Nicole had been kidnapped, but by who? No one saw Nicole after she walked out of her apartment door so it's not clear if she was kidnapped on her floor or on the elevator. What is known is that she did not make it to the lobby where her friend was waiting. The kidnapper could have been someone who was visiting the apartment building, like a guest or a maintenance person, and she was taken out of the building right away. But no one saw anything suspicious, like someone carrying Nicole out of the building. Another possibility is that she was kidnapped by someone who lived in the building, quite possibly on her floor. Both theories are just as plausible, but the police have no evidence to back up either. A woman was seen on Nicole's floor about 45 minutes before she disappeared. She was on the opposite end of the hall from the Morin's penthouse, and she was holding a notepad. She was described as a white woman, about 35 years old, 5'5 five five to 5'7, five and she was slender with a fair complexion. She was wearing a white skirt with a black design and a white or cream blouse. 
The police don't think that she was involved in the kidnapping, but she may have witnessed something. A month after Nicole disappeared, Jeanette said that she felt in her heart that her daughter had been killed. Nicole's father, Art, says that he hopes that Nicole is still alive. He says that he still has hope because Nicole wasn't the only child that Jeanette had go missing. She had a son from a previous marriage and his father kidnapped him. Then, one day out of the blue, after being missing for 15 years, her son surprised her by knocking on her front door. Sadly, Jeanette never found out the fate of the second child she had go missing. She died of a heart attack in 2007. 29 years after Nicole went missing, the police announced that they were reopening the case. Not long afterwards, a tip came in and the police were told to search a rural property in the township of Springwater, Ontario, which is about an hour north of Toronto. This was the second time the police received a tip to search that area. The police had searched that area in 1985 because an anonymous phone call led them there. Both times that the area was searched, the police didn't turn up any evidence that Nicole's remains were there. The police and Nicole's father are hoping that one day, Nicole will be found and they are all praying that when she is found, that she is still alive. If Nicole is still alive, then she is 43 years old at the time of this video. Number 1. Edward Maps Edward Maps was born in June 1922, and as an adult, he was a sculptor, but he never held down a steady job. Instead, he lived with older women and constantly moved around. He dressed like a beatnik, and he wore sandals year-round, even though he lived in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, which has winters that aren't exactly sandal-friendly. In July 1960, when Edwards was in his late 30s, he married 21-year-old Christine Wolbach after only knowing her for two months. In September of 1961, Christine gave birth to a daughter named Julia Louise. On the night of January 21, 1962, all three members of the Maps family were visiting a neighbor. The neighbor said that it was a pleasant visit and they had given her a pie. They left her house around 9.05 p.m and the neighbor said that nothing appeared to be out of the norm. At 10.48 p.m., a call came into the fire station in Stroudsburg. The MAPS house was on fire. The fire department arrived at the MAPS house a short time later. Inside the house, they found Christine and Julia Louise. Both mother and daughter were rushed to the hospital. Sadly, Julia Louise was pronounced dead on arrival. She had died from smoke inhalation. Christine died a few hours later, but the fire didn't cause her death. Instead, she had been struck three times in the head with a four-inch blunt instrument. She died from a cerebral hemorrhage. The fire was an obvious act of arson. Most likely it was started to destroy any evidence at the crime scene. The rest of the house was searched and they found Edward's wallet and some pieces of identification that belonged to him, along with some of his stocks, but he wasn't in the house. Three hours after the fire was discovered, Edward was officially charged with the murder of his wife and infant daughter. And within hours, the local bus station, train station, and all the diners were checked, but no one had seen Edward. As the police investigated the case, they became more convinced that Edward was the killer. First off, the police really didn't like Edward's bohemian lifestyle. The police also learned that Edward had a history of mental illness. During World War II, he served in the Marines. After he was discharged in November 1945, he had to be hospitalized for his mental issues. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia, but in hindsight, he was probably suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which wasn't diagnosed back then. They concluded that Edward felt claustrophobic in his family life, so he beat his wife to death, and then using piles of clothes, but no accelerants, he lit 10 fires around the house. He then turned on the gas oven to 450 degrees and left the door open to hurry along the fire. He then simply walked out the front door and left his four-month-old daughter to die inside the burning house. The fire did not engulf the house because it didn't get enough oxygen because the windows were closed. Had the windows been open, the house might have been destroyed. 
During the search for Edward, there were hundreds of unconfirmed sightings of him. Edward also supposedly called a few people on the phone. One woman, who said that she was a friend of Edward's, got a call from someone claiming to be Edward, and he said that he was going to kill her next. Another call was made to a man who knew Christine's parents, Robert and Julia. During the call, Edward apparently told the man to tell Robert that he forgave him. The man didn't know what Edward meant by this, and he didn't ask for clarification. Instead, the man encouraged Edward to turn himself in. Edward told the man to give his love to Julia, and then he hung up the phone. The police thought that the man was a credible witness, and the call removed any doubt from their minds that Edward was the killer. Six months after the fire, Edward still had not been found, and he was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. He remained on the most wanted list for five years, and then the district attorney in Stroudsburg requested that he be removed for reasons that weren't made public. Then, on October 21, 1971, Edward was declared legally dead. His body had not been found, and no reason was given for declaring him dead. To this day, Edward has never been found dead or alive. Looking back on the case decades later, some investigators do not think that Edward killed his wife and daughter. They point out that all the evidence against Edward is circumstantial. The main argument that tries to prove Edward is guilty is that he wasn't found at the house. But that raises the question, how did Edward get away from the house? Both of the family's cars were in the garage with the keys in the ignition. No buses ran in that area, and the cab companies have no records of anyone calling for a cab at that time in that area. The fire department thought that the fire had been burning for about 40 minutes before the call came in at 10.48. That means Christine was attacked sometime after 9.05, which is when the maps left their neighbors, and 10.10 when the fire was started. Within three hours of the fire, Edward was the most wanted man in the city, but he somehow managed to get away undetected without his car or some type of public transit. This would suggest that Edward secretly had a third car, or he was driven away from the scene either by an accomplice or the real killer. Another problem with the police and the district attorney's case against Edward was that they didn't like his lifestyle and they made unfounded judgments against him. They assumed that he was a mean loner, and he was secretly a gay man who hated his family life. But all of Edward's friends and acquaintances said that Edward was quite the opposite. They said that he was a gentle and kind man. A former neighbor of Edward told a story about how her husband had a terminal illness, and Edward spent time with her husband every day up until the day that her husband died so she could go to work. Also, everyone said that he loved his wife, and adored his daughter. Friends and family of Edward also point out that he had nothing to gain by killing his family and running away. One last oddity that was found inside the house was that all of Edward's sculptures had been smashed. An alternative suspect that was theorized by a local paper in Strasbourg was Christine's father, Robert Walbach. Robert had a violent temper and he loathed Edward. He was strongly against Edward and Christine getting married but he did allow the couple to live with him and his wife, Julia. The more time Robert spent with Edward, the more his hatred grew. He thought that Edward was lazy, and he did nothing but sit around the house all day. Edward also didn't pay for anything, although Robert suspected he had money. Robert's suspicions turned out to be true. After the fire, the police discovered that Edward had a $30,000 trust fund, which he withdrew money from every month. When Edward went missing, the withdrawal stopped. It also annoyed Robert how entitled Edward was. When Edward was living with Robert and Julia, he would answer the phone and say, Maps residence, even though he hadn't paid a cent towards bills. In October 1961, Robert's patience for his son-in-law had run out. Robert didn't just hate Edward, he also blamed him for the recent problems in his marriage to Julia. There were even rumors that Edward was having an affair with Julia. Then, one day in October, Edward chastised Robert for closing a door, so Robert smacked him in the face and ordered him out of the house or he would kill him. 
A month later, Edward, Christine, and the baby moved into the house where the baby would die and where Christine was fatally wounded. Around the same time, Julia filed for a divorce from Robert because she feared how violent he was. Robert was interviewed by the police three weeks after the murders. He said at the time of the murders, he was on an Alaskan airline flight from Miami to New York and he checked into his hotel at 3.15 a.m. But there were two problems with his alibi. The first is that Alaskan Airlines didn't have a flight from Miami to New York City at that time. Only one airline had a flight from Miami to New York City that night, and it was Paramount Airlines. Another problem with Robert's alibi is that a friend of the family tried calling Robert at 4 a.m. in his hotel room, but there was no answer. He couldn't get a hold of Robert until 8.10 a.m. There's no record of the police or the FBI checking out these discrepancies, probably because they were convinced that Edward was the killer. The problem with the theory of Robert being the killer, or hiring someone to commit the murders, is why would he do it? Yes, Robert hated Edward, because he thought that Edward was an entitled deadbeat who ruined his marriage, so he had motive to kill him. But either beating, or having his daughter beat to death, and then leaving his granddaughter to die in the house after it was set on fire, while making Edward disappear to make it look like he committed the murder, seems grotesquely sadistic for a motive like that. Why not just make Edward disappear and let his daughter and granddaughter live? The police never publicly considered Robert Walbach as a suspect in the murders of his daughter and his granddaughter and the disappearance of his son-in-law. If he was responsible, he took that secret to his grave when he died several years ago. Number 3. Michael Dunahee March 24, 1991 was a cool, windy day in Victoria, British Columbia. Just before 12.30 p.m., the Dunahee family arrived at the Blanchard Elementary School. Crystal Dunahee was going to play some touch football in a soccer field beside the elementary school. She and her husband Bruce got their two children, four-year-old Michael and six-month-old Caitlin, out of the car. Crystal zipped up four-year-old Michael's jacket and sent him off to play at the school's playground only a few feet from the parking lot. Crystal and Bruce carried Caitlin and some supplies over to the soccer field. They thought it would be safe because there were at least a dozen adults and several children in the schoolyard at the time. Michael was out of their sight for no more than a few minutes. When Bruce walked to the playground, Michael wasn't there. His parents phoned the police, and they arrived at the school within minutes. A massive search was conducted, but no trace of Michael was found. All the detectives from the sexual abuse division were called in, and they worked for 30 days straight. 1,600 leads came in, but nothing fruitful ever came from them. The police think that Michael didn't make it to the playground, and he was probably kidnapped in the parking lot. The disappearance rattled the city of Victoria and many Canadians. Who would kidnap a boy from such a public area just a hundred feet from his parents? The police say that Crystal and Bruce did nothing wrong and they were just victims of circumstance. Michael's family hopes that he is still alive and one day he'll come home. If Michael is still alive, he is 31 years old at the time of this video. Number 2. Felicia Weaver At the beginning of 2015, 52-year-old Felicia Weaver was living with her ex-husband in the small town of Hayden, Alabama. Two of her three sons also lived in the house. Weaver moved in with her ex because he and her sons needed to take care of her because she had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Her condition was worsening and her family considered taking her to hospice care. She needed oxygen from a tank and she could barely walk 100 feet on her own. On the morning of February 5, 2015, Weaver's son, Michael Mullins, left his mother home alone. When he left the house, she was sitting on the bed playing with her iPad. While he was out, Mullins communicated via text with his mother. He sent a text at 2.37 
and said he was heading home. At 3 o'clock, he still hadn't made it home, and he also hadn't heard from his mother, so he became worried. He called his mother, but there was no answer. He then called his father, who answered the phone, and told him that the house was on fire. When Rollins made it home, the fire department was there, fighting a blaze that engulfed the entire house. Mullins and the rest of the family assumed that Weaver never made it out of the house, and she died in the fire. Because of her health, she wasn't very mobile, and her car was parked outside of the home. After the blaze was extinguished, the fire department searched the burnt wreckage of the house. They found the bodies of the family's three dogs, but none of Weaver's remains were found. The fire wasn't hot enough and didn't burn long enough to turn Weaver's body into ash. Also, if the dog's bodies weren't destroyed, a human body wouldn't have been destroyed either. The fire department is sure that there was no human remains in the wreckage. The fire marshal didn't say what caused the fire, but he said no accelerant was used. A massive search for Weaver was launched, but she wasn't in the area. Her family knows that she couldn't have made it very far on her own, especially without her car. Her family has no idea where she went, but they believe she is dead. She couldn't have survived very long without her oxygen or her medication. The police are not sure if she was a target of foul play, because why would someone kidnap a dying woman? If Weaver chose to disappear, where did she go? Did she start the fire? If so, why did she do that? Also, why wouldn't she have let the dogs out of the house before starting the fire? Unfortunately, unless Felicia Weaver is found, these questions will likely never be answered. Number 1. Juan Pedro Martinez At 6 o'clock on the morning of June 25th, 1986, a tanker truck was speeding down a slope in the Somo Sierra mountain range, which is about 60 miles north of Madrid, Spain. The truck was traveling at least 85 miles per hour downhill. Many people thought that the driver had a problem with the brakes and he couldn't slow down. The truck knocked the mirror off one car and rear-ended another one. The driver of the car that was rear-ended pulled off and watched as the truck continued to speed down the slope. The truck eventually came to a curve in the road and it overturned, colliding with two other vehicles in the process. When it did, the contents of the tanker spilled out. Unfortunately, the tanker was carrying 20,000 liters of sulfuric acid. First responders raced to the scene, and when they arrived, there was a fire because the acid had mixed with the dew on the grass. Lime was brought in to neutralize the acid and stop the fire. Despite three vehicles being involved in the crash, there were only two fatalities. 36-year-old Andreas Martinez, who was the driver of the truck, and his wife, 34-year-old Carmen Gomez, who was in the passenger seat of the truck. Both of their bodies had been burned with acid. About an hour and a half later, a member of the Civil Guard called Carmen's mother to tell her the tragic news. The news that her daughter and son-in-law were dead broke the woman's heart. She then asked if her grandson survived the crash. Confused, the civil guard asked the woman what she meant. The woman said that her 10-year-old grandson, Juan Pedro Martinez, was traveling with his parents in the truck. She wanted to know if he survived the accident. The civil guard told her that no child, dead or alive, was found at the scene. Carmen's mother then asked a question that hasn't been answered in over 30 years. Where is 10-year-old Juan Pedro Martinez? Andreas, Carmen, and Juan Pedro lived in Murcia, a city in the south of Spain. As a reward for getting good grades in school, Andreas told his son he could come on a trip he was making. He had to deliver a tanker full of sulfuric acid to Bilboa in northern Spain. Carmen came along to look after Juan Pedro. It was Juan Pedro's first time away from his hometown. Andres was an experienced driver who had driven to Bilboa before. He owned the truck and he was paying it off in installments, but he didn't own the tanker. 
The family picked up the tanker in a nearby city at 7 o'clock the evening before the crash. Just after midnight, Andre stopped for a short nap. By 3 o'clock, they made it to South Madrid and they got some gas. The family was last seen together and alive at 5.30 a.m. They purchased breakfast at a restaurant on the highway north of Madrid. The employee who served them said he didn't notice anything unusual about the family. About a half an hour later, the truck crashed. The first and most obvious explanation for the crash is that it was a terrible accident. There was something wrong with the truck's brakes and it was out of control as it drove down the slope. After the crash, the acid splashed and possibly pulled in the cab of the truck and Juan Pedro's body dissolved in the acid. But there are a few problems with that theory. The first is that there was nothing wrong with the truck's brakes. Secondly, Juan Pedro's body wouldn't have dissolved that quickly. It is possible to dissolve a body in sulfuric acid, but it takes a while. For example, it takes about two weeks to dissolve pieces of meat and bones, especially teeth, are even harder to dissolve. Also, plastic and rubber don't dissolve in sulfuric acid, so plastic buttons and the rubber soles of his shoes wouldn't have dissolved. Essentially, there should have been some trace of Juan Pedro to find, even if the impossible did happen and his body was dissolved. Finally, his parents' bodies didn't dissolve, so there's no reason that Juan Pedro's body would have dissolved. The next theory is that Juan Pedro was hurt in the crash and was burned with acid. He may have run towards the nearby river to stop the burning, and he died somewhere along the way. The civil guard doesn't think that is likely. They performed an extensive search that spanned a radius of 20 miles. They found toys, children's cassettes, and children's clothes in the cab, but there was no physical evidence that Juan Pedro was in the cab of the truck when it crashed. They even brought dogs to the crash site and they couldn't find any of Juan Pedro's remains. Also, while the scene of the crash was chaotic, no one remembered seeing a child there. The civil guard was stumped. They decided to look at the truck for any evidence as to what happened to Juan Pedro. The first thing that they looked at was the truck's event data recorder. An event data recorder essentially works like a black box in a plane. It recorded the truck's speed, when the truck stopped, how long it stopped, and so on. In the 23 minutes before the crash, as the truck ascended the hill, it traveled only 9 miles and stopped 12 times. None of the stops were more than a few seconds. The last one, which was near the top of the hill, was the longest. It was 22 seconds. An explanation for why Andres was only driving about 25 miles per hour and stopping frequently was because they were stuck in a traffic jam. But they were driving at 6 in the morning and traffic wasn't that heavy at that time. Juan Pedro's family thinks that this is evidence that he was kidnapped. They think that someone was driving in front of the truck going uphill and they kept slowing down so Andreas would be forced to slam on his brakes. On the 12th stop, within 22 seconds, Juan Pedro was kidnapped and the kidnappers drove off. Andreas was then speeding after the kidnappers. He lost control of the truck, resulting in the crash. A year after the crash, the Civil Guard made an interesting discovery in the tanker. The tanker had three compartments and only two of them were filled with acid. The other compartment had a large quantity of heroin that was wrapped in a blanket. Andrea's family then admitted that weeks before the crash, the Mafia was apparently harassing him and demanding that he courier drugs for them. This would explain why Andres brought his family with him for the track. If they stayed behind, they may have been targeted by the Mafia. This has led to speculation that Juan Pedro was kidnapped as ransom to ensure that the drugs got to their destination. The family of Juan Pedro said that the Civil Guard had a checkpoint set up not far from the crash site. They think that the gangsters kidnapped Juan Pedro at the top of the hill. 
Then they told Andreas to get through the checkpoint, and then they would exchange Juan Pedro somewhere on the other side. One problem with this theory is that transporting a kidnapped child in a vehicle isn't much better than transporting drugs. In a lot of ways, it's much worse. Hostages can make noise, attract the attention of the police or other motorists, and they can escape. Also, kidnapping is a much more serious crime that gets more jail time than transporting drugs. One aspect of the crash that both bolsters the theory that drug traffickers kidnapped Juan Pedro and raises new theories are the eyewitness accounts of people who were in the area when the crash happened. One eyewitness was the man Andreas rear-ended. After he was rear-ended, he pulled over and so did a white Nissan van. A man with a mustache and a woman with blonde hair got out of the van while an elderly woman remained inside. The man had what was described as a foreign accent and the woman said she was a nurse. She examined the man and then they got back into their van and drove off. Two shepherds also report seeing the couple after the crash. They said that they ran to the cab of the truck and took something from it and then drove off. The shepherds couldn't see what the couple grabbed but they thought it was a package. Some people speculate that the couple was involved with the Mafia and they may have grabbed some of the drugs that were in the cab of the truck. Other people think that the Shepherds didn't see them taking a package. Instead, they think that the couple took Juan Pedro out of the cab. They may have done this to drive him to the hospital and he died along the way. But if that is the case, why did they not report the death? Also, what did they do with the body? Another possibility is that the couple kidnapped the boy after the crash. Adding credence to this theory is a report that came into the Civil Guard in 1987, the year after Juan Pedro went missing. A man who ran a driving school in Madrid said that one day after the crash, an elderly blind Iranian woman came into the school. The woman said that she had been in Spain for six months and she was looking for the American Embassy. She was accompanied by a boy who was about 10 or 11 who seemed disoriented. The boy had an accent that made it sound like he was from the same area of Spain that Juan Pedro was from. The man swore that the boy was Juan Pedro. There is speculation that this elderly woman was the same elderly woman who was in the white van with the couple. Some members of Juan Pedro's family hope that this theory is true because it means he could still be alive. With so many feasible theories and so few answers, it has led to Interpol calling Juan Pedro Martinez's disappearance the strangest disappearance in Europe. Number 3. The O'Brien Boys By the fall of 1996, Gary O'Brien and Diana Saunders of Torbay, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada have been divorced for some time. The marriage produced three sons, Adam, Trevor and Mitchell. The marriage was also marred with domestic abuse. Gary had a history of mental health issues which included suicidal thoughts. Saunders ended up moving the boys out of the family home and into an apartment in nearby Mount Pearl. As part of the divorce, Gary was given weekly visitations. On November 9, 1996, Gary and Saunders were talking on the phone discussing that day's visitation. She said that the youngest boy, Mitchell, wasn't feeling well, so he was just going to stay home. Gary insisted that Mitchell come, so Saunders agreed. Gary then came and picked up 14-year-old Adam, 11-year-old Trevor, and four-year-old Mitchell. At 8.30 that night, Gary called Saunders. He said that he wasn't bringing the children back and she was never going to see them again. He also told her that he had rigged his house to blow up if anyone went inside of it. Saunders then asked to speak to her sons. Gary said, later, and then hung up the phone. Saunders called the police immediately and they went to Gary's house. His car, a 1989 Ford Tempo, was gone. 
The police did a check of the house and found that it was booby trapped. It was rigged to cause two 400 pound propane tanks to explode. The explosion would have not only destroyed the O'Brien house, it would have leveled several neighboring houses as well. The police were luckily able to disarm the booby trap. The police entered the house, but Gary and the boys were gone. Where Gary took the children and what he did with them are still mysteries. A year after they disappeared, the police were dragging the ocean floor in an area where locals pushed their cars over a cliff and into the water. They found an engine from a 1989 Ford Tempo, which is the type of car that Gary drove. The police checked the serial number on the engine and it belonged to Gary. No other car parts belonging to Gary or any trace of Gary and the boys were found in the ocean. So the police aren't sure if the car went into the ocean or just the engine. The boy's mother, Diana Saunders, thinks that Gary removed the engine beforehand and dumped it in the ocean. She thinks he did this to throw investigators off his trail to make it look like he killed himself and the boys. She also said that he booby trapped the house to give himself time to get away. Saunders thinks that her sons are still alive and they may be living in an off-the-grid community like a religious commune and they are cut off from technology. Gary may have also brainwashed them to hate her. Backing up the theory that the boys may still be alive is a call that came into Child Find Canada in 1998, two years after Gary and his three sons went missing. It was a woman who lived in Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is about 2,000 miles away from where the boys went missing. She said that she recognized the boys from their missing persons flyers. She said that she used to babysit them and she knew details about the boys, including their nicknames. Unfortunately, the woman didn't give her name and the police were unable to track her down. Her identity is a mystery to this day. What is also a mystery is the whereabouts of Gary, Adam, Trevor, and Mitchell O'Brien. If they are alive today, Adam would be 35, Trevor would be 32, and Mitchell would be 26. Number 2. The Springfield 3 June 6, 1992 was a day of celebration for 18-year-old Stacy McCall and 19-year-old Suzanne Streeter of Springfield, Missouri. It was the day of their high school graduation. The two young women spent time with their families and then that evening they met up at a friend's house. They planned on driving to a motel in Branson and then they were going to a water park the next day. Shortly after meeting up, they changed their plans. McCall phoned her mother and told her that they were going to stay the night at a friend's house instead of driving to Branson. Later that night, those plans changed again. The cops were called to the friend's home, so in the early morning hours of June 7th, they went back to Streeter's mother's home. Streeter's mother, Cheryl Levitt, had been home that night, staining a dresser. The next morning, a friend of McCall and Streeter called the house, but no one answered. The friend eventually drove over to the house. Parked outside were McCall, Streeter's, and Levitt's cars. The friend rang the doorbell, but no one answered. She tried the door and found it unlocked. She looked around, but no one was home. Throughout the day, about 20 people came to the house looking for the three women. At the time, no one realized how serious the situation was. Then finally, McCall's mother realized that something was terribly wrong and the police were called. When the police went to the house, they didn't find any signs of a break-in or a struggle. They found all three women's purses placed next to each other at the top of the staircase. They checked Lovette's room and it appears that before she left the house, she was in bed. Her eyeglasses were beside the bed and there was an open book on the bed. In Streeter's bedroom, the TV was on, but it was only showing static. McCall's clothes were folded and stacked neatly beside a bed. 
The only clothes that weren't there were her underwear and her t-shirt. The family dog was also there. It was very unusual for the family to leave the dog unattended. The police interviewed the friend of the young women who went to the house on the morning that they went missing. She said that the glove that went over the porch light was broken, but the light bulb itself was fine. Another friend cleaned up the broken glove because at the time they didn't realize that the women were missing and they just wanted to do something nice. The friend also said that when she was in the house, she received two disturbing phone calls. She said she only answered the phone because it might have been someone who knew where McCall and Streeter were. Both were from an anonymous man who said disturbing sexual things. He called once and the friend hung up. The man called back nearly immediately. When McCall's mother was in Lavette's house, she saw that there was a message on the answering machine. She listened to it and it was a man saying disturbing sexual things. After listening to it, she accidentally erased it. The police are unsure if the calls are related to the disappearance, but they think it's possible. Massive searches were conducted, but no physical trace of the women were ever found. The only possible clue is that several people saw a green 1964 to 1970 Dodge panel van in the area, and one witness was sure that she saw Stacy McCall driving the van. This is the only viable lead that has ever come from the investigation, and what happened to Stacy McCall, Susan Streeter, and Cheryl Lovett is a mystery. Number 1. The Johnsons In late 1969, 22-year-old Frida Dedman, who lived in Montgomery, Alabama, met a young man named Michael Johnson. They started dating, and not long afterwards, Frida became pregnant. In September 1970, she gave birth to a daughter, Sherry. That summer, they moved to Independence, Missouri. On Christmas Eve 1973, Frida and Michael got married. A month later, Frida gave birth to a son named Michael, who was named after his father. In May 1975, the family's landlord called the sheriff's department. He told them he hadn't seen the family for a while. The police went to their home where they met the landlord and they asked him when he last saw the family. He said that it was in early November, which was five months earlier. The police entered the family's home and found an open TV guide. It was open to November 10th, 1973. The police also found some blood on a chair, on a pair of socks, a shirt, and a pair of men's pants. In the closets, they found Frida's clothes, but Michael and the children's clothes were missing. The police interviewed friends, family, and co-workers of the family, and no one remembered seeing them after November 10th, which was the day that the TV guide was open to. The police also dug into Michael's background and found out that his real name wasn't Michael Johnson. His real name was Henry Lee Harbison, and he was wanted by the FBI for check forgery. He had also served time in Alcatraz and Leavenworth for transporting stolen cars across state lines. The Sheriff's Department concluded that the family picked up and moved somewhere else to stay ahead of the FBI. They probably just changed their names and were hiding somewhere else. As the years went by and Frida's family didn't hear from her, they began to doubt that is what happened. And in 2004, the Sheriff's Department announced that they are reopening the case. They had the blood tested, but it was inconclusive. After the case was reopened, the Sheriff's Department said that there were three theories as to what happened to the family. The first theory is that the Sheriff's Department was correct the first time, and the family simply moved away and assumed new identities. The second theory is that the entire family was killed by a person or persons unknown. Henry Lee Harbison was a member of the Church of the New Song, which is a prison-based Christian movement. 
His associates at the church said that the family was killed. However, they didn't provide any details backing up that theory. The third theory is that Harbison killed Frida and fled with the children. Frida's family believes this is what really happened. This would explain the bloodstains and why only Frida's clothes were left behind. Her family also thinks that Harbison threatened the landlord and that is why he didn't report the family missing for five months. One possibility is that after killing Frida, he killed the children and himself. But if that is the case, then where are their bodies? Frida's family, on the other hand, think that he fled and he gave the children away. He then established a new identity for himself. They said that Sherry and Michael could still be alive and may not even know that they have family that is looking for them. If they are still alive, Sherry would be 47 and Michael would be 40. If Harbison is still alive, he would be 83. Finally, if Frida is still alive, she would be 70 years old. Number 3. Robbie Floyd, Jennifer Hughes, Serena Glenn, Brent Hughes, and Brittany Hughes In the winter of 1996, 32-year-old Robbie Floyd lived in Fayetteville, North Carolina with her third husband, Jason, their child Brandon, and three of her children from previous relationships, 11-year-old Serena Glenn and a pair of four-year-old twins, Brent Hughes and Brittany Hughes. Sometime in December, a neighbor of the family noticed Robbie loading boxes into her blue van. She was with her sister, 17-year-old Jennifer Hughes, and an older woman. Robbie told a neighbor that the older woman was her mother. Robbie was in a rush, and she told her neighbor that she was going to Alabama. She said her father was sick, and she was going to see him. She then loaded three of her four children into the van, 11-year-old Serena and her four-year-old twins, Brett and Brittany. Then Robbie and her sister Jennifer got into the van, and they drove off. Her neighbor never saw them again. Robbie didn't keep in close contact with her family, and she was known to go voluntarily missing for long periods of time. As a result, her family didn't report her missing until a year and a half later, in August 1998. Robbie's family in Sylacauga, Alabama, said that Robbie did plan to move back to help with her ailing father, but she never arrived. They said they had not talked to or seen her since December 1996. On the last day that Robbie was seen, she was seen with an older woman. Robbie introduced the woman to her neighbor as her mother. But Robbie's mother said she had not been to her daughter's house for several years before she went missing. Robbie's father died in 1998 and she didn't come to the funeral. During their investigation, the police talked to Robbie's neighbors. They learned that Robbie's husband, Jason, and the one child she left behind, who was the only child she had with Jason, continued to live in the house where he lived with Robbie and her kids for about two months after they disappeared. Then in February 1997, they moved away. The neighbors also told the police that Robbie and Jason had been having marital problems. Before she went missing, they had been separated, and the neighbors said that Robbie told her that they were talking about getting divorced. However, it appeared that they had reconciled before she, her three kids, and her sister went missing. The police tracked Jason down, and he said that he talked to Robbie after she left North Carolina. She told him that she was calling from a motel near her parents' house in Silacuga, Alabama. She said she would phone again in a few days, but he never heard from her again. The police eventually cleared Jason as a suspect in the disappearance of Robbie, her sister Jennifer, and Robbie's three children. Then in 2004, a detective who worked on the mass disappearance told the newspaper 
the Fayetteville Observer that the family wasn't actually missing. He said on the day that Robbie drove off with her sister and her three children, the Sheriff's Department was coming to arrest her for writing bad checks. Robbie had been writing checks using 14 different aliases. The detective said that Robbie ultimately settled in Alabama. Supposedly, in 1999, she set up an address there. The detective told the newspaper that after he tracked Robbie down to Alabama, he turned the file over to the Alabama Bureau of Investigation. He considered the case closed. Then, in 2011, another article about the mass disappearance was published. In the article, the families of Robbie, Jennifer, Serena, Brent, and Retney refuted much of what the detective told the newspaper in 2004. The family members pointed out that no one has heard from them since December 1996 and other social security numbers have been used in the years since they went missing. A lieutenant with the sheriff's department verified the claims. He said that none of their social security numbers were used and no schools have asked for the kids' records. Also, the twins, Brent and Rentney, who were four when they went missing, had a heart condition and they needed medication. But there are no records of the twins seeing a doctor or visiting a hospital in the years since they went missing. The lieutenant with the sheriff's department said it was as if they don't exist anymore. Serena's father, Jerry Glenn, said, My gut feeling tells me something's not right. Just for five people coming up missing doesn't sound good from the start. If the five family members are still alive today, Robbie would be 54 and her sister Jennifer would be 39. Robbie's daughter, Serena, would be 33 and her twins, Brett and Rentney, would be 26. Number two, Diego Garcia, Carmen Burhans, and Barbara Burhans. In March 1982, 40-year-old Carmen Verhans lived with her husband, 28-year-old Diego Garcia, and their 8-year-old daughter, Barbara, in a house in the Glassell Park area of Los Angeles, California. Carmen's mother, Margaret Roman, lived in an apartment in the basement of the family's house. Diego was unemployed, and Carmen supported the family by working at an insurance brokerage. On March 15, 1982, Margaret came up from her apartment to visit her daughter and her family while they ate breakfast. Margaret noticed that Carmen had been crying, but she didn't ask why. Several hours later, at around noon, the family drove off in their brown 1977 Toyota Corolla. Sadly, they never returned home. After a couple of days, Margaret reported them missing. The police were instantly baffled by the disappearance of the family. The obvious answer was that the family skipped town for some reason. The lead detective on the case, John Carroll, said that one rumor he heard was that Diego had gambling debts and the family moved to Little Havana in Miami, Florida. One problem with that rumor was that the family didn't take their clothes, their luggage, or any of their possessions with them. They even left their dog behind. On April 27th, about a month and a half after the family was last seen, their car was found. It was covered in snow 500 feet down in a gorge in the San Gabriel Mountains, about 70 miles from their home. There was no blood or signs of trauma inside the car. The gorge was searched, but besides their car, no trace of the family was found. Detective Carroll said that it doesn't appear that the family was in the car when it went down into the gorge. Instead, he thinks that someone pushed the car into the gorge. The road where the car went down into the gorge had been closed since March 16th, the day after the family went missing. 
Detective Carroll said it was possible that the car was pushed into the gorge by someone who was trying to get rid of the car. He said that another possibility is that the car was parked on the side of the road and it was knocked into the gorge by accident by a snowplow. One reason the family could have abandoned the car was because they were having problems with the car. But no one in the area remembered seeing the family, nor did anyone remember a family looking for help with their car around the time that the family went missing. Carmen's mother, Margaret, told Detective Carroll that shortly before the family went missing, Carmen had converted to Mormonism. She also said that Carmen may have been involved in a cult that used candles and killed chickens as sacrifices. Detective Carroll looked at the family's bank accounts, and five days after they went missing, a check from Carmen's bank account was cashed. It was cashed by an elderly woman who owned a chicken ranch in Santa Clarita, California. The woman told Detective Carroll that she sold Carmen some live chickens before she went missing. Detective Carroll could not confirm if Carmen was involved in a cult, and he didn't know if her religious practices were connected to her family's disappearance. After the family went missing, Carmen's mother started getting strange phone calls. Most of the time, the caller would just hang up when she answered. Then one time, the caller told Margaret that the family had been killed because Carmen didn't come up with enough money to cover a debt that Diego owed. The next day, there was another phone call. This caller said they saw Carmen walking down the road in a white dress. None of the calls were traced, and the identity of the callers remains a mystery. The caller wasn't the only person who supposedly saw Carmen after she went missing. A high school friend of Carmen said that she saw Carmen at a shopping plaza in Los Angeles. Another person supposedly saw her at a hospital. The witness said she was with an elderly woman and they were buying flowers. And finally, in mid-April, about a month after the family went missing, the owner of a candle store said that Carmen came in and bought some candles. Detective Carroll couldn't confirm any of the sightings. He thinks that the family had their car stolen or they were victims of a carjacking. He said it's entirely possible they were killed for their car. Then the killer got rid of the car by pushing it into the gorge on the closed road. But since the family hasn't been found, Detective Carroll hasn't been able to confirm any of the theories about what happened to them. He said the only thing he knew for sure was that the family was still missing. Over 36 years later, besides their car, no trace of Carmen, Diego, or Barbara has ever been found. Number 1. The Clinton Avenue 5 August 20th, 1978 was a humid, overcast day in Newark, New Jersey. That afternoon, 17-year-olds Melvin Pittman and Ernest Taylor and 16-year-olds Alvin Turner, Michael McDowell, and Randy Johnson were playing basketball at Westside Park. As they played, a mutual friend named Lee Evans, who worked as a mason and a carpenter, asked the five young men if they wanted to make some money by moving some boxes. The young men agreed, and they arranged to meet up later that evening. At least three of the young men went home for dinner, and then they returned to the park. At 9.30 p.m., Michael McDowell returned home for a few minutes. He got a drink of water and changed his clothes. He then left his house and got into the back of Evan's pickup truck. Evan's pickup truck, with at least two of the young men in the back, was seen at 10 p.m. at an intersection near the boys' homes. After that sighting, the five teenagers seemingly vanished into thin air. Their families reported them missing, but the police didn't do much in the way of investigating. They just assumed the five teenagers had run away 
and they would get in contact with their families any day. A few days after the teens went missing, Randy Johnson's mother, Sarah, received a phone call. The caller demanded $750 in exchange for information about what happened to her son. Sarah reported the call to the police and they traced it. The call came from a payphone at Union Station in Washington, D.C., which is over 200 miles from Newark. The police thought it was one of the teens who were looking to get money to fund their excursion. But the caller never phoned back and never attempted to collect the money. After a few weeks, the young man still hadn't returned home and the police began to think it was possible that they met with foul play. The most obvious suspect was Lee Evans, the man the five teens were last seen with. Evans swore he had nothing to do with the disappearance of the young men. He said he dropped them off at an intersection near their homes at around 10 p.m. and that was the last time he saw them. The police asked him to take a polygraph exam and he agreed. He was asked if he had anything to do with the young man's disappearance, and he said he didn't. The polygraph examiner determined that he was telling the truth. Nevertheless, the police started trailing Evans, hoping that he'd do something to implicate himself or give some clue to the whereabouts of the five teens. Then three months after the young man vanished, shocking news emerged from Guyana a country in northern South America, and he gave the police their first possible lead in months. On November 15, 1978, California Representative Leo Ryan and a delegation of 18 people flew to Guyana to visit Jonestown. Jonestown was a commune established by religious leader Jim Jones for his church, the People's Temple. Ryan was visiting Jonestown on the behalf of relatives of church members who thought that the church members were being held in Jonestown against their will. Three days after arriving, Ryan, his delegation, and 16 People's Temple defectors traveled to an airstrip about six miles from Jonestown. At the airstrip, some members of the People's Temple opened fire on the group. Ryan and four other people were killed at the airstrip, and six people were injured. Back at Jonestown, 47-year-old Jim Jones told his followers that there was no hope. He said the American government was going to break up the church. He told his followers that their last act of defiance was to kill themselves by drinking some cyanide lace flavor aid. Parents were told to make their children drink the poison first, and then they were to ingest it. If someone refused to drink the poison, he or she were restrained and injected with cyanide. As many as 70 people were forcefully injected. After his congregation was dead, Jones shot himself in the temple. In total, 918 people died that day. 304 of them were minors. Only 85 people survived. Unfortunately, many of the bodies, especially those of minors, could not be identified. The police thought it was possible that the Clinton Avenue Five, as they came to be called, died at Jonestown. But they never found any evidence that the teens had contact with the People's Temple nor did they find any evidence that they left the United States or arrived in Guyana. While the police considered it possible that the teens died in Jonestown, they thought it was more likely that Lee Evans was involved in the mass disappearance. But in the years after the young men went missing, Evans didn't act suspicious and they didn't find any evidence that connected him to the mass disappearance. Evans maintained his innocence and he never moved away from the area. Then in 2008, 30 years after the Clinton Avenue 5 vanished, the police began to reinvestigate the mass disappearance. After several months, they thought they had cracked the case. 
In November 2008, the detectives working on the case interviewed Lee Evans' cousin, 51-year-old Philander Hampton. After 13 hours, Hampton confessed to being involved in the murder of the teens. He said that Evans wanted to kill them because they had stolen a pound of marijuana from him. First they picked up two of the teenagers and then they took them to an abandoned house where Hampton used to squat and sell drugs out of. Hampton said he was armed with a gun and watched the two young men while Evans went out to get the other three teens. Hampton said that when Evans returned to the abandoned house with the other three teens, he forced the five young men into a closet that was four feet by two feet. Then Evans took a single nail and he nailed the closet door shut. He then doused the closet door in the area in front of the closet in gasoline. Supposedly, he asked Hampton for a match. Hampton said he gave him a match and then he walked out of the abandoned house. Hampton said that later, he saw that the house was on fire. The police looked in the records and it turned out that the house Hampton was talking about did burn down the same night that the young man disappeared. However, no traces of their body were found in the wreckage. 30 years later, a new house stood in place of the burned wreckage. The police used ground penetrating radar to see if they could find any trace of the young men, like a tooth or a bone shard, but they found absolutely no evidence that the young men were burned alive there. Despite having no physical evidence, in March 2011, Hampton and Evans were charged with murder. The prosecution's case was that Evans was the last person seen with the five young men in Hampton's confession. In November 2011, Evans went to trial and he acted as his own attorney. He pleaded not guilty. Hampton made a plea deal with the district attorney and he testified against Evans. On the stand, he repeated the same story he told the police. He testified that Evans used a single nail to lock the five young men in the closet and then he set the house on fire. Evans' court-appointed legal advisor did the cross-examination of Hampton. During the cross-examination, Hampton testified that when he confessed to the police, he had been talking to them for 13 straight hours. He also said that in exchange for testifying, he was given a 10-year sentence, but he would be allowed to apply for parole after serving just six months. When he was released, the district attorney's office was going to pay him $15,000 for relocation fees. Hampton also admitted that he had been a heroin addict for 10 years and he sold drugs. He was in and out of prison for most of his adult life. This included a 10 year sentence for a pair of armed robberies. Evans' legal advisor even questioned the plausibility of Hampton's confession. For example, would five teenage boys be able to fit into a closet that was 4 by 2 Would a single nail be strong enough to keep the door closed? Or would five athletic young men be able to break down the door? Also, Hampton was a small guy, and the teens were all larger than him. When he was watching two of the teenagers, why didn't they try to overpower him and take the gun? Finally, if the young men did die in the fire, wouldn't someone have found a trace of them when the wreckage of the fire was cleaned up? Or when the police searched the area with ground penetrating radar? The jury ended up deliberating for more than 12 hours. They found Evans not guilty on all charges. At the time of this video, the case of the Clinton Avenue 5 remains unresolved. Even if Lee Evans was involved in the mass disappearance, he'll never be retried. He maintains his innocence, and no evidence links him to the disappearance of the five young men. Evans said that being accused and tried for such a horrible crime was devastating. He said, 
That's not the same thing as someone destroying you. It's like someone put you in the oven and burned you up. You can't undo that. No trace of Melvin Pittman, Ernest Taylor, Alvin Turner, Michael McDowell, and Randy Johnson has ever been found. Number 2. Elaine Labradou In late July 1989, 27-year-old Elaine Labradou, who lived in Toulouse, France, was suffering from a bout of depression, so she checked herself into a hospital in Balma, which is a commune east of Toulouse. On August 16th, she was still in the hospital. That morning, she went to an art therapy class. She was making a scarf for her twin sister's birthday, which was just a few weeks away. Later that day, another patient noticed that Labradou was missing. The hospital reported her missing to the police that evening. But the police weren't interested in investigating the disappearance. They pointed out that Labradou was a 27-year-old woman and if she wanted to disappear, she had that right. They also thought it was possible that she died by suicide and her body would be found at some point. Labrador's family was not convinced that either scenario happened. They acknowledged that she had been depressed, but they pointed out that she had been getting treatment and she seemed to be getting better. She had an eight-year-old son and she had upcoming plans that she was looking forward to. For years, Labrador's family was left wondering what exactly happened to her. Then in September 1997, an answer may have emerged with the arrest of 32-year-old Patrice Allegra. Allegra had been charged with sexually assaulting and killing five women between 1989 and 1997. It is believed that he committed his first murder on February 22, 1989 in Toulouse. On that day, 22-year-old Valerie Terriot was found dead in her home. She was nearly nude, her head was in a puddle of blood, and her hands were bound behind her back. A scarf had been tied around her neck, her underwear had been torn, and pieces of it had been shoved inside her mouth and her nostrils. In the living room, there were two glasses, and that seemed to indicate that she had a guest in her home before she died. Amazingly, despite the viciousness of the crime scene, the police concluded that it was a suicide. Allegra had worked with Harriet at a cafe, and she was his neighbor. On the night that he killed her, he went to her home and asked her to have sex with him. She refused, so he sexually assaulted her, beat her, and strangled her to death with a scarf. Eleven months later, on January 25, 1990, 19-year-old Laura Martina was hitchhiking home. Allegra, who was a neighbor of Martina, picked her up. He tried to kiss her, and she rejected him. This made him angry, so he sexually assaulted, beat, and strangled her to death. He dumped her body in a ditch, and she was found two days later. The police investigated the murder, but Allegra was not considered a suspect. A month later, on February 11, 1990, the fire department was called to the apartment of 29-year-old Martin Mateus. Inside her apartment, they found her burned body on her bed. Her body was positioned in a sexual manner, and her wrists and ankles had been bound. Blood was found in her bathroom and on her bra. The fire was started in two different places. Something odd that the police found in the living room was a piece of an automatic handgun. The cause of death was carbon monoxide poisoning, which means she was alive when the fires were started. Once again, despite the brutality of the crime scene, the death was ruled a suicide. Allegra knew Mateus because they had been neighbors for a short time. 
After murdering Mateus, Allegra seemed to take a seven year break from killing. Then on February 21st, 1997, Allegra went to a bar with a woman. Afterward, he beat and sexually assaulted her. This time, he didn't kill her and he dropped her off at home. The woman decided to file charges. When the police went to arrest Allegra, they couldn't find him because he had fled. A month and a half later, Allegra still had been arrested. On May 31st, 1997, Allegra broke into the home of a woman they had previously tried to get romantically involved with. She called the police and they arrested Allegra. He didn't have any identification on him when he was arrested and he gave the police a fake name. The next morning he was released on bail. A few hours after he was released, the woman whose home he tried to break into went to the police station. After he broke in but before he was arrested, Allegra either dropped his driver's license or he ditched it in the woman's home. The woman found his driver's license and she brought it to the police station. That's when the police realized that Allegra was wanted for sexual assault. After he was released, Allegra made his way to Verdun, which is a commune in France. In Verdun, he met 36-year-old Mario Normand. In exchange for doing work around her property, Normand told Allegra he could stay with her for a few days. On June 20th, Allegra sexually assaulted and strangled her to death. He wrapped her body up in a sofa cover and buried her in the garden. Her body was found 15 days later. By that time, Allegra was long gone. He went to Spain where he met 31-year-old Isabel Chichery, who was on vacation from Paris. A few months later, in early September, Allegra made his way to Paris. He called Chichery and told her that his car had been stolen. He asked if he could stay with her for a few days and she agreed. A few days later, on the night of September 3rd, Allegra asked Chichery to sleep with him and she rejected him. Once again, Allegra snapped. He beat, sexually assaulted, and strangled Shishiri to death. He then left her apartment. On September 5th, he went back to her apartment and set it on fire. When the firefighters arrived, they found Shishiri's body in the apartment and they called the police in. The police quickly concluded that she had been murdered. The police investigated her murder and they learned from Shishiri's friends that she had a house gas before she was killed. The only thing her friends knew about the house guest was that his name was Patrice, he was from Toulouse, and he was a bartender. The police of Paris called the police in Toulouse and asked them if they knew anyone who fit that description. The police in Toulouse told them that they were probably looking for Patrice Allegra. The police then set up a sting for Allegra. They knew he would be looking for a place to hide out. They went to several of his friends that they thought he would call. They told them that if he did call, they should tell him to go to a specific place. Their plan worked. Allegra called one of his friends and he told Allegra to go to the place that the police had indicated. When Allegra showed up, the police were waiting for him and he was arrested. While Allegra was in custody, he admitted to the murders of Valerie Terriot, Laura Martina, Martin Mateus, Marielle Norman, and Isabel Chichery. In February 2001, he was convicted of the five murders and he was sentenced to life in prison. One thing that people had a hard time understanding was why Allegra was able to get away with murdering for so long. He knew his first three victims, 
who were killed between February 1989 and 1990 because he was their neighbor. If one person has a personal connection to three victims, logically, they should have at least been considered a suspect. But the police didn't even interview Allegra. Part of the problem was that two of the deaths were ruled suicides. This bewildered people as well because there were clear signs that they were murderers. When an investigator was asked why the murders were labeled suicides, his answer only led to more bafflement instead of clarity. He said a murderer would not leave so many clues. Then in April 2003, a possible explanation emerged as to why Allegra got away with his crimes for so long. A sex worker, who was only identified as Patricia, claimed that Allegra was a pimp and he set up S&M sex parties. At these parties were police, politicians, and other influential members of Toulouse society. Patricia claimed that the police gave Allegra special protection and let him get away with murdering women because he ran these parties. Patricia also said that in 1992, she watched Allegra kill a sex worker who wasn't identified and a transvestite named Claude Martinez. Supposedly, Allegra had been ordered to kill them because they were going to go public about the parties. Martinez apparently had some incriminating photos as evidence. Not long after Patricia's allegations were published in a newspaper, a second sex worker and a transvestite came forward and said that the allegations were true. Then a few months later, Allegra also claimed that the allegations were true. He said that in 1992, he did kill a sex worker named Claude Martinez. One of the people accused of being at these parties was Dominic Bodish, who was the mayor to lose during Allegra's reign of terror. At the time the allegations were made, Bodish was the head of broadcasting standards in France. Bodish was anti-pornography and he had x-ray material removed from France's national television. Bodish went on television and he vehemently denied the accusations. He said that the allegations were started by pro-pornography lobbyists as a way to smear him. Then, a few months after the first allegations were made, Allegra retracted his story. Bodish felt slightly victorious after the retraction, but he still felt that his name was dragged through the mud by sex workers and a serial killer without much evidence. After Allegra was arrested, the police set up a task force to look into the disappearances of 115 women who went missing in and around Toulouse. The police believe that Allegra killed at least 15 people, and one of them may have been Elaine Labradou. Labradou vanished six months after Allegra killed his first victim, and five months before he murdered his second victim. The police have several reasons why they think Allegra might be responsible for her disappearance. The first is that Allegra had been a patient at the same hospital where Labradou was staying when she went missing. Also, in Labrador's diary, she wrote that she planned on meeting a man named Pat at a cafe next to a lake. Allegra was known to go fishing on that lake, and he was a regular at the cafe. A bartender saw a photograph of Labrador, and he said he saw her at the cafe. He said that she was with a man, and he gave a description of the man. His description sounded a lot like Allegra. Finally, in December 1989, a man who looked like Allegra found a piece of jewelry that was owned by Labrador. The police have not charged Allegra in connection with the disappearance of Labrador because they said that all the evidence is circumstantial. Allegra has not confessed to being involved in her disappearance. Elaine Labrador's family believes that Allegra killed her. They hope that one day he'll confess and he'll reveal the location 
of her remains. Number one, Michaela Garrett. Saturday, November 19, 1988, was a cool sunny day in Hayward, which is a city in the Bay Area of California. Just after 10 a.m., nine-year-old Michaela Garrett and her friend rode their scooters two blocks to a store to buy some snacks. When they came back out of the store, Michaela noticed that her scooter had been moved a few feet, so she went to retrieve it. When she did, a man stepped out of his car, which was in the parking lot of the store. He grabbed Michaela around the waist, and she started screaming. He opened the back door of his car, and he threw her in the back seat. He then got into his car and drove away. What happened to Michaela after that is unknown. She has never been found. Michaela's friend witnessed the abduction and she described the kidnapper to the police. He was in his late 20s and the most notable aspect about him was that his face was pockmarked or he had terrible acne. He also had dirty blonde hair that was about shoulder length. He was slender and he was about six feet tall. His eyes were blue and described as fox-like. The car he was driving was an older American sedan. It may have previously been in an accident. Also, there may have been cement splattered on the sides of the car. In the days after the kidnapping, the police received a lot of tips, but it didn't lead to Michaela or her kidnapper. Even 30 years later, no trace of Michaela has ever been found, and her kidnapper has never been identified. There have been several suspects over the years. One of the first was a 40-year-old man named Timothy Binder. Binder first came to the attention of the police in June 1988, about five months before Michaela went missing. On June 2, 1988, seven-year-old Amber Sports Garcia was skipping rope alone in front of her home in Panola, California. Panola is about 30 miles from Hayward, where Michaela went missing. Both cities are in the same county. When Amber's mother went to check on her, she was gone. By nightfall, Amber's neighborhood was being searched. The next day, a pair of pink socks were found near a baseball diamond in Amber's neighborhood. The baseball diamond was next to a creek that ran behind Amber's home. Amber's mother was asked if she recognized the socks, and she said they could have been Amber's but she wasn't sure. Three days after Amber vanished, Biner paid Amber's family a visit. He told Amber's family that he tried to save her, but he couldn't. He then showed the family maps of where he thought they could find her. He also told the family that he was sure that Amber was dead and they should be looking for a body. Biner then told the family that Amber's kidnapping reminded him of a crime that happened four and a half years earlier. Five-year-old Angela Bouguet lived with her mother and her three-year-old brother Chris in an apartment in Antioch, California. On November 19, 1983, Angela and Chris went to a neighbor's home to get some rain boots. Only Chris returned home. A week to the day that Angela went missing, her body was found in a shallow grave in a field not far from her home. She had been sexually assaulted and then suffocated to death. Her murder was unsolved. What Binder didn't mention to Amber's family was that he was obsessed with Angela. The day before Amber went missing, Binder had mailed a letter to Angela's mother. The contents of the letter were not made public. Biner also paid a lot of visits to Angela's grave. 
In one year, he went to her gravesite 90 times. Something odd that the police noted was that nine days after Angela disappeared, a bloodhound followed Amber Sen to a very unusual place. It was Angela's gravesite. Needless to say, after that first visit, Widener gave Amber's mother the creeps. After he left Amber's home, one of her family members called the police and reported him. An officer pulled him over a few minutes later and the officer looked inside the van he was driving. He noted that on the walls of the van, there were pictures of children, mostly young girls. The officer had no reason to arrest Binder, so he was free to go. But the authorities were not done with Binder. In June 1988, Binder underwent three polygraph exams. He was asked if he was involved in the disappearance of Amber Sports Garcia. During all three tests, he maintained that he didn't know what happened to Amber. The results of the first two tests were inconclusive, but the third exam showed clear signs of deception. The FBI was asked to assist in Amber's disappearance. An agent interviewed Binder, and once again, he denied being involved in the disappearance of Amber. He said that at the age of 14, he took a vow of nonviolence. Biner did give the agent his theories on how he thought Amber might have been kidnapped and what might have happened to her afterward. He also gave the agent an eerie prediction. He said that the next girl to go missing would probably be 9 or 10 years old. Five months later, 9-year-old Michaela Garrett disappeared. Biner, who lived in Oakland, was in Hayward on the morning that Michaela went missing. He had undergone an exam to be a firefighter and he failed. Before he applied to be a firefighter, Biner had worked for the Social Security office, but he had been fired twice. He was fired for the first time in 1985 because he had been looking up the addresses of little girls who lived in Colorado. Then on their 14th birthday, he sent them $50. In total, he sent $2,000 of his own money. Some of the parents of the girls complained, and Weiner was fired. But then his union had him rehired after 16 months. About a year and a half after he was rehired, he was fired again for looking up addresses that he shouldn't have been looking up. One of the addresses he looked up was Angela Begay's mother. After Michaela went missing, Biner went to her family's home and talked to both of her parents. He then started to look for her body. The police learned that Biner was trying to involve himself in the search and they told him to go home. Two months after Michaela disappeared, on January 30th, 1989, another girl disappeared. 13-year-old Eileen Mishloff lived in Dublin, California. Dublin is about 10 miles from Hayward, where Michaela lived. Eileen went missing as she was walking home from school. Once again, Biden got involved in the search. Sadly, no one has ever found a trace of Eileen. Despite having a promising suspect, the police couldn't make an arrest and the cases went cold. On May 23, 1991, just over two years after Eileen had disappeared, a woman in Fairfax found a letter in her mailbox that was addressed to her 12-year-old daughter. There was no return address on the envelope. The woman decided to open the envelope and inside was a letter and two collector coins. The letter explained the significance of one of the coins. The letter was signed off TJB, which is Binder's initials. At the time, the woman had no idea who sent the letter. 
She had never met or even heard of Timothy Binder. A few days later, another letter arrived for the 12-year-old girl. The writing on the letter was backwards, and to read it, the girl's mother had to hold it in front of a mirror. After getting the second letter, the girl's mother went to the police. But since the letters didn't have any threats or sexual content, the police were not interested in investigating the identity of the writer. Days after they went to the police, a greeting card addressed to the 12-year-old girl arrived in the mail. Inside the card was a handwritten Bible quote. The girl's family went to the police again, but they still didn't want to investigate, so the girl's family hired a private investigator. He learned that Binder was sending the letters, and he told the family. Binder had encountered the 12-year-old girl at Oakland A's baseball game a few days before he mailed the first letter. He got her address from a camera case she was carrying. The family went back to the police, and when they found out it was Binder who was sending the letters, a detective tried to interview him. Binder dodged the detective, and he wrote a letter to the girl's mother, saying that he never meant any harm. Then the letter stopped, for a while. Nearly seven months later, just two days after Christmas 1991, in Fairfield, four-year-old Amanda Campbell, who went by the name Nikki, was playing at a friend's home that was four houses down from her own home. Sometime between 4.30 and 5 p.m., she got on her bike to ride to another friend's home that was eight houses down and around the corner. Sadly, she never made it to her friend's home. A search was launched, and later that night, her bike was found a few blocks from where she was last seen. A few days later, a pair of child-sized blue socks were found but Nikki's parents weren't sure if they belonged to Nikki. Bloodhounds were brought in, and they led investigators to a local cemetery, but no trace of Nikki was found there. Even though Binder lived 40 miles away in a different city, he was the prime suspect. That's because Nikki lived four-tenths of a mile away from the 12-year-old girl he had been sending letters to. The 12-year-old girl wasn't the only person that Binder had been sending mail to. In early December, a few weeks before 4-year-old Nikki vanished, Binder sent a Christmas card to the FBI agent who worked on Amber Sports Garcia's disappearance. On the front of the card was a Russian girl, and she was holding out four fingers to indicate her age. After Nikki disappeared, Binder was put on 24-hour surveillance. But they did not find any evidence that he was connected to her disappearance. In early January 1992, Binder sent yet another letter to the 12-year-old girl. He wrote that he was saddened to hear that their neighbor, Nikki, had gone missing. He also wrote that he had looked for the other girls and he would look for Nikki. On January 6, 1992, a couple weeks after Nikki went missing, Binder was arrested. A police officer caught him offering to give two 12-year-old girls a ride in his van. He was arrested for annoying and disturbing children. It was the first and only time that Binder was arrested. The charges were eventually dropped. After Nikki's disappearance, the rash of murders and disappearances of young girls in the Bay Area came to an end. Binder has always maintained his innocence and claims he's just a good Samaritan. No physical evidence links him to any of the crimes, and he's never been charged in connection with any of the crimes. Binder ended up suing the Fairfield Police Department for defamation. They had publicly named him as a suspect in the disappearance of Nikki Campbell, and they invited members of the media to searches of his home. In 1997, he ended up winning a settlement 
of $90,000. Binder is still considered a person of interest. Two years before Binder won his defamation settlement, one of the cases where he was a suspect was solved. In April 1996, the police made an arrest in the 1983 murder of five-year-old Angela Bouguet. They arrested Larry Graham, a longtime suspect in the case. Graham was Angela's neighbor and he had dated her mother. Graham had previously been accused of sexually abusing a girl, but those charges were dropped. His trial for the murder of Angela started in October 2003 and it lasted three months. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to death. In June 2009, Graham, who was 58 years old, killed himself in his prison cell. Not long after his death, the police announced that they were closing another case. The closure of that case actually began nine years earlier, on August 11, 2000. On that day, seven-year-old Missy Sanchez was kidnapped from Alejo, California as she was walking home from school. Two days later, Mitzi managed to escape from her kidnapper. A person witnessed her escape and they gave the information about the kidnapper's car to the police. Not long afterward, 39-year-old Curtis Dean Anderson was arrested for the kidnapping. While in custody, he admitted to kidnapping 7-year-old Zayana Fairchild on December 9, 1999 as she walked to her bus stop in Vallejo. He later killed her and dumped her body. A construction worker happened to find parts of her skull in January 2001. In December 2005, Anderson pleaded guilty to Zayana's murder. For that murder and the abduction of Mitzi, Anderson was given a sentence of 301 years in prison. In November 2007, Anderson was dying from liver and kidney problems. He knew he was going to die soon and he said he wanted to clear his conscience. He admitted to killing other girls and one of those girls was Amber Swartz Garcia. Anderson said he just happened to be driving a Pinole when he came across her. He said that he took her to a motel room and he suffocated her. He said that he dumped her body near Benson, Arizona. Searches for her remains were conducted, but nothing was found. The police looked for evidence that would back up his confession, but they couldn't find any. But they also couldn't find any evidence to refute his confession. On December 11th, 2007, Anderson, who was 46, died in prison. After he was dead, the police decided to close Amber's case. Amber's family doesn't think that Anderson killed her and he was just lying for attention. Amber's mother convinced the police to reopen Amber's case in 2013 and as a result, it's still considered unresolved. In January 2012, a new suspect emerged in the disappearance of Akela Garrett. In a letter to a newspaper in Stockton, a man on death row named Wesley Shermantine accused his former partner in crime, Lauren Herzog, of killing Michaela. Shermantine and Herzog were a pair of serial killers known as the Speed Freak Killers. The pair were childhood friends and they grew up across the road from each other in the small town of Linden, California. Shermantine and Herzog were well known in their town because they were meth-addicted troublemakers. It's believed that they committed their first murder in September 1984. They were high on meth and they were driving home after a night at a casino. They happened upon 41-year-old Henry Howell who was parked on the side of the highway near Hope Valley, California. Either Herzog or Shermantine shot him once in the back of the head. 
A few months later, in November 1984, Herzog and Sherman Tyne were driving on Roberts Island and they came across a parked car. They got out of their car and shot the driver of the other car, 35-year-old Howard King. Then they dragged the passenger, 31-year-old Paul Cavanaugh, from the car. He was then shot at point-blank range with a shotgun. King and Cavanaugh's bodies were found on November 27th. There was no motive for the three murders other than the thrill of killing the men. At the time of the shootings, Sherman Time was 19 and Herzog was 18. The police were baffled by the shootings and it wasn't long before the investigations into them went cold. Ten months later, on September 4, 1985, Herzog and Sherman Tyne convinced 24-year-old Robin Armtrout to go for a drive with them. Her body was found on the side of the road four days later. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed 46 times. During the investigation, Sherman Tyne and Herzog were considered suspects. A month later, on the morning of October 16, 1985, the mother of 16-year-old Chevelle Wheeler dropped her off at school. But Chevelle did not attend any of her classes and she didn't come home. Her family reported her missing that night. The police learned that Chevelle skipped school to go hang out with a friend. That friend was Wesley Sherman Tyne. Sherman Time was asked about Chevelle's whereabouts, and he said he didn't know what happened to her. The police searched a hunting cabin owned by Sherman Time's family. Inside, they found several drops of blood. Sherman Time said that the blood was from hunting. At the time, the police could not test the DNA, so they weren't sure who the blood belonged to. Since Chevelle was missing and the police didn't have any evidence that she was dead, they could not arrest Sherman Tyne for her murder. After that, Sherman Tyne and Herzog seemed to go quiet. Then 13 years after Chevelle disappeared, on November 14, 1998, 25-year-old Cindy Vanderheiden went missing after spending the evening at a bar that was owned by her father. She was seen leaving the bar with Sherman Time and Herzog. They became the first suspects in her disappearance. In January 1999, Sherman Tyne's car was impounded and searched. The police found blood inside his car. They had that blood tested, and they also tested the blood that was found in his cabin in 1985, which they believe was the blood of Chevelle Wheeler. It turned out that the blood in the car was Vander Hyden's and the blood in the cabin was Chevelle's. On March 17th, Sherman Tyne and Herzog were arrested for the two murders. In custody, Sherman Tyne refused to cooperate with the police. Herzog, on the other hand, openly confessed. When Sherman Tyne and Herzog were arrested, the police had no reason to suspect them in the murders of Henry Howell, Paul Cavanaugh, Howard King, and Robin Armtrout. So Herzog surprised them by saying that he and Sherman Tyne killed them. Herzog said that Sherman Tyne was the leader in the murders, and he minimized his own role in the killings. One thing that Herzog wouldn't do was reveal the whereabouts of the remains of Cindy Vanderheiden and Cheval Wheeler. Sherman Tyne was convicted of the murders of Paul Cavanaugh, Howard King, Chevelle Wheeler, and Cindy Vanderheiden in February 2001. Sherman Tyne said he would reveal the location of Vanderheiden's remains in exchange for money, but her family refused to pay. A month after he was convicted, Sherman Tyne was offered a plea deal. If he revealed the whereabouts of the remains of Chevelle and Vanderheiden, he wouldn't face the death penalty. Sherman Tyne turned down the plea deal and he was sentenced to death. In October 2001, 
Herzog was convicted of the murders of Cindy Vanderheiden, Paul Kavanaugh, and Howard King. He was also convicted of being an accessory after the fact in the murder of Henry Howell. He was sentenced to 78 years in prison. But then, in 2004, Herzog's convictions were overturned. A judge ruled that he had been unlawfully questioned. He made a plea deal where he would plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter and the death of Cindy Vanderheiden. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison, which included the six years he had already served. In September 2010, Herzog was paroled and he moved into a trailer on the prison grounds. About a year and a half later, in January 2012, Shermantine told the police that he would reveal the location of the remains of some of their victims. He also said that one of Herzog's victims might have been Michaela Garrett. Sherman Time pointed out that Herzog looked a lot like the sketch of the kidnapper. Also, Herzog had family that lived a couple miles from where Michaela went missing. But the police were never able to ask Herzog about Michaela's murder. On January 16, 2012, the day he found out that Sherman Time was cooperating with the police, Herzog hanged himself. He was 46 years old, and he was about three months away from having more freedom on his parole. Investigators believe that Sherman Tyne started cooperating with the police as a way to get revenge on Herzog for confessing when they were first arrested. On February 9, 2012, some of Chevelle Wheeler's remains were found on a property that was owned by Sherman Tyne's family. The next day, the remains of Cindy Vanderheiden were found in some foothills in Calaveras County. The day after that, the police went to a field in Linden that Sherman Tyne called Herzog's Boneyard. The police dug up an old well and they found thousands of bones. It turned out that the bones belonged to three females and a fetus. One of the victims was 19-year-old Kimberly Ann Billy, who went missing from Stockton on December 11, 1984. Another set of remains was 16-year-old Joanne Hobson, who disappeared from Stockton on August 29, 1985. The police were not able to identify the third set of remains or the fetus. What the police do know, thanks to DNA testing, is that the third set of remains is not Michaela. So at the time of this video, it's not known if Herzog killed Michaela Garrett. The police said it's possible that he did kill her, but there is no evidence to prove that. Sherman Tyne said that in the future, he may reveal the locations of more remains. It's suspected that the Speed Free Killers murdered at least 19 people. There is some speculation that their true body count is 72, if not higher. At the time of this video, the November 19, 1988 disappearance of Michaela Garrett remains unsolved. Michaela's family still holds out hope that she is still alive. The disappearances of Amber Swartz Garcia, Eileen Mishaloff, and Nikki Campbell, who all went missing between June 1988 in December 1991, all remain unresolved as well. Number 3. Misty Murray Misty was born on October 28, 1978, in Nova Scotia, Canada. When she was born, her mother, Darlene Oldfield, was living in poverty and she was struggling with addictions. At the age of two, Misty was placed in a therapeutic foster care. After spending a year in foster care, Misty was adopted by Steve and Anne Murray, who lived in Godridge, Ontario. Godridge is a quiet town that is situated on the shores of Lake Huron. When Misty was adopted, 
The town had a population of about 7,300 people. As Missy entered adolescence, it became apparent that she had learning disabilities and behavioral problems. In 1994, when Misty was a teenager, she reconnected with her birth mother. They ended up meeting in October 1994. On the weekend of April 2nd, 1995, Misty, who was 16 years old, planned on going to Halifax, Nova Scotia to meet her birth mother's parents. She was so excited about the trip that she packed her suitcase a week early. On Wednesday, May 31st, 1995, two days before she was supposed to fly to Halifax, Misty attended school. Her father, Steve, dropped her off at school in the morning. During the day, she paid a visit to the school nurse, but it's never been made public why. Misty called her mother's work at 3 o'clock, but her mother couldn't take the call. Steve and Ann didn't see Misty on the night of May 31st. The next day, Steve took a business trip to Toronto, and when he arrived home at 8.30 that night, he and Ann realized that Misty was missing. They started a frantic search for her and called the Godridge Police. In turn, the Godridge Police called the Ontario Provincial Police, also known as the OPP. After a few days, Misty had not been found, and the lead investigator with the OPP, Wally Baker, began to suspect that she had been murdered. He even had a suspect. It was Misty's adopted father, Steve. Baker began to suspect Steve because of something he didn't mention when he was interviewed. Steve had neglected to tell the police that on the evening Misty went missing, he had taken his boat out on Lake Huron for 20 to 30 minutes. While he was out, he went to a marina and he had the boat washed and waxed. Also, the police found witnesses who thought that they saw Misty on the docks on the day she went missing. Baker assumed that Steve purposely left out the fact that he took his boat out because he was hiding something. Specifically, he thought that Steve got Misty onto the boat, took her out on the lake, killed her, and dumped her body. Baker speculated that Steve had been having a sexual relationship with Misty and he killed her to cover it up. Steve denied having anything to do with Misty's disappearance. He said he simply forgot that he had taken the boat out. About four months after Misty vanished, Steve was charged with Misty's murder. The problem was that there was absolutely no evidence that Misty had been murdered or that Steve had killed her. Baker's theory was that Steve killed Misty because he had been sexually abusing her. But Baker and several officers were the only ones who believed this. Everyone who knew the family said that Misty loved her adopted parents and she never had any major complaints about them. Later on, one of the officers who accused Steve of having a sexual relationship with Misty got arrested for lewd behavior with an underage babysitter. Besides there being a problem with the motive, there were also other plausible suspects. For example, shortly before she disappeared, Misty told her guidance counselor that she felt threatened by her possessive ex-boyfriend who was several years older than her. The ex-boyfriend said he saw Misty for the last time on May 30th. May 31st was the last day her parents saw her, and it was the last day that she attended school. He said he remembered seeing her that day, because on the same day, he had cashed a check and paid his rent. But the records show that he cashed the check and paid his rent on May 31st, the last day Misty was seen by her parents. Another group of suspects was the crew of a freighter which had docked in Godridge on May 31st. 
the police conducted short interviews with the crew, but they went against regulations and didn't keep records of the interviews. Media outlets that were covering Misty's disappearance pointed out that a member of the crew, who was possibly drunk, could have attacked Misty. Despite these plausible alternative suspects, Baker and the other officers didn't pay much attention to them. They were sure that Steve had killed Misty and dumped her body in the lake. But the lake was dragged and searched with sonar, and Misty's body was not found. Probably the most compelling evidence that Steve didn't kill Misty was that there were many eyewitnesses who saw Misty after May 31st. On June 1st, which is the day after her parents last saw her and she last attended school, Misty was seen at a bargain store in Godridge. The person who saw her was one of her classmates and they had a conversation in the bargain store. The next day, three of her fellow classmates said they drove past Misty. They said that Misty was walking towards Clinton, which is a community about 12 miles from Godridge. The three students said that they specifically remember that day because they went to the fair in Clinton. That evening, another person who went to school with Misty saw her in Clinton. The next day, someone who played in the school band with Misty saw her at the fair in Clinton. She remembered thinking it was odd that Misty was at the fair because she was supposed to be in Halifax meeting her biological grandparents. The witness said that Misty was at the fair with a group of people she didn't know. Two fair employees also reported seeing someone who matched Misty's description but the police never followed up on these sightings. They thought they were all cases of mistaken identity. They didn't think that Misty would run away because she had been looking forward to going to Halifax. Also, at home, she left behind a suitcase packed with clothes and $200. If she left of her own free will and ran away, why didn't she take her suitcase, which was already packed, or at the very least, take her money with her? The witnesses, on the other hand, were certain that they saw Misty. They were confident that it was her they saw, because they personally knew her. But what confirmed it for them was Misty's jacket. Misty owned a distinctive green jacket that had the words Seaforth Girls Trumpet Band and her name embroidered on it. All the witnesses said that she was wearing the jacket when they saw her. These weren't the only people who saw Misty after she was reported missing. London, Ontario is a city about 60 miles south of Godridge and about 50 miles from Clinton where Misty's classmates are sure they saw her after she was reported missing. In the two weeks after Misty was reported missing, six different people saw a girl matching her description in London. Some people saw her in a rougher part of the city where there were shelters for street kids. A few people said that it seemed like she was strung out on drugs and she may have been working as a sex worker. After that, there were sightings of Misty in Toronto, Ontario which is about two hours east of London. Baker and several officers did go to London to search for Misty, but they found no evidence that she was ever there. Amazingly, despite there being no physical evidence that Steve killed Misty, he went to trial in May 1997, about two years after Misty went missing. An officer testified, and Steve's lawyer asked him, how many sightings were there of Misty after she was reported missing? The officer said that there were 93 sightings. The people who said they saw Misty on the docks on the day she went missing also testified. Steve's lawyer pointed out that none of the witnesses knew Misty and they just saw a young woman who looked like her. 
His lawyer was then able to prove that the witnesses were unreliable or they were too far away from the docks to say with certainty that they saw Misty. Steve's trial lasted for 13 days. Then the jury deliberated for just 45 minutes. They returned a verdict of not guilty. After the trial, a juror passed a note to Steve's lawyer. The note said that during those 45 minutes, each member of the jury took a bathroom break and two people had a smoke break. So while Steve was fortunate to be acquitted, his life was still in shambles. Not only was his daughter still missing, but the cost of the defense ruined him financially. Before Misty went missing, he owned a popular pub in Godridge. He also owned a Trans Am and a speedboat. But he had to sell it all to pay for his defense. Since the police suspected Steve killed Misty on his boat, they tore it apart looking for clues. When they didn't find any evidence on the boat, they returned the boat to him in pieces and it was sold for less than half the value that it was when it was confiscated by the police. Some people suspected that Baker, the lead investigator on the case, was jealous of Steve. Steve was a popular man around town who was considered handsome. He ran a successful bar and he owned a nice car and boat. Anne never thought that Steve was involved in Misty's disappearance. Nevertheless, they got divorced after Misty disappeared. A year after the trial, Wally Baker was interviewed and he was still adamant that Steve had killed Misty. He said that he had spent the year looking for the best sonar equipment to look underwater. More searches of Lake Huron were conducted at the taxpayer's expense, but no trace of Misty was ever found. The rest of the OPP wasn't helpful either. In May 1998, a year after Steve's trial, Anne filed a complaint against the investigators who worked on the case. An officer with the OPP got in touch with her and told her if she dropped the complaint, he would give her the last letter that Misty ever wrote to her and Steve. Anne knew about the letter because it was read aloud in court. In it, Missy says she is sorry for being a difficult daughter. She asks for forgiveness and she thanks them. She also wrote that if she were them, she would have given up on her a long time ago. She signs off the letter by saying she will always be their daughter. The OPP conducted a review of the investigation and they said that the officers made errors but they did not commit misconduct. The Ontario Civilian Commission on Police Service then performed an audit of the investigation. They told Anne that her complaint raised serious issues which the Commission wishes to have further examined. But if those issues were examined, the results were never made public. After Anne and Steve divorced, Anne continued to follow up on sightings of Misty. There was a promising sighting from Vancouver, British Columbia, but it turned out that the young woman wasn't Misty. Anne stopped looking for Misty in 2001 so she could focus her attention on raising her two sons. Steve moved 275 miles away from Godridge to Colander, Ontario. He worked as a trucker. On the back of his tractor trailer, he affixed Misty's missing persons poster. On July 30th, 2018, Steve Murray died at the age of 68 in a workplace accident. 24 years later, it's still not known what happened to Misty Murray. Many people believe she got lost in the world of drugs and prostitution. Misty's adopted mother, Anne, is one of the people who believes this. 
She said, in hindsight, Misty probably had attachment disorder. The disorder is found in people who were profoundly neglected as children. Part of the disorder is forming indiscriminate relationships. If Misty did have attachment disorder, it would have been very easy for her to get mixed up with the wrong crowd. Some people believe that in the years after Misty disappeared, she died as a result of her new lifestyle. Other people think she is still alive, if possibly using an alias. If Misty Murray is still alive, at the time of this video, she would be 42 years old. Number 2. Paul Armstrong, Stephen Labard, and Karen Wright In December 1993, 28-year-old Paul Armstrong in Mercy, California, had a broken leg and he was using crutches. Despite his injury, he continued to work as a tow truck driver for RTS Towing, which was also located in Merced. On the morning of December 17, 1993, he said goodbye to his girlfriend and he left his home to go to work. About an hour later, Armstrong's brother stopped by his home. His brother went inside but found no one home. But he did find Armstrong's wallet inside the home. Armstrong was supposed to meet his girlfriend for lunch, but he didn't show up. He also didn't come home that evening. On that same morning, about two hours after Armstrong left for work, 34-year-old Stephen Lombard arrived at RTS Towing to pick up his paycheck. Like Armstrong, Lombard was a tow truck driver. Lombard planned on doing some Christmas shopping and then he was going to meet up with his wife. But there was supposedly a clerical error and his paycheck wasn't ready. Apparently, after he couldn't get his paycheck, Lombard left the tow yard. But he did not meet up with his wife and he did not return home. Armstrong and Lombard were both reported missing. While both men were co-workers, they weren't friends, so their families didn't think that they would go anywhere together. Shortly after they disappeared, Lombard's pickup truck, a Ford F-250, which he drove to the tow yard on the day that he disappeared, was found abandoned in a Kmart parking lot. The doors were unlocked, the keys were inside, and the windows were rolled down. Lombard's family thought that this was odd because he always locked his truck. The truck was the only trace of either man that was found after the morning of December 17th. The police thought the disappearances were suspicious and they investigated the disappearances as a double homicide. Unfortunately, they did not find any concrete leads and it wasn't long before the cases went cold. Then, just over 15 years later, another person connected to RTS Towing mysteriously disappeared. On February 12, 2009, the owner of RTS Towing, 59-year-old Randall Wright, called the Sheriff's Department in Merced. He told them that he thought that someone had broken into his home. Sheriff's deputies went to his home to write a report. When they got there, Randall mentioned that his wife of 12 years, 50-year-old Karen Wright, was supposed to return from Mexico, but she never did. Randall explained that they had a vacation home in San Felipe, Mexico. Randall said that he talked to Karen on February 9th, which was three days earlier, but he had not heard from her since. The sheriff's office got in contact with Karen's family and the last time they talked to her was also on February 9th. She had called them from the vacation home in San Felipe. The sheriff's office thought that Karen's lack of communication was worth sending deputies to San Felipe to investigate. 
The deputies who were sent to San Felipe were surprised to learn that Randall didn't file a missing persons report with the local police. The sheriff's office also learned that Randall and Karen's relationship was nearing its end. Several months earlier, in October 2008, Karen had filed for divorce. In the court documents, Karen alleged that Randall was abusive. She claimed that he had ripped chunks out of her hair and he had broken her hand. He had also threatened to kill her several times. He supposedly told her that he could murder her and nobody would know. Karen also alleged that Randall talked about how he joined a motorcycle club and if she divorced him, then the motorcycle club would kill her so that he wouldn't have any blood on his hands. After Karen filed for divorce, there was a ruling that no construction work could be done on the vacation house. Just before Karen disappeared, Randall was staying at the vacation house and Karen suspected that he was doing work on the house. She decided to travel there to make sure he wasn't doing anything to the house. The sheriff's office thought that this was all very suspicious, but they didn't have enough evidence to charge Randall with Karen's murder. After all, they didn't even know where Karen's body was, so they would have had a hard enough time proving she was dead, let alone that Randall killed her. The police kept looking into Randall's background, and they found yet another tragedy connected to him. 27 years before Karen went missing, on July 9th, 1982, Randall was alone watching his six-year-old stepson, Aaron Wright. Aaron was the son of Randall's wife that he had been married to before he married Karen. While Randall was supervising him, Aaron sadly drowned in a neighbor's pool. At the time, the police had no reason to suspect foul play. But after three people connected to Randall disappeared under mysterious circumstances, the sheriff's office had Aaron's body exhumed. An autopsy was performed, but no evidence of foul play was found. After Karen vanished, the sheriff's office started to re-examine the disappearances of Paul Armstrong and Stephen Lombard. A sheriff's detective talked to another RTS towing employee who was at the tow yard on the day the two men went missing. He said that Armstrong and Lombard went into a shed that was on the tow yard property with Randall and another man named Gary Barker. He said that Randall locked the door behind them. A short time later, Randall and Barker came out of the shed, but Armstrong and Labard never did. Then Randall drove his Lexus into the shed and closed the door behind him. He drove out of the shed a short time later and drove away from the tow yard. Then Barker got into Labard's pickup truck and drove it off the tow yard. The witness said that after Armstrong and Labard went into the shed, he never saw them again. While this sounded highly suspicious, the police didn't have any solid evidence that Armstrong and Labard were dead or any evidence that Randall killed them. Then in March 2009, Randall Wright was arrested. But he wasn't arrested for murder. Instead, he was charged with filing a false stolen vehicle report Randall had been leasing a Mercedes-Benz G55 since April 2007. But then he saw making payments on it and the dealership repossessed it in December 2008. Then shortly after it was repossessed, he went missing from the dealership's lot. The car was found a few months later in San Felipe in the possession of Randall's girlfriend. In August 2009, Randall pleaded no contest of filing a false stolen vehicle report and he was sentenced to six months in jail. 
Randall Wright has never been named a suspect in the disappearances of his employees, Paul Armstrong and Stephen Lombard, and his wife, Karen Wright. However, he has been identified as a person of interest in Karen's disappearance. It's also unclear if Randall had anything to do with the death of his stepson or if it was just a tragic accident. The police think that Randall Wright is either incredibly unlucky or he's a cold-blooded killer who is getting away with four murders. Number 1. Heather Teague The Ohio River separates southern Indiana from northern Kentucky. In the mid-1990s, a man named Tim Waldhall lived in a house on the shore of the river in Newburgh, Indiana. At about 12.45 p.m. on August 26, 1995, Waldhall was using a telescope and he was watching the beach on the other side of the river, which was located in Henderson County, Kentucky. He noticed a young woman who was sunbathing alone on the beach. Then he saw something really odd. He watched as a man crept through some brush behind her. Then he leapt out, grabbed the woman by her hair, and pointed a gun at her. He then dragged her into the wooded area that was behind them. Walt Hall was disturbed by what he saw, so he called 911. The problem was that he was in Indiana, and the crime he witnessed happened in Kentucky, so he had to get the phone number for the police department in Henderson County. The police in Henderson did not arrive on the scene until about 26 minutes after Walt Hall saw the kidnapping. By the time the police got there, the woman and her attacker were no longer there. They only found her towel, her notebook, seven dollars, and pieces of a swimsuit. Later that day, 23-year-old Heather Teague of Henderson County was reported missing. The last time anyone talked to her, she said she was going to do some sunbathing on the beach. The police concluded that Heather was the woman who was abducted. Search dogs were brought in, and they tracked her scent to an area where people parked their cars when they visited the beach. The police thought that after she was dragged off the beach, she was loaded into a vehicle. It turned out, around the time that Heather went missing, farmers in the area were having problems with rowdy beachgoers. So the farmers had been paying people who lived near the beach to videotape cars that came and went from the parking area. The police found someone who had recorded Heather's car arriving that morning. Then later, a red and white Ford Bronco was videotaped driving by her car. Four days after Heather disappeared, the police brought in Tim Walthall, who witnessed the abduction. He described the kidnapper to a police sketch artist. Walt Hall said that the man was around 6 feet tall and he weighed about 210 to 230 pounds. He said he had long brown hair and a bushy brown beard. He was shirtless and he was wearing jeans. The next day, the police went to question a suspect. His name was Marty Dill and he lived in Robards, Kentucky, which wasn't far from the beach. Dill had a criminal record. In February 1995, about six months before Heather was kidnapped, Dill was arrested in Evansville, Indiana. He had been driving around in his red and white Ford Bronco and harassing young girls. The police searched his vehicle and they found marijuana, rubber gloves, duct tape, rope, and two loaded guns. Dill had been released from jail a few weeks before Heather Teague was kidnapped. Dill lived with his wife and young son in a mobile home on Dill's family's 28-acre property. Dill became aware that the police were on the property and he told his wife to get out of the home. 
She did as she was told, and she got out. Phil then supposedly shot himself, and he died from his gunshot wound. After Dill's death, the police searched his property. They found a red and white Ford Bronco. It was hidden in some brush on the property. The FBI got involved in the investigation, and they examined Dill's Bronco. The inside of the Bronco had been cleaned, but they found two spots of blood and a towel with strands of hair on it. The FBI did DNA tests on the blood, and they determined that one of the spots did not belong to Heather. The other spot of blood was too small to create a profile, and they don't know whose blood it was. In November 1995, there was a grand jury hearing where all the evidence against Dill was presented. Dill's wife was forced to testify. She pleaded the fifth to every question she was asked. After the grand jury session, the case sat in limbo. The police were sure that Dill kidnapped and killed Heather, and his suicide solidified that theory. Unfortunately, with their prime suspect dead, they had no idea where Heather's body might be. Heather's mother, Sarah Teague, looked for her daughter's body on her own. One time, she found some bones in the basement of an abandoned house. She called the police, and they had the bones examined. It turned out that they were the bones of a goat. In the years since Heather's disappearance, Sarah started to notice that there were problems with the case against Marty Dill. It started when Dill's mother sent her a photograph of her son on the day he was released from jail. In the photograph, he is bald and he is clean shaven. The photo was taken a few weeks before the kidnapping. The jail records also said that Dill was bald and beardless when he left the jail. Dill's mother told Sarah in the days before Heather was kidnapped, he was still bald and clean shaven. Several of Dill's other family members and his friends said the same thing. But Tim Walthall, who witnessed the abduction, described the kidnapper as a man with long brown hair and a bushy brown beard. What Sarah thought was interesting was that Walt Hall talked to the police sketch artist after the police saw the video of the red and white Bronco driving past Heather's car. The police knew that Dill had a red and white Bronco and for this reason they already suspected him before Walt Hall talked to the sketch artist. Sarah also noted that the sketch of the kidnapper looked a lot like Dill's 1994 driver's license photo. Sarah even noticed that there was a shadow in the same place on the sketch as there was in the driver's license photo. Sarah then began to wonder if Marty Dill was the man who kidnapped her daughter or if he was just a convenient suspect. But if Dill didn't kidnap Heather, then why did he shoot himself when the police went to question him? Friends and family of Dill said that he had a marijuana patch and he did not want to go back to jail, so he chose death instead. One major problem with the theory that Dill wasn't a kidnapper was some evidence that was found in the front seat of the Bronco. It was the strands of hair that were on the towel that was on the front seat. In March 2009, Sarah Teague said she received a report from the FBI, and it said that the hair was tested for DNA. The hairs belonged to Heather. Despite this, Sarah still doesn't think that Dill was the kidnapper. Instead, she thought that another man might have committed the kidnapping. In August 2002, a detective in Medina, Ohio was tracking a possible serial killer named Christopher Below. He started looking for other possible victims in Kentucky and Indiana and he thought that Heather Teague may have been one. The detective first got on the trail of Below 
while he was investigating the disappearance of a 26-year-old Medina woman named Catherine Fetzer. Bolo and Fetzer met while they were temporary employees at a spray paint manufacturing plant in Medina. In the summer of 1991, Fetzer started cheating on her husband of five years with Bolo. Bolo was also married. In fact, he was on his third wife. On November 26, 1991, Fetzer left a note for her husband on their fridge. She wrote that she was restless and she was going to the mall. Sadly, she didn't come home that night. The next day, her car was found abandoned about 20 miles from her home. But beyond that, there was no trace of Fetzer. After she disappeared, her husband found love letters written by Below. Below was questioned but he said he didn't know where Fetzer was. Three years later, in the summer of 1994, a year before Heather Teague disappeared, Willow moved to Henderson County, Kentucky. Eleven months later, he moved to Georgia with his fourth wife. Within two weeks after he moved to Georgia, he moved back to Henderson County. Just weeks after he moved back to Henderson, Heather vanished. Willow and Heather shared several friends. Heather and Catherine Fetzer also shared similar qualities. They were both petite brunettes who were close in age. The detective who was working on Fetzer's case thought that Fetzer and Heather looked like sisters. Something else that caught the attention of the detective was the sketch drawn from Tim Walthall's description of the kidnapper. The sketch had a striking resemblance to Below. In fact, Walthall was asked to identify the kidnapper in two different photo lineups. Both photo lineups included a photo of Below. Both times, Walthall identified Below as the kidnapper. Five days after Heather disappeared, Blow packed up and moved back to Georgia. He moved on the same day that Marty Dill supposedly shot himself. Interestingly, Dill and Blow also shared some friends. This has led to speculation that Dill and Blow committed the abduction together. This would explain the inconsistencies in the case against Dill. Walt Hall said that the man who grabbed Heather had long hair and a bushy beard. But at the time of the kidnapping, Dill had a shaved head and he had no beard. So it's possible that Below did the kidnapping and Dill drove the Bronco. This would explain how Heather's hair got into the Bronco. Then Below skipped town when he heard Dill killed himself, possibly because he was worried about what the police might find. After Heather disappeared, Below continued to live in Georgia, where he worked as a truck driver. He often made trips to North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, Louisiana, and Alabama. On the night of May 5th, 1998, Below was in St. Cloud, Florida. That was the same night that 43-year-old Mary Cushto vanished after getting into a fight with her boyfriend at a local bar. Cushto had similar physical features to Heather and Fetzer. Below is also believed to be responsible for a couple of disappearances before he moved to Henderson County. On August 8, 1994, a year before Heather Teague vanished, 18-year-old Shailene Farrell left her family's home in Pequa, Ohio. She told her family she was driving to a nearby store to buy a drink. She did not return home or show up for work that night, so her family reported her missing. The car she was driving was discovered abandoned in a parking lot on the same day she disappeared. At the time, Below was living in Lodi, Ohio, and he was working as a truck driver. 
Pequas, about 150 miles from Lodi. The below may have been in the area, but Farrell went missing. And finally, there's the disappearance of 16-year-old Christina Porco, who went missing nearly five years to the day of Fetzer's disappearance. Christina lived on Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. On the night of November 29, 1986, Christina got into a fight with her mother and she stormed out of the condo where her family lived. She called one of her friends from a payphone and asked if she could spend the night, but her friend's mother said no. Christina told her friend she was going to sleep in the condo complex's pool area. The next day, Christina's sweater was found in the pool area, but Christina was nowhere to be found. No one has seen her or heard from her since. Christina's physical profile is very similar to Below's other supposed victims. Also, Below was living in South Carolina when Christina disappeared. But something else tied him to Christina's disappearance. After Below abandoned his apartment in Lodi, the police searched it. They found a briefcase, and inside of it, there was a single piece of paper. It was Christina's missing persons flyer. In 2003, the detective in Medina received several tips from Malo's friends and family regarding the disappearance of Catherine Fetzer. The detective decided to interview Below again. He offered Below a deal where he could plead guilty to involuntary manslaughter for the disappearance of Catherine Fetzer. If he took the plea deal, he would avoid getting a life sentence. Below agreed to take the plea deal. He said that he shot Fetzer. He claimed she played games with his head and he got sick of it. He told the detective that they would never find her body. He said he put it in a trash can. In November 2003, Below was sentenced to 11 to 18 years in prison. At the time of this video, he is incarcerated at the Grafton Correctional Institution in Grafton, Ohio. He has been questioned about the disappearances of the other women, but he has never been charged. He is considered a person of interest in all four unsolved disappearances. There is one other theory regarding the disappearance of Heather Teague. Heather's mother, Sarah, is suspicious of the Kentucky State Police, known as the KSP. They were the police force that handled the investigation, and she thinks they may have committed a cover-up. In March 2008, the KSP allowed Sarah and her lawyer to listen to a recording of Tim Walthall's 911 call. In the call, Walthall describes the kidnapper as having long hair and a bushy beard, and he may have been wearing mosquito netting or a wig. Sarah and her lawyer also noted that the 911 dispatcher was female. Then February 2016, Sarah and her lawyer were granted permission to listen to the 911 call again. They immediately noticed that this one was different from the one they listened to eight years earlier. It was still Walt Hall's voice, but the content was different. Notably, in the second recording, Walt Hall leaves out the description of the kidnapper. Also, the dispatcher in the second recording was male. The KSB denied that there was more than one recording of the 911 call. They said that the recording of the call that Sarah and her lawyer heard in 2016 was the same one they heard in 2008. Sarah and her lawyer are convinced that there are two different recordings. They think that after the initial call, the police convinced Walt Hall to record a second one to build a stronger case against Marty Dill. Either the first one they heard in March 2008 was the fake one, and the police got Walt Hall to describe Dill 
based on his 1994 driver's license photo. Or the second call, which they listened to in March 2016, could have been the fake one. In the second recording, there is no description of the kidnapper. This could have been recorded when the police realized that Dill was bald and clean shaven. Something else that was odd about the investigation was the Ford Bronco. The Bronco had been clean, but yet, a towel with strands of Heather's hair on it was left in the front seat. Why would Dill go to all the work to clean up the other forensic evidence and dispose of the body in a way that it has been found in decades, but then leave a towel with Heather's hairs on it in the front seat of the Bronco. In May 2016, Sarah's lawyers sanctioned the KSP to release Marty Dill's mugshots, recordings of both 911 calls, and a record of who accessed the 911 calls. The KSP flat out refused to give them what they wanted, despite the fact that the information should have been released under the Freedom of Information Act. So Sarah's lawyer filed a lawsuit against the KSP. In January 2018, Sarah won her lawsuit and the KSP was ordered to release all the information that she had requested. The KSP were also ordered to pay Sarah nearly $24,000 for her legal fees. The KSP appealed the ruling. In February 2019, the Kentucky Court of Appeals upheld the ruling. They said that the KSP lacked plausible justification for withholding the documents and acted in a conscious disregard to Sarah's right to access the information. If the information that Sarah sued to get released was handed over to her, she has not made that information public. A major question is why would the police want to cover up the disappearance of a 23-year-old woman? Sarah found a possible explanation in the FBI's files on the case. They thought that Heather's disappearance was possibly linked to drugs, prostitution, and public corruption in Henderson County. So Heather may have been killed to silence her and then the crime was pinned on Marty Dill. Something worth noting is that the FBI's file on the case said that Dill allegedly died by suicide. This suggests that they aren't entirely convinced that Dill shot himself. If there was a cover-up and Dill was set up to take the fall, his death would have been beneficial to the people who did the cover-up. His death ensured that there was no trial where the case could be examined more thoroughly. He was also not able to proclaim his innocence or say he was set up. Instead, Dill's death actually made him look guilty and it effectively closed the case. Had Sarah not began investigating the disappearance of her daughter, people would have just gone on assuming that Dill was the one who kidnapped her. Sarah also thinks that a police cover-up explains why Dill's girlfriend pleaded the fifth when she testified at the grand jury. Sarah thought she could have been threatened or at the very least, she was too scared to say anything. This would have been especially true if she knew that Dill didn't take his own life, but instead, he was murdered. Something else that bothered Sarah is that the KSP never seemed to cooperate with her. Besides not giving her the recordings of the 911 calls and Dill's mugshots, they wouldn't search areas where Heather's body might be hidden. They wouldn't even search Dill's family's property, which has a pond. However, this is mostly speculation, and the Kentucky State Police and officials in Henderson County have adamantly denied that there was a cover-up, and they have said that there is no corruption in Henderson County. Sarah Teague still holds out hope that her daughter, Heather, is still alive, and one day, she'll come back home. If Heather Teague is still alive, she would be 47 at the time of this video. 
number three, CJ and Billy Vossler. In 1980, Ruth Parker was living in Madison, Wisconsin. One day, she was looking through personal ads in the magazine, Mother Earth News. She came across an ad that caught her attention, and she wrote to the man who placed the ad. His name was Charles Vossler, and he lived in Newton, New Hampshire. Over the next year, Ruth and Charles exchanged letters and phone calls. Ruth then moved to Newton, and the two got married. After they got married, they would buy rundown houses, live in them, and then flip them for money. On December 9, 1982, Ruth gave birth to a son who was named Charles after his father. He went by the nickname CJ. On April 21, 1984, Ruth gave birth to a second son whom they named William, but they called him Billy. Not long after Billy was born, Charles got his realtor's license and he started his own real estate company in Rochester, New Hampshire. The family also moved into a really rundown property that had accidentally been purchased by Charles' father. The property was a source of tension between Ruth and Charles. Ruth did not think that the house was safe for the children to live in. After an accident where Billy pulled down a set of cabinets that were attached to a wall, Ruth told Charles she was leaving him and she was taking the children. Charles found an apartment for them and they moved in. On October 9, 1986, Charles picked up three-year-old CJ and two-year-old William and told Ruth he was going to take them to Connecticut to visit some family for the weekend. He said he would drop them off on Sunday, but he didn't. Ruth phoned Charles's family, but it turned out that he did not go there that weekend. On Monday morning, she went to his real estate office. When she got there, she saw some employees walking out of the office with boxes. She talked to them, and they told her on Friday, which was the same day that Charles left with the boys, Charles announced to his employees that he was shutting down the office effective immediately. Ruth then got into their storage unit. When she did, she discovered it was empty. It turned out that months earlier, Charles had auctioned off all their possessions that were in storage. The next thing Ruth did was check their bank accounts. She learned that her name had been taken off the joint accounts and all their money was gone. Bills had not been paid in some time and her car was near repossession. The credit cards were also missing. Then, at her home, she noticed that all the recent photographs of both her sons were gone. Ruth realized that Charles took the photographs of their sons to make it more difficult for her to create missing persons flyers. It became painfully obvious to Ruth that Charles had been planning the abduction for months. Ruth called the police and tried to report her sons missing, but the police were indifferent to the situation. Ruth said the officer she spoke to said something she would never forget. He said, what's the big deal? They're with their dad. In the mid-1980s, when the voice went missing, many police forces did not consider parental abduction to be a serious issue. Eventually, Ruth was able to report the boys missing. The only recent images of the boys that could be found was from a video of a friend's birthday. Stills from the videos were used to make the missing persons flyers. In 1987, several months after the boys were reported missing, a woman in Stillwell, Oklahoma went to a doctor's office. While she was in the waiting room, 
She noticed a poster that had photos of missing children and she recognized two of the boys. They were CJ and Billy. They were the son of a man she was dating who went by the name Charles Watson. He claimed to be a doctor. The real doctor Charles Watson was a friend of Charles whom he went to university with. The woman reported the location of Charles and the boys and the FBI checked out the tip 11 days after they received it. When they got there, they found the house that Charles and the boys had been living in had been burnt to the ground. There was also the burnt out shell of a car in the driveway. That was the last confirmed sighting of Charles, CJ and Billy. There were rumors that Charles was in Oklahoma in December 2006, but those rumors were never confirmed. At the time of this video, CJ is 36 years old and Billy is 35 years old. If Charles is still alive, he is 77 years old. He may be using the first name Malcolm or Martin and the last names Amadon, Foster or Wilson. Charles has a condition called horizontal nystagmus. This causes his right eye to twitch from right to left when he is stressed out. Charles is currently wanted by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution, parental kidnapping, and harboring. Ruth is hopeful that after 33 years, one day soon, she will be reunited with her two sons. Number 2. Tionda and Diamond Bradley Tracy Bradley, who lives in Chicago, Illinois, has four daughters. In the summer of 2001, her daughter Rita was 11, Tionda was 10, Victoria was 9, and her youngest daughter, Diamond, was 3 years old. On the night of August 5th, 2001, Rita and Victoria stayed over at their maternal grandmother's home. Tracy had to work on the morning of August 6th. She made lunches for children who were attending a summer camp at a nearby park. Tionda was enrolled in summer school, but Tracy decided to keep her home that day to look after Diamond. Also, that afternoon, they were planning on going on a camping trip. Diamond's father gave Tracy a ride to work. She arrived at around 6.40 a.m. She worked steadily until 8 a.m. and then she had a few minutes free. She called home, but there was no answer. She called again at 8.07, but again, there was no answer. She called a third time at 8.45 a.m., and yet again, there was no answer. Tracy just assumed that Tionda and Diamond were still sleeping. Tracy finished work at 11.40 a.m., and Diamond's father picked her up. He took her to a grocery store and then he drove her home. Tracy arrived at her apartment at around 12.40 p.m. When she got into the apartment, she found a note on the kitchen table. She thought that the note was in Tiana's handwriting. The note said that Tiana and Diamond were going to the store into the playground. When the two girls didn't come home, Tracy went looking for them. But she could not find them. After searching for hours, that evening she reported them missing. A massive search was launched, but no trace of the girls were found. This led to an extensive kidnapping investigation. But despite the police's best efforts, they couldn't figure out what happened to the girls. A handwriting expert analyzed the handwriting on the note and they believe that Tionda wrote it. Supposedly, at times, 
the relationship between Tracy and the police was complicated. The police have accused her of not cooperating with the investigation, but Tracy has denied this. She took a polygraph exam and denied having anything to do with the disappearance of her daughters. She passed the exam. The police have stated that Tracy is not a suspect in the disappearance of her daughters. The police did develop one plausible suspect. Tracy has never publicly revealed the identity of Tionda's biological father. One man who was thought to be the father was a man from North Africa. According to the website, The Charlie Project, up until 2001, shortly before the girls disappeared, the man had been paying child support. The police theorized that he found out that he may not have been the father and he became angry. So he kidnapped the girls. Detectives from Chicago traveled to Morocco to investigate the theory but they did not find any evidence that the girls were ever in the country. For nearly two decades, the case has remained cold. Then in the spring of 2018, the family of the girls got a message on Facebook from a woman in Texas calling herself Lele Rodriguez. She claimed that she was really Tionda. She said that she and Diamond were together in Texas. She claimed that they both had kids and that Diamond was enrolled in college. The woman knew a lot about the case, but everything she told them was already public knowledge. The woman was adamant that she was Tionda and she even volunteered to take a DNA test. The family got in contact with the FBI and they investigated the woman's claims. It turned out that was just a disturbing hoax. The woman was not Tionda. The family of Tionda and Diamond are still holding out hope that they are still alive and one day they'll be reunited with them. If the girls are still alive, at the time of this video, Tionda is 28 and Diamond is 21. Number 1. Annette and Milette Anderson Elizabeth and Jack Anderson, who lived in Jacksonville, Florida, had three children. In the summer of 1974, their daughter Donna was 13, Lillian, who went by the name Annette, was 11, and Milette was 6 years old. On the evening of August 1, 1974, Elizabeth got a call that her sister was ill. Just after 6 p.m., she and her eldest daughter, Donna, went to visit her. They left Annette and Milad home alone. Jack was a commercial fisherman, and he was working when Elizabeth and Donna left the house. He planned to be home at 7 p.m., but there was a problem with the motor of his boat, so he was running late. He called home around 7 p.m. and he spoke to Annette. Jack said everything sounded fine, but he could hear their dog barking. Annette told him that the dog was just barking at some birds that were in the front yard. Jack said he'd be home soon, and then he hung up the phone. Jack called back 20 minutes later, and there was no answer. He rushed home and discovered that Annette and Millette were gone. The dog, which was allowed to roam all over the house, was in one of the bedrooms, and the bedroom door was closed. The house showed no signs of a break-in or forced entry. All the doors of the house were closed, but they weren't locked. Besides the girls, only one thing was missing, and that was a doll that Millette often carried with her. The girls were immediately reported missing. 
A major concern was that both girls had health problems and they needed to take medication. Annette needed to take a thyroid tablet daily and Millette had slight asthma and a weak heart. Millette needed medication anytime she got overexcited or overtired. A neighbor reported seeing a white sedan, possibly a Thunderbird or a Mustang, parked in the family's driveway sometime between 6 and 7 p.m. Other than that, no one saw or heard anything unusual. No one saw the girls leave the house. The police were convinced that someone took the girls and they did not run away. They even thought that the kidnapping had been planned. The family lived on a secluded, dead-end street. So there was only one way in and out of the street. It suspected that the kidnapper had planned on kidnapping the girls, or at least one of them, and when he saw that they were left alone, he saw his opportunity to make his move. Unfortunately, Annette and Millette have never been found. What is even more disturbing about the disappearance of the Anderson sisters is that they weren't the only young girls to go missing from Jacksonville in 1974. Just a week and a half before the sisters went missing, on July 21st, nine-year-old Jean Schoen left her grandmother's house to go to a variety store, which was two blocks away. Sadly, she never returned to her grandmother's home, and she was reported missing. The police were able to piece together Jean's last known movements. She made it to the store, and she bought a pack of cigarettes for her uncle. She told the store employee she was going to play pinball at an establishment called The Hangout. The police interviewed the owner of The Hangout. He told the police that Jean had come to the hangout, but he told her that it was closed because he had just washed the floors. He suggested coming back a short time later after the floors had dried. Jean realized she forgot the cigarettes at the store and she went back and retrieved them. Jean then supposedly made her way to a laundromat where she met two of her friends. The two friends said that a man on a blue bicycle pulled up in front of the laundromat. He got off his bike, came inside, grabbed Jean, and dragged her into the washroom. They emerged not long afterward, and Jean was crying. Jean did not scream or try to fight off the man. The man forced her to get on his bike, and they rode off with her. Jean's two friends said that they ran after them, but they couldn't keep up. This was the last time anyone who knew Jean saw her alive. Jean's two friends said that the man who kidnapped her was white and had light hair that was styled in a way that was similar to Elvis Presley's. Jean Schoen has never been found dead or alive. On September 27, 1974, two months after Annette and Mayette went missing, 12-year-old Virginia Helm left her family's home in Jacksonville to go to a variety store to buy some soap. The entire trip should have taken her about 20 minutes. When she didn't come home after 45 minutes, her father started searching for her. But he could not find any trace of her so she was reported missing. The police canvassed the area between Virginia's house and the store and they interviewed many people. Several people reported seeing a red compact car in the area. The red compact car would become an important part of the investigation. A day before Virginia went missing, her friend, who lived in the same neighborhood, was approached by a man in a red compact car. He told her to get in the car or he would kill her. Instead, she ran and found help. 
Three days after Virginia went missing, a couple went to the police and reported an odd encounter that they had that day. They were driving and they noticed a red Volkswagen bug pulled over on the side of the road near the border of Duval County where Jacksonville is located in Nassau County. A man was standing outside of the car. The couple asked the man if he needed help and then they looked in the back seat. They saw a young girl who looked like Virginia on the floor in the back seat. She was on her knees and she was pulling herself up by pushing down on the back seat. The couple noticed that the girl's pupils were dilated. She also looked afraid. She was rapidly looking back and forth. The couple asked the man about the girl, but he did not respond to them. Instead, he quickly got into his car and drove off. As he drove away, a bag fell out of his car. The couple grabbed the bag and they gave it to the police. The bag was checked for fingerprints, but no viable prints were found. Just over three weeks after Virginia disappeared, on October 16, 1974, 12-year-old Rebecca Green left her home in Jacksonville to go to a variety store that was only five blocks from her home. Just like Jean and Virginia, she did not make it home from the store. The police interviewed the store employee and he said that Rebecca bought some soft drinks and then left. The police canvassed the area, but no one saw what happened to Rebecca after she left the store. On October 25th, nine days after Rebecca went missing, the remains of a young girl were found in a wooded area near the University of Florida in Jacksonville. She was buried in a shallow grave and she was just wearing a blouse. She had been shot once in the head with a 22 caliber handgun. The parents of all five missing girls waited with bated breath to see if it was their daughter. It turned out that the body was Virginia Helm who went missing a month earlier. The last confirmed sighting of her was less than six miles away from where her body was found. The area where Virginia's remains were found was searched, but no traces of the other four girls were found. Some of the other girls' parents said that they were a bit relieved after hearing the news. They said that they went back to hoping that their daughters were still alive. Then after that, girls in Jacksonville stopped disappearing. Nearly three years later, on August 2, 2019, some remains washed up on Little Fort George Island, which is about 20 miles from Jacksonville. Once again, the parents of the girls dreaded the medical examiner's results. It turned out that the skeletal remains were 12-year-old Rebecca Green. Because of the state of the remains, the cause of death could not be determined. The police in Jacksonville are pretty sure that all five cases are connected. All the girls were between the ages of 6 and 12 and they all went missing within two and a half months of each other. Besides the Anderson sisters, they were all kidnapped before or after they visited a variety store. However, the police have never been able to make an arrest in any of the cases. But the police do have a suspect in one of the cases. That is the disappearances of Annette and Millette Anderson. The suspect's name is John Paul Knowles. Knowles was born in April 1947 in Orlando, Florida, but he grew up in Jacksonville. He was a problem child and his parents had a hard time controlling him. By the time Knowles was 17, he had been sent to a boys reformatory school six times for crimes like theft, 
a breaking and entering. In the spring of 1965, when Knowles was 19 years old, a police officer pulled him over while he was driving a stolen car. Knowles managed to steal the officer's gun and he forced the officer to get into the car. Two hours later, Knowles let the officer go. Knowles was eventually arrested and he was convicted of kidnapping. He was sentenced to one to five years in a state prison. He was paroled after two and a half years, but he wouldn't be out of prison long. Between 1967 and 1974, he was in and out of prison several times. Usually, he spent six months of every year in prison. While in prison, Knowles became interested in astrology. He started reading the magazine, American Astrology. Sometime in late 1972 or early 1973, through the magazine, he became pen pals with a woman named Angela Kovic who lived in San Francisco, California. She became smitten with Knowles and in September 1973, she visited him in prison. During their meeting, Knowles proposed to her and she agreed to marry him. She then hired a lawyer to prison. Knowles was released in the spring of 1974 and in May of that year, he flew to San Francisco to be with Kovic. But a week after he arrived, Kovic had second thoughts and broke off the relationship. Bitter over the experience, Knowles went back to Jacksonville. Sometime after he got back, he got into a bar fight and he stabbed a bartender. He was arrested and he was held in jail. It is not exactly clear when he was arrested, but most reports say that he was arrested in May 1974. Then several months later, on July 26th, he picked the lock of his cell and he escaped from jail. If Knowles was in jail from May until July 26th, he could not have been responsible for the disappearance of Jean Schoen. Jean went missing on July 21st, which is five days before Knowles escaped from jail. On the night that Knowles escaped from jail, he broke into the Jacksonville home of 65-year-old retired teacher, Alice Curtis. He bound and gagged her. Unfortunately, Curtis's dentures became dislodged and they went down her throat. She ended up suffocating to death. After stealing some money, Knowles took off in Curtis's car, which was a white Dodge Dart. Over the next several days, Knowles crashed with friends. Five days after he escaped, on the evening of August 1st, Annette and Millette Anderson went missing. Earlier that same day, 13-year-old Imogene Sanders went missing from Warner Robins, Georgia. She went out with some friends and she never returned home. Her remains were found in a shallow grave nearly two years later near Macon, Georgia. However, because of the state of the remains, she wasn't identified until December 2011. The day after Ima and the Anderson sisters went missing, Knowles was in Atlantic Beach, Florida, which is about 16 miles from Jacksonville. While he was in Atlantic Beach, he somehow got into the home of 49-year-old Marjorie Howe. Using a nylon stocking, he strangled her to death. Two and a half weeks later, on August 23rd, Knowles was in Missoula, Georgia. He forced his way into the house where 22-year-old Kathy Pierce lived with her three-year-old son. Noel strangled her to death with a telephone cord. He did not physically harm her son. After that murder, Knowles left the South. 
On September 3, 1974, he was in Lima, Ohio. He went to a bar and he met 32-year-old William Bates. They left the bar together. Bates' wife reported him missing when he did not come home. Not far from the bar, the police found Alice Curtis's Dodge Dart. William Bates' body was found in a wooded area just outside the city two months later. He was nude and he had been strangled to death. After Knowles killed Bates, he stole a Chevy Impala, his money, and his credit cards. He then started driving west. Somewhere in his travels, he purchased a gun. On September 12, 1974, he encountered 62-year-old Emma Johnson and his 59-year-old wife Lois, who were camping in Ely, Nevada. He shot them both in the head, and then he stole their credit cards and money. Their bodies were discovered six days later. By then, Knowles was long gone. On September 21, 1974, Knowles encountered 42-year-old Charlene Hicks near Seguin, Texas. He either met her at a rest stop or he found her on the side of the road after her car broke down. When Hicks encountered Knowles, she was on her way to a family chili cookout. Her family reported her missing when she didn't show up. Four days later, her nude body was found in a field. She had been strangled to death. On September 23, 1974, two days after killing Hicks, Knowles met 49-year-old Ann Dawson in Birmingham, Alabama. He was able to convince her to go on a road trip with him. But then, six days later, while they were in Mississippi, Noel strangled Dawson and then dumped her body. Her body has never been found. Just over two weeks later, Knowles was in Marlboro, Connecticut. He knocked on the door of the home where 35-year-old Karen Wine lived with her 16-year-old daughter, Don Wine. At the time, Don was the only one home. When Don opened the door, Knowles forced his way in. He then sexually assaulted Don. When Karen came home, he sexually assaulted her as well. He ended up strangling them both to death with a pair of silk stockings. Three days later, Knowles forced his way into the home of 53-year-old Doris Hovey, who lived in Whitford, Virginia. Knowles grabbed Hovey's husband's rifle and he shot her in the head. He did not sexually assault her or steal anything from her house. He even left the murder weapon behind. Knowles then drove to Florida. In one of his home invasions, Knowles had stolen a tape recorder. As he traveled, he used the tape recorder to record his confessions. When Knowles got back to Florida, he went to see the lawyer that Angela Kovic had hired to get him out of jail, Sheldon Yavitz. He confessed to Yavitz that he had killed a lot of people. Yavitz told Knowles to turn himself in, but Knowles said that he would rather go out in a blaze of glory. He always gave Yavitz the recording of his confessions, and then he left for Macon, Georgia. Yavitz held on to the recording, and he did not contact the police. As Knowles drove to Macon, it's believed he picked up two hitchhikers, 23-year-old Edward Hillard and 20-year-old Debbie Griffin. Hillard's body was found two days later in a wooded area near Macon. He had been shot multiple times in the head. Griffin's body was not found, but her purse and some of her clothing were found near Hillard's body. They were all splattered with blood. 
Debbie Griffin's body has never been found. Knowles has never been definitively tied to the murders, but he is the prime suspect. On November 6, 1974, four days after it's believed he killed Hillard and Griffin, Knowles went to a gay bar in Macon where he met 45-year-old Carlswell Carr. Carswell was married, but that night, his wife, who was a nurse, was working the night shift at the hospital. They went back to Carlswell's house, which was in the neighboring city of Milledgeville. Knowles tied up Carlswell and then started torturing him by stabbing him with a pair of scissors. Knowles' 15-year-old daughter, Amanda, heard her father screaming and she went to his bedroom to investigate. When she got there, her father was dying from a heart attack. Noel strangled her to death with a silk stocking. He then left, and Carlswell died from the heart attack. Carlswell's wife and Amanda's mother discovered the bodies when she returned home from work. The same morning that their bodies were found, Knowles checked into a hotel in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. He went to the hotel bar where he met a British journalist named Sandy Fox. They had an affair that lasted for nearly a week. Together, they traveled to West Palm Beach, Florida. But when they got there, they split up. Amazingly, Knowles did not harm her. Before they parted ways, Knowles told her that he was going to be killed soon and it was going to be over something that he had done in the past. He asked her to write a book about him after he was dead. Shortly after they split up, Knowles kidnapped a woman named Susan McKenzie who was a friend of Fox's. McKenzie was able to get out of the car that Knowles was driving, which was a Chevy Impala, and she managed to get help. She immediately reported the incident with the police, and the police were told to be on the lookout for a Chevy Impala. Not long afterward, an officer spotted the car and he pulled Knowles over. When the officer approached the car, Knowles pointed a sawed off shotgun at him. Knowles made the officer lie on the ground and then he drove away. Knowles knew he had to ditch his car, so he kidnapped a woman named Barbara Tucker from her sister's home in West Palm Beach. Before they left in Tucker's car, Knowles tied up her sister. After they left, Tucker's sister was able to free herself and she called the police. The police dusted her home for prints and they found several fingerprints. The fingerprints were entered into a database and after the police got the results, they realized that they were looking for John Paul Knowles. The police then tracked down Sandy Fox. They asked her if Knowles had given her anything. It turned out that she had a watch that he had taken from Amanda Carr. That night, Knowles dropped off Barbara Tucker in Fort Pierce, Florida. He left her physically unharmed. At this point, the police around the state were on high alert. The next morning, which was November 16, 1974, 35-year-old state trooper Charles Campbell pulled Knowles over near Perry, Florida. When Campbell walked up to the car, he saw that Knowles had a gun pulled out and it was aimed at him. Knowles had Campbell handcuff himself and then he had him get into the back seat of his cruiser. Knowles got into the driver's seat of the cruiser and he drove off. Another motorist saw what happened. They found a phone and reported the kidnapping. Knowles knew that driving around in a police car was not smart. So using the cruiser, sirens and lights, he pulled over a Ford Grand Torino 
that was being driven by 29-year-old James Meyer. He forced Meyer to get into the back seat of his own car, and then he moved Campbell into the back seat as well. With his two hostages in the back seat, Knowles drove to Lakeland, Georgia, where he stopped at a store and bought some cigarettes. The owner noticed that there was a uniformed state trooper in the back seat of the car. He thought it was odd, but he didn't say anything. Later that day, the owner of the store was watching the news, and he saw that a state trooper, who was on patrol, had gone missing. The store owner called the police and told them that he saw the missing trooper and he was in the back of a blue Ford Gran Torino. The next day, sheriff's deputies in Henry County, Georgia saw a blue Gran Torino near the city of McDonough. So they set up a roadblock. Knowles chose not to stop and he rammed the roadblock. After crashing, he ran into some nearby woods. The police looked in the car, and Campbell and Meyer were not inside of it. Not long after Knowles went into the woods, he re-emerged. He had injured himself when he ran into the roadblock, and he was bleeding from the head. A man named David Clark, who lived on the edge of the woods, spotted Knowles as he came out of the woods. He grabbed a gun, and at gunpoint, he led Knowles to a neighbor's house where they called the police. Knowles was then taken into custody. Knowles refused to reveal the whereabouts of Campbell or Myers, and he wouldn't say if they were dead or alive. But sadly, four days after Knowles was arrested, hunters found the bodies of 29-year-old James Meyer and 35-year-old Charles Campbell in a forest in Palooska County, Georgia. They both had been handcuffed to a tree and shot in the head. After Knowles was arrested, he confessed to all the murders he committed, including several the police weren't aware of. In total, he claimed he killed 35 people. This includes killing three random people in San Francisco on the night that Kovic broke up with him. However, the police were never able to confirm that Knowles committed many of these murders, like the supposed San Francisco murders. One set of murders that Knowles confessed to was the killing of the Anderson sisters. He said that he strangled them and buried their body in a swamp on the outskirts of Jacksonville. The area where he said he buried them was searched and their bodies weren't found. Another problem with his confession is that on the same day that he supposedly killed the Anderson sisters, he allegedly killed Ima Sanders. Knowles told the police they picked up Ima near Warner Robins, Georgia, which is about 260 miles from Jacksonville. He then dumped her body near Macon, which is just north of Warner Robins. Since Macon and Jacksonville are about 270 miles apart, it's possible that after Knowles killed Ima and dumped her body, he drove back to Jacksonville. According to Google Maps, the drive would have taken him less than four hours. The Anderson sisters were kidnapped sometime between 7 and 7.20 p.m. That means if Knowles left Macon before 3 p.m., he would have made it to Jacksonville in time to kidnap the girls. Unfortunately, the timetable of Ima's murder isn't known, and Knowles was vague on details pertaining to both kidnappings. People who think that Knowles killed the Anderson sisters point out that when they were kidnapped, Knowles was driving Alice Curtis's white Dodge Dart. A neighbor of the Andersons reported seeing a white sedan in their driveway shortly before the girls went missing. Also, the day after Annette and Millette went missing, Knowles was in Atlantic Beach, Florida, which is only 16 miles from Jacksonville. 
That means if he really did kill Ima Sanders, he made his way back towards the Jacksonville area after he did it. So was Knowles telling the truth about the Anderson sisters? Was he telling the truth about killing Ima Sanders? A big problem for investigators is that Knowles wanted to be an infamous killer. Because he wanted notoriety, they think he inflated his victim count. According to First Coast News, the current investigator on the Anderson case does not believe that Knowles killed the Anderson sisters. He thinks that Knowles was just lying to make himself look more notorious than he really was. He points out that Knowles never said anything about the case that wasn't already public knowledge. Also, no physical evidence links him to the kidnapping. Another reason he believes that Knowles did not kidnap Annette and Millette is that it's believed that one killer is responsible for the murders of the Anderson sisters, Jean Schoen, Virginia Helm, and Rebecca Green. Knowles was either in jail or out of state when the other girls went missing or were killed. But other people point out that the Anderson sisters' kidnapping is different from the other three cases. Annette and Millette were kidnapped from their home while the other girls were abducted in public after they visited a variety store. The police were not able to question Knowles further and get more details from him regarding his confessions. On December 18th, the Sheriff of Douglas County, Georgia, Earl Lee, and FBI agent Ron Angel escorted Knowles away from the Douglas County Jail. Knowles had promised to show them where he ditched the gun that he used to kill Trooper Charles Campbell and James Meyer. While they were driving, Knowles supposedly tried to grab Lee's gun so Angel shot him three times. John Paul Knowles, who was nicknamed the Casanova Killer, was dead at 28. Not including Annette and Millette Anderson, it's strongly suspected that Knowles killed 16 people. With so many questions surrounding the disappearance of the Anderson sisters, we may never know if Knowles was truly responsible. Their family, and the families of Jean Schoen, Virginia Helm, and Rebecca Green are all hoping that they'll get some closure in their cases. But after 45 years, they understand that the cases may never be solved. During his four-month killing spree, Knowles had a short affair with journalist Sandy Fox. He had asked her to write a book about him. She ended up doing just that. Three years after Knowles' killing spree in 1977, her book, Killing Time, was published and it was a bestseller. Number 3. Sarah Boyd, Kimberly Boyd, and Linda McCourt In the spring of 1987, Sarah Boyd was 32 years old. She was living in Harleyville, South Carolina with her husband, Philip Boyd, and their two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Kimberly. On the night of April 3, 1987, Sarah and her friend, 32-year-old Linda McCord, attended a gospel concert at a church in Walterboro, South Carolina. Walterboro was about 30 miles from their home in Harleyville, South Carolina. They were driving a blue Lincoln that was owned by McCord's husband. They brought Sarah's daughter, Kimberly, with them. Sarah, Kimberly, and McCord were all seen at the concert between 10.30 and 11 p.m. At around midnight, Linda McCord's husband returned home from work and he was surprised to find that his wife was not home yet. At first, he was not too concerned. He just assumed she was at the Boyd's home or she was with a relative. But hours went by and she didn't return home. So he reported the missing that morning. Someone reported seeing a blue Lincoln traveling on Route 15 
on the night Sarah, Kimberly, and McCord went missing. The car was seen traveling between Walterboro and Kennedy, South Carolina. The motorist was driving under the speed limit and another car was following it. But the witness could not remember anything about the second car and they did not get a good look at the driver. The day after the trio was reported missing, the police were notified that Blue Lincoln had been abandoned on the outskirts of Holly Hill, South Carolina. The person gave the police the license plate number and they learned that the car belonged to Linda McCord's husband. An officer drove McCord's husband out to the car to retrieve it. They opened the hood and discovered that a freezer plug had been blown out and the engine had overheated. When the car was discovered, the police did not consider the disappearance of the trio a crime, so the car was not examined for evidence. What was odd was the location where the car was found. After the trio didn't return home, the assumption was that they were traveling in the car and they started to have engine trouble. This would explain why they were driving slowly. The car broke down, then they left their vehicle to go call for help. Then something might have happened to them after they left the car. What was strange was that the women were driving north from Walterboro to their home in Harleyville. But for some reason, their car was found immobile less than 15 miles north of Harleyville. If they abandoned the car in that area because it wasn't working, they would have either driven past Harleyville or one of the highways that led to Harleyville. Why would they drive nearly 15 miles past their home? This is even odder if the women really were having car problems within 10 miles of Walterboro. The police also thought that if the car broke down, they would have called someone for help. But no one had heard from the women. The police conducted several land and air searches, but no other trace of the women or the toddler were found. The FBI was also brought in to aid in the investigation. The authorities thought that, because of the circumstances, Sarah, Kimberly, and McCord were victims of foul play. But they could not find any evidence that anything violent happened to the three females. In fact, besides the car, the police found nothing else of interest. A few weeks after the disappearance, one officer admitted that they were grasping at straws. Months and then years went by and no trace of Sarah Boyd, her daughter Kimberly, and her friend Linda McCord were found. Then, in 1990, about three years after the mass disappearance, someone used Sarah Boyd's credit card at a mall not far from her home. When the credit card was used, the police were notified. They checked the credit card slip and there was a signature. However, it was illegible and it did not match Sarah's signature. The police are not sure if the person who used the credit card had anything to do with the disappearance of the three females. For example, someone may have just found it and used it. Regardless, the credit card was never used again. It's also a mystery what happened to the card after it was used. Some people believe that the remains of two-year-old Kimberly Boyd have already been found. On December 21st, 1988, the body of a young girl was found on the side of a dirt road near Waycross, Georgia. Waycross is about 220 miles from the area where the car was abandoned. It is believed that the girl was about three or four years old. She was wearing a white pullover shirt with a red pony stitched onto the upper left chest area and pajama pants. The medical examiner was not able to determine the cause of death. 
Someone had gone to a lot of trouble to hide the body. It had been wrapped in a brown blanket and placed in a gym bag. The bag was put into a steel suitcase and then cement was poured into the suitcase. The suitcase was placed into a TV console and then the console was boarded up with plywood. People have noted the physical similarities between Kimberly Boyd and the girl known as Baby Jane Doe. They also noted that Baby Jane Doe was encased in cement and Kimberly's father worked in construction. So he had access to cement. But not everyone is convinced that the girl is Kimberly. Notably, Baby Jane Doe had been dead for about one to two months before her body was found. Her body was found about 20 months after Kimberly Boyd went missing. But people point out that Kimberly only went missing then and there was no evidence that she was killed at that time. She could have been kept alive up until a few months before the body of Baby Jane Doe was found. The police have never publicly spoken about the possibility of Baby Jane Doe being Kimberly Boyd. In 2017, the police released a new 3D model of Baby Jane Doe's head in the hopes that someone might recognize her. The disappearance of Sarah Boyd, her daughter Kimberly, and her friend Linda McCord is considered cold. The police are hoping for a break in the case but they have very little physical evidence to suggest what might have happened to the trio. If they are alive today, Sarah Boyd and Linda McCord would be 64 and Kimberly Boyd would be 32, which is the age her mother was when they went missing. Number 2. The Martins In 1958, the Martin family lived in Portland, Oregon. Kenneth Mern, who was 54 years old, and his wife, 48-year-old Barbara, had four children. Donald was 28, Barbie was 14, Virginia, 13, and Susan, 11. In December 1958, Donald was serving in the Navy, and he was stationed in New York. On the night of December 6, Kenneth and Barbara attended a Christmas party. No one noticed anything off about the couple. Kenneth and Barbara returned home that night. The next afternoon, Kenneth, Barbara, and their three daughters piled into their 1954 Ford Country Squire. They had told people they were planning on driving out to the Columbia River Gorge to collect greenery to make Christmas decorations. The next morning, Kenneth did not show up for work. His employer thought that this was very strange because Kenneth was incredibly reliable. The girls' schools also noted that the girls were absent. That night, a friend of the family called the police and reported them missing. Officers went to the area where the family had planned to look for greenery. It was dark, so they only conducted a quick search. Meanwhile, other officers went to the family's home with some friends of the family. They found nothing out of sorts, and by all appearances, it seemed that the family planned on returning. Hundreds of volunteers looked for the five missing members of the Martin family. But notably, the eldest Martin child 28-year-old Donald did not return home to join the searches. One problem that the investigators had was that they couldn't find any evidence that the family actually made it to the Columbia River Gorge on the day they went missing. They told people that they were going there, but they could have stopped anywhere along the way. Or they could have simply changed their plans and went in a completely different direction so they didn't even know what area would be best to search. On December 23, 1958, 
a little over two weeks after the family went missing, a credit card bill arrived at the family's home. On the day the family went missing, the credit card was used to buy gas in a small town called Cascade Logs, which is near the gorge. The police received a lot of calls from people who said that they saw the family. Several people recalled seeing a family that matched the description of the Martins at a restaurant in Hood River. A waitress said she was sure she had served the family burgers and fries. They spent about an hour in the restaurant and left at about 4.30. Several other people also reported seeing the family in the restaurant around the time the waitress said she had served them dinner. The family was traveling eastward. If it was the Martins who stopped at the restaurant, that would indicate that they were driving back home. Then in January 1959, a few weeks after the family disappeared, a man who was looking for traces of the family was searching a bluff near the Dalles Dam. He found tire tracks in the dirt that led off the bluff. There were also some white paint chips found on a rock near the tire tracks. It looked like a vehicle had either driven over or was pushed over the bluff into the Columbia River. Then, weeks later, on January 18th, a handgun was found under a rock in Cascade Locks. The butt of the gun was damaged and it was covered in blood. Someone who saw the gun thought it looked like it had been used to club something or someone to death. The serial number of the gun had been filed off. The lead detective on the case, Walter Graven, was able to trace the gun back to a sporting goods store in Portland. In September 1955, an employee had been accused of stealing about $2,000 worth of merchandise, and the gun was one of the items he was accused of stealing. When the employee was confronted about the theft, he admitted that he stole the items. The employee was Donald Martin, the eldest of the Martin children. It turned out that Donald had a strained relationship with his family. He said that it stemmed from the fact that he was gay and his parents did not accept his lifestyle. He also said that his parents were fat slobs and his sisters were going to turn out just like them. In May 1959, about six months after the Martins disappeared, a tugboat was in the area where the tire tracks were found on the bluff. They dropped a two-ton anchor and they heard it hit something that was metal. They looked and on the floor of the river there was an object that was about the size of a car. Then they saw what they thought were clothes rise to the surface and then the clothes were taken away with the current. A scuba diver was sent into the river where the tugboat operators thought that the car was located. But the scuba diver nearly died, so the search was called off. Days later, on May 4, 1959, some men working on a tugboat near Camas, Washington, found the body of a young girl floating in the Columbia River. It turned out to be the body of the youngest Martin, Susan. The next day, floating in a spillway about 25 miles from Susan's body, the body of another young girl was found. Her body was found near Cascade Locks, which is where the family got gas. With the help of dental records, the body was identified as Virginia, the second youngest, Martin. The medical examiner said that the cause of death for both girls was drowning. But this ruling is inaccurate. For drowning to be the official cause of death, all other causes of death needed to be ruled out. This couldn't happen because of the state of the remains. Drowning was put down as the cause of death because it was the most probable cause of death since the girls were found in the river. 
a sheriff's deputy who photographed the bodies, noted that both girls had identical holes in their heads above and behind their right ears. The medical examiner was able to examine the stomach contents of both girls. Within two hours of their deaths, they had eaten burgers and fries. This seemed to verify the witnesses' accounts that the family had stopped for dinner in Hood River. The lead detective on the case, Walter Graven, noted that witnesses said that two ex-convicts, Roy Light and Lesser Price, were also in the restaurant when the family was there. They left the restaurant around the same time as the family. A stolen car that was driven by the two men was found abandoned in Cascade Logs after the family disappeared. The car was parked a short distance away from where the gun was found. Detective Graven knew that Donald could not have killed his family because he was over 3,000 miles away when they disappeared. Detective Graven did suspect that Donald had them arranged to be killed. Not only did Donald not like his family, but with all of them dead, he was the sole inheritor of their estate. Don Mern came back to the area for the first time in June 1959, over seven months after his family went missing. He had planned on attending the memorial service for his sisters, but there was apparently a scheduling problem, and he arrived in Portland the day after the service. Detective Graven questioned Donald, and he could not think of anyone who would want to hurt his family. He also couldn't see how his father could have accidentally driven off a cliff. Detective Graven wrote a report about everything he had found, and he concluded that the family most likely met with foul play. But his superiors were not convinced. They thought that the Martins had just died in a tragic accident and they decided to close the case. Don Mern was never charged in connection with the deaths of his sisters and the disappearances of his parents and his third sister. Don Mern died at the age of 66 in July 2003. If he was involved in the murders of his family, he took that secret to the grave with him. The bodies of Kenneth Mern, his wife Barbara, and their daughter Barbie have never been found. It's assumed that they are deceased. Number 1. The Solomons In 1970, Saul Solomon immigrated from Israel to Los Angeles, California. He was 23 years old, and he had been a commando in the Israeli army. After he relocated to Los Angeles, he drove a taxi. He eventually got a job selling encyclopedias. A year after Saul moved to Los Angeles, he was in a bar in Hollywood and he met 28-year-old Elaine Marlowitz. Elaine worked as a beautician. Not too long ago, she had divorced her husband after seven years of marriage. Elaine had a daughter from the marriage, three-year-old Michelle. After that initial meeting, Elaine and Saul started dating. A year later, they were married. A year after that, Elaine gave birth to a son, Mitchell. Saul eventually became a naturalized citizen. He also started his own company that refilled fire extinguishers. The business was successful, and in 1987, the family bought a house in Northridge, California. The family liked to spend their money. They dined at fine restaurants, and they always had the newest gadgets. They also owned a Mercedes-Benz and a Rolls-Royce. In the autumn of 1982, by most appearances, things were going well for the family. Saul was 35 years old, and his business was doing well. His wife, Elaine, was 39 years old, his stepdaughter, Michelle, was 15, 
and his son Mitchell was nine. On October 12, 1982, Saul left the family's home, supposedly to go to a car auction with a man named Harvey Rader. Rader, who had moved to the United States from England, owned a car dealership called Mr. Motor. Hours later, Saul had not returned home. Around 11.30 p.m., Elaine was on the phone with a friend. The doorbell rang, and Elaine told her friend that Harvey was at the door. She then hung up the phone. The next day, the neighbor who lived behind the Solomons called a family who lived on their street. She said that the Solomons' pool was overflowing and flooding her backyard. She did not know the Solomons, but the family she was calling did know them. She wanted them to go talk to the Solomons. So they made their way over and found no one home. The family owned three vehicles, a Rolls Royce, a Mercedes Benz, and a white work van that Saul used for his business. The Mercedes and the van were parked in the driveway, but the Rolls Royce was gone. The doors were all locked, and there were no lights on in the house. They went around to the backyard, and the pool was indeed flooding. The family's garden hose was on, and it was in the pool. The family's dog was also tied up in the backyard. The neighbors thought that the scene was strange. They went home and called some mutual friends and neighbors. No one had seen or heard from any of the Solomons that day. Elaine volunteered at a clinic and she didn't show up or call to say that she wasn't coming in. Michelle and Mitchell also didn't attend school that day. The neighbors decided to call the police. The police arrived at the family's home and they found no signs of a break-in or forced entry. When they got inside the home and started searching, they were disturbed by what they found. In 15-year-old Michelle's bedroom, the bed was broken and some bedding was missing. There were also some bloodstains on the wall. Later, the chief of police was asked how much blood was found. He said it was more blood than he would want to lose. A piece of the carpet in Melissa's bedroom had been cut out and a bath mat had been placed over it. A baseball bat was also found near the family's bar. One thing that the police noted was that all the beds were made. Several people who knew the family thought that this was incredibly odd because the family never made their beds. Because of what they found in the home, the police suspected that the family had been victims of foul play. Four days later, a road worker found some personal belongings of the family scattered along a freeway near Acton, California. This included family photos, their wallets, and their passports. There was some speculation that the family was killed by the Israeli Mafia. There were also rumors that Saul might have been involved in the sale of illegal firearms. But it wasn't long before the police began to suspect that Harvey Rader might have been involved in the family's disappearance. It turned out that Saul had invested $20,000 into Rader's business, Mr. Motor. Also, the family's missing Rolls Royce was found in Rader's possession. Rader was interviewed by the police. He denied that Saul had invested money with him. He also said he had no idea what happened to the family. Rader did admit they saw some of the family members on the day they went missing. He said they had picked up Saul at his home at 6 o'clock that evening and he had taken him to a car auction. 
Afterward, he drops all off at an Israeli restaurant. Raider said that after that, he went over to Saul's house to pick up the Rolls Royce because he had to do some maintenance on it. That was why he had it in his possession. Raider said that when he got to the Solomon's home, he said hello to Elaine, but when he left in the Rolls Royce, she was alive and well. The police investigate Raider's story and they found several problems with it. First, Raider said they picked up Saul at 6 p.m. and then they went to the auction. But the police checked and the auction ended at 5 p.m. Afterward, Raider said he dropped Saul off at an Israeli restaurant. It turned out that the restaurant was closed that night. The police were already familiar with Harvey Raider. In fact, Saul and his family were not the only people who had business dealings with Harvey Raider who went missing in 1982. Raider moved to the United States from England in 1978. He first lived in California, San Fernando Valley with another man who had also moved from England to the United States. They lived together for about six months. The roommate worked as a chauffeur for a sheik. In January 1980, the sheik's mansion in Beverly Hills caught fire and arson was suspected. Specifically, the police thought that Raider and his roommates started the fire to cover up the theft of some artwork. Raider was not charged with anything, but his roommate was. The roommate ended up pleading guilty to grand theft. In a civil trial that followed the conviction, Raider admitted that he had helped his roommate in the burglary. An art dealer was charged with buying some of the Sheik's stolen artwork. Raider was granted immunity to testify against the art dealer. At the trial, the art dealer testified that he asked Raider where he got the artwork from and Raider told him it had been stolen. After the trials, Raider started his own business, Mr. Motor, which sold and repaired foreign cars. One of his clients was 54-year-old Peter Davis. Peter had also immigrated from England. By most appearances, Peter was a used car and antique dealer. He bought and sold luxury cars with Raider. But Peter was also involved in some shady business, like dealing in stolen artwork. He was also apparently involved in the sale of stolen guns and jewelry. On May 17, 1982, Peter and his 47-year-old wife, Joan Davis, went missing. When the police got inside their home, they found dinner was still cooking on the stove. The Davis's car was later found abandoned at the airport. Friends of the couple noticed that a valuable painting was missing from their home. The police decided to talk to the man who lived in the house next door to the Davises. The Davises also owned that home and the man who lived there rented from them. The man's name was Ashley Paul. Paul was Harvey Raider's cousin. Paul had worked as a salesman for Peter, but he had quit to work for his cousin. Paul told the police that on the day the Davises went missing, he had dropped Peter off at home. The police determined that Paul was the last person to see Peter Davis before he went missing. The police had Ashley Paul take a polygraph exam. He denied having any knowledge about what happened to the Davises. The polygraph examiner determined that he was being deceptive. But after the polygraph exam, Paul and his cousin, Raider, stopped cooperating with the police. But seven months later, the Solomons went missing and Raider was the last person to see them. 
While the police thought that Paul and Raider may have been involved in the disappearance of six people, they could not prove anything. So their investigation stalled. Ashley Paul then moved back to his native England. Elaine Solomon's mother was frustrated with the police investigation, so she hired a private detective. The private detective traveled to England several times and encouraged Ashley Paul to confess to his part in the disappearances. But Paul refused to divulge any information. Then a detective with the LAPD flew out to England and talked to Paul. Once again, Paul denied knowing anything about the disappearance. Then in November 1983, just over a year after the Solomons went missing, Paul went to Scotland Yard and started talking to a detective. At first, Paul only admitted that he was present during the murders of Peter Davis and Saul Solomon. He said that his cousin, Harvey Rader, had shot them both in the head. He claimed he did not know that his cousin was going to kill the two men. Paul did not explain what happened to the women and children. The Scotland Yard detective talked to the LAPD detective and told him what Paul had said. The district attorney granted Paul immunity in exchange for the truth about what happened to the Solomons and the Davises. For the next three days, Paul talked to the Scotland Yard detective and told him about the murders of the Davises and the Solomons. He said that they went over to the Davises' home because his cousin wanted to look at a Corvette that Peter had in his possession. Paul explained that he was shocked when his cousin shot Peter in the head. Paul said that after Raider shot Peter, he started walking home, which was next door to the Davises' home. Along the way, he passed Joan Davis and said nothing to her. Paul said the next day, he helped Raider bury the bodies next to Interstate 5. He said that seven months later, when Saul Solomon was killed, he was with his cousin, another car dealer, and two Italian men whose names he didn't know. Once again, his cousin surprised him by shooting Saul in the head. They put Saul's body into the trunk of the Royals Royce. After the murder, the other car dealer went home. Paul said that he, Raider, and the two Italian men went to the Solomon home. When they got there, Raider went into the house alone. Fifteen minutes later, he came back outside. Then Raider had the two Italian men go inside the house with him. Then Raider and the two men came outside with the three bodies wrapped in blankets. They placed the bodies in the trunk of the car. Raider went back into the home for a third time and stole some items. He also took a receipt and he was apparently quite happy that he had found it. The police think that the receipt is the one Raider wrote out for Saul for Saul's investment in his business. Paul claimed that the next day, he watched Raider and the two Italian men bury the bodies off an interstate near Acton, California. Acton is close to where the family's wallets and passports were found. Paul also told the detectives that his cousin had committed a seventh murder. He said he had killed 27-year-old businessman Ronald Deeb. In January 1982, about four months before the Davises went missing, Adiba told his family he was going to meet a man to discuss some luxury foreign cars. Ronald Adib was never seen again. The police learned that, like Saul Solomon, Adib had invested money with Raider. The police concluded that Saul and Adib may have asked for their money back and Raider either didn't have the money or didn't want to give it back to them, so he killed them instead. Raider then killed Saul's family 
because you consider them witnesses. After confessing, Ashley Paul voluntarily traveled back to the United States. When he did, his cousin, Harvey Rader, was arrested. The police drove Paul out to the places where he said the bodies were buried. But they did not find any human remains. However, Paul did lead them to an area where some bed sheets were buried. Friends and family of the Solomon were shown the bed sheets and they said that it might have come from the family's home. The bed sheets were the only items of interest that were found. Although Ashley Paul had been granted immunity, the district attorney decided to revoke the immunity and charge him with the murders of the family. They revoked it because they did not think that Paul was telling them the truth. They also released Raider from custody. Paul then told the police a new story regarding the disappearances. He admitted that he knew beforehand that his cousin was going to kill Peter Davis and the Solomons. He also said that he was in the Solomon home on the night of the murders. He admitted that he lied about the other auto dealer and the two Italian men being present during the murders. He said that he and Raider worked alone. Raider had ordered him to collect valuables in a garbage bag. Paul said that Harvey killed Elaine by hitting her head into the family's marble top bar. He then bludgeoned Mitchell with a baseball bat and he strangled Michelle. A judge later dismissed the charges against Paul because his immunity had been improperly revoked. After that, Ashley Paul went back to England and he never returned to the United States. His current whereabouts are unknown. Without Paul, there was not much of a case against Raider. The police could not even prove that the Davises, the Solomons, and Ronald D. were dead. In December 1986, Harvey Raider was deported. When he immigrated to the United States, he said he did not have a criminal record. But he actually had 13 convictions, including theft, possession of a firearm, and stealing a motor vehicle. Months later, Raider illegally re-entered the United States and he tried to get a fake passport. Raider was arrested and in August 1987, he pleaded guilty to making a false passport application. He was sentenced to two years and nine months in a federal penitentiary. Then in August 1988, just after Harvey Raider was released from prison, he was charged with the murders of the Solomons. His trial started in May 1989. All the evidence against him was circumstantial. The trial lasted for two months. The jury deliberated for three and a half weeks, but they could not come to a unanimous decision. The vote was deadlocked at 11 to 1 to convict. The judge declared a mistrial. Harvey Raider went to trial again in January 1990. The star witness for the prosecution was another auto dealer who had been in one of Raider's cars after the Solomons disappeared and he said he saw a blood stain in the car. However, the judge discovered that the witness was facing a drunk driving charge and Raider's defense lawyer was representing him in that case. The judge considered this to be a conflict of interest, so he declared a mistrial a day after the trial began. Harvey Raider went to trial for the murders of the Solomon for a third time in May 1992. The trial lasted for two months. Once again, there was no physical evidence that Raider murdered the family. Their remains had not been found 
so there was no evidence that they were even dead. The jury deliberated for two days. They ultimately found Rader not guilty on all charges. It is unclear what happened to Harvey Rader after the trial. Anyone who associated with him during his trials has lost contact with him. His current whereabouts are unknown. The whereabouts of Ronald Adib, the Davises, and the Solomons are also a mystery. Many people, particularly those who worked on the case, think that Harvey Rader got away with seven murders. Number 3. Randall Gary In the spring of 2003, Randall Gary was 50 years old and he lived in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. He had been divorced for many years and he had a 26-year-old daughter. For years, Gary worked in the restaurant industry. In his late 40s, he wanted a more meaningful job, so he trained to become a psychotherapist. In the spring of 2003, he established a practice called Quick Fix in Toronto. The business was off to a slow start, but Gary wasn't feeling pessimistic. On May 7, 2003, he purchased 100 advertising spots on a Toronto radio station. Two days later, on Friday, May 9, 2003, Gary flew across the country to Vancouver, British Columbia. There, he boarded the Holland America cruise ship, the Veen Dam. Gary had planned to take an Alaskan cruise before getting heavily involved in pushing his new business. He also mentioned to a friend that he hoped to meet a woman on the ship. Several people on the ship remembered Randall Gary. He told some people it had been a lifelong dream to take a trip to Alaska. But what was odd was that when the ship docked in Juneau and Skagway, Alaska, he didn't get off the boat. He only disembarked at one port. That was in Ketchikan, Alaska. However, he did not do any sightseeing. Instead, he just bought 13 postcards and mailed them to friends and family. Most of the postcards simply read, Love Randy. Later, that same day in Ketchikan, Gary got off the ship again at 6.19 p.m. He got back onto the ship just nine minutes later. It's not known why he got off the ship and what he did in those nine minutes. After the stop at Ketchikan, which was on Friday, May 16th, the boat headed back to Vancouver. Saturday was a day at sea, and then the boat was scheduled to arrive in Vancouver on the morning of Sunday, May 18th. During Gary's trip, he spent most of his evenings in the boat's casino. He often slept in. Something else that was odd was that Gary tried to keep the crew out of his cabin. He always kept his do not disturb sign on his door. One time he got the steward in his room and he sternly told him to get out. Gary's attempts to keep the steward out of his room became such a big problem that the steward complained to his supervisor because he couldn't do his job. On the evening that they departed from Ketchikan, Gary ate dinner and they went to the casino. On the morning of Sunday, May 18th, Gary was supposed to disembark in Vancouver because it was the end of the seven-day cruise. Before he was to leave the ship, he was supposed to settle his bill for $127. But he never made his way to the customer service desk. A crew member went to his room and found the Do Not Disturb sign hanging on the doorknob as it had been all week. The crew member got inside. It looked like someone had laid down on the bed, but it appeared it had not been slept in. The room did not have a balcony, there was just a sealed window. All of Randall Gary's possessions were in the room. This included his passport, his credit card, his cash, his driver's license, and even the keycard to his room. 
Gary had diabetes and his insulin was in the room, as was his blood sugar log. The last entry in the log was made on Thursday. There was also a box of Viagra and one pill was missing. It also appeared that someone had been drinking in the room. There was an empty bottle of expensive champagne, a half empty bottle of red wine, and a partially drank bottle of rye. However, there were no drinking glasses in the cabin. A search of the ship was conducted, but no other trace of Randall Gary was found. He has never been found dead or alive. There are several theories about what happened to Randall Gary. The first is that he died by suicide by jumping off the ship. But his friends and family do not believe that this is what happened. No one thought he was suicidal and he did not have a history of mental illness. He was also looking forward to running his new business. Also, if he did want to die by suicide, he could have overdosed on his insulin, which would have been relatively painless as opposed to jumping into the frigid Pacific Ocean. Another theory is that Harry accidentally fell overboard. For example, he could have become disoriented because of his diabetes and he went over the railing. Or he could have been too drunk from the alcohol and he went overboard. But his family said he was always careful with his diabetes. An investigator said they inspected the ship's rails and they were designed to be exceedingly difficult for someone to go overboard. Gary's family also don't think it was him who drank the alcohol. Since he was a diabetic, he didn't drink much. His family also said that he hated champagne and he would not have drunk it. He was also allergic to rye, so they know he didn't drink that. The investigators do not know with certainty if Gary went missing on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. They thought that he likely went missing on the Friday night after he went to the casino. But three people said that they saw him on Saturday. One woman said she talked to him while they were waiting for an elevator. Another person said that they saw him talking to a blonde woman at the afternoon tea. Then, later that night, an elderly man saw Gary outside of his cabin. It appeared that two women were leaving the room. Gary had his arm around one of the women. She was described as being in her 30s and she had shoulder length blonde hair. The women have never been identified. The investigators are not sure if the witness accounts are reliable. They said that people tend to lose track of days when they are on a cruise and that these encounters could have happened on Friday. On Saturday evening, the steward did enter Gary's room. He did a quick cleanup and then he got out of the cabin. This could explain why no drinking glasses were found in his room. But if the steward did a cleanup of the room, why did he not take the empty bottle of champagne? It's also possible that the alcohol was drunk after the steward got into the room on Saturday. If Gary did not drink the alcohol, whoever was drinking it may have taken their glass or glasses with them. Randall Gary's family was upset by the response from Holland America and the Vancouver police. All in America did not save the surveillance footage of Gary in the casino on Friday night. The police concluded that Gary wasn't a victim of foul play, so they didn't dust the cabin for fingerprints. No one took a single photograph of Gary's cabin after he went missing. Gary's family does not agree with the police and they think he may have been a victim of foul play. They think that at least one person on the ship knows what happened to him. Another theory is that Randall Gary is still alive and he chose to disappear. Gary had talked to a friend about his fantasy of leaving his life behind and starting all over again. After Gary went missing, his family found out something unusual about him. 
In 2001, he won $150,000 in the lottery and he kept it secret from everyone, even his daughter. The lead investigator on the case said that there is one aspect of the disappearance that he couldn't stop thinking about. That was the nine minute trip off the boat in Ketchikan. The ship was set to depart shortly before he got off the boat. Nine minutes wasn't much time to do anything on the port. However, there was a payphone that he could have used. Did he use the nine minutes to run down to the payphone and call someone? If he did, who did he call? Did his trip off the boat have anything to do with his disappearance? The detective thinks if he did make a phone call, the call was important enough that he would risk missing the last leg of his trip. There is speculation that if Randall Gary did get off the boat alive, he might have gone to Arizona. He mentioned to several people he had a desire to move there. Also, he made several trips to Arizona around the same time he won the lottery. It's been over 17 years since Randall Gary went missing. If he did get off the boat alive, he's never been in contact with his family, not even his daughter. If Gary is still alive, at the time of this video, he would be 67 years old. He is 6 feet tall and he weighed around 200 pounds. He had brown hair and brown eyes. Nearly two decades later, Randall Gary's family is still hoping for closure on his case. Number 2. Randy Leach Randy Wayne Leach was born on July 25, 1970. He was the only child of Harold and Alberta Leach. When Randy was five years old, his family moved onto a farm on the outskirts of Linwood, Kansas. Randy loved living on the farm and he raised pigs. In the spring of 1988, Randy was 17 years old. He was a large young man standing at 6 foot 2. That spring, he was restoring a 1969 Ford Mustang. When he was done, he wanted to paint it cherry red. In the summer of 1988, Randy was going to generate income by mowing lawns. His parents bought him a Ryan lawnmower as a high school graduation present. In the fall, he was planning on attending a trade school. On April 15, 1988, Randy was three weeks away from graduating high school. That day, he mowed some lawns. That evening, one of his friends, who lived on a farm about five miles from his own farm, was having a pre-graduation party. After mowing the lawns, Randy went to a nearby convenience store where he bought some candy and soda. He also put $3 worth of gas into the car he was driving, which was his mother's gray four-door 1985 Dodge 500 sedan. He then drove to a body shop in DeSoto, Kansas to check on the Mustang he was working on. He then drove to the party. It's not exactly clear when he arrived at the party, but it's believed he got there sometime between 9.30 and 10 p.m. There were about 75 to 150 people at the party. A lot of the people were drinking and some of them were using drugs. It's not clear if Randy was drinking or doing drugs at the party. But the mother of the person hosting the party said that she saw Randy and it looked like he was having trouble walking. However, she noted he didn't have a drink in his hand and he didn't appear to be drunk. Also, no one remembered Randy drinking that evening. At around 1.30 a.m., one of Randy's friends was going to drive him home but Randy couldn't find his keys. So the friend promised to return to drive Randy home and then he drove someone else home first. At 2.05 a.m., the mother of the party host saw Randy lining up to use the washroom. Randy's friend returned around 2.30 a.m. 
Randy, and the car he was driving were not there. No one saw Randy leave the party. The next morning, at around 6 a.m., Harold and Alberta Leach woke up and discovered that Randy had not come home. They went outside to see if the car was parked somewhere on their property. They saw a man who was acquaintance of Randy driving slowly down their road. Later, when they thought about it, they realized it was very strange that he would be driving by their home so slowly. They also thought it was odd that he would be out driving that early in the morning. It turned out that the acquaintance was one of the last people to see Randy at the party. Harold and Alberta assumed that Randy had been in a car accident. They called around and learned that no accidents had been reported in the area. Alberta's brother was a police officer in nearby Lawrence, Kansas. She called him and asked him to go to the farm where the party was held. When he got there at around 7 a.m., he discovered that the party had been cleaned up. If there was any evidence as to what happened to Randy, it was gone. Randy's parents reported him missing after the 24-hour mandatory waiting period. Harold and Alberta were sure that he did not run away. He had money in his bank account and it was untouched. Also, Randy was extremely excited at the prospect of finishing restoring his Mustang. The Kansas Bureau of Investigation agrees with his parents and they do not think he left the area on his own volition. They think it's possible that he was a victim of foul play. There are several strange events surrounding Randy's disappearance. For example, not long after he disappeared, the house on the property where the party was held burned to the ground. This was not the only mysterious fire connected to Randy's disappearance. The car that Randy was driving on the night he went missing was never found, so Harold and Alberta replaced it with a Chrysler LeBaron. The car only had about 40,000 miles on it. Shortly after they bought the car, while it was parked in their backyard, it burst into flames. An investigator said that the fire was started because there was a rupture in the gas line. The leeches think that the cause of the fire was arson. At the time of Randy's disappearance, he owned a German Shepherd named Crackers. He had the dog for about four years. Four months after Randy vanished, Crackers went missing too. Like Randy, Crackers has never been found. Before Randy vanished, there were rumors that there was a satanic cult operating in Linwood. There were also rumors that some of his friends were Satanists. So there were rumors that Randy was killed by the cult. Several months after Randy disappeared, a man went to the police and told them a strange tale. He said that he had been abducted by a group of Satanists. They took him to a cave outside of Linwood. In the cave, they threatened to cut off his left arm. To prove they were serious, they showed him a dead body that was hanging in the cave. The police thought it could have been the body of Randy Leach. But they searched the caves and found nothing. They concluded that the man had hallucinated the experience because he was on drugs. In the years since Randy's disappearance, the entrance to the caves has been bulldozed. Then in March 1989, about 11 months after Randy disappeared, one of the partygoers got in contact with the police. The man led them to the banks of the Kansas River. He had found a dismembered foot in a tennis shoe on the banks of the river. The police searched the area for the rest of the body, but found nothing. They determined that the foot did not belong to Randy. It's not known who the foot belongs to or where it came from. 
What is notable is that the person who found the foot was one of the last people to see Randy at the party. He was also the person that his parents saw driving by their house early on the morning that they realized he was missing. In the ensuing years, the man has died. It was never determined if he had anything to do with Randy's disappearance. In 1993, a man going by the names Terry Mern and Lee Harper got in contact with the leeches. He told them he was a research journalist and he offered to investigate Randy's disappearance. It had been five years since Randy went missing and Harold and Alberta were desperate so they accepted his offer. For several months, the man interviewed people who were at the party. He then brought all the information he collected to a detective with the Sheriff's Department. They pooled their information together. Based on that information, in August 1993, the detective arrested three men. One of the men was the suspected Satanist who was at the party on the night Randy vanished. But then, the county attorney went over the information and he did not think that the evidence showed probable cause. So the three men were released within 24 hours of being arrested. No other arrests have been made in the case. The leeches have complained that the Sheriff's Department and the Kansas Bureau of Investigation have not been forthcoming with information. In 2017, 29 years after Randy disappeared, they filed a lawsuit to make the records on the investigation into his disappearance public. The judge ended up ruling against them and the files are still confidential. In 2018, Timothy Dennis, who was with the Kansas Bureau of Investigation and was the lead investigator on Randy's case from 2000 to 2010, spoke to the Kansas City Star. He dismissed the idea that Randy was killed by a satanic cult. He said that the speculation about Satanism was related to the satanic panic that was sweeping America in the 1980s. He thinks that Randy's disappearance was an accident. There were two routes between Randy's home and the farm where the party was held. One was a main highway and another was a back road. If Randy was intoxicated, he probably would have driven home on the back road to avoid being pulled over by the police. On that road, there was a single lane bridge that went over a stream of water called Stranger Creek. There were no guardrails on the approach to the bridge. Timothy Dennis believes that Randy drove off the road and into the creek. He learned in the 10 years after Randy went missing, Stranger Creek was not searched. When it was searched, no trace of the car or Randy were found. However, Dennis believes that the car and the body were pushed downstream, or the car sunk in the sediment, making it impossible for searchers to find. The leeches do not think that this is what happened. They said that the creek was not searched because the water was too low and it would have been evident that a car was in the water. In 2019, Harold and Albert Leach asked the new governor of Kansas to appoint someone from out of state to lead a task force to investigate Randy's disappearance. The governor's office released a statement saying that the governor was sympathetic to the Leaches, but she did not have the legal authority to do something like that. It's been over 32 years since Randy Leach disappeared. Harold and Alberta Leach, who are now in their 70s, still hold out hope that they'll find out what happened to their only child. Number 1. Sarah Avon July 21, 1981 was an unusually cool summer night in Joliet, Illinois. Sarah Avon, who was six and a half years old, was playing outside with her younger sister and other neighborhood children. Sarah was described as feisty, but less outgoing than her five-year-old sister, Marie. Sarah's teacher thought she was hungry for attention. 
Sarah was involved in her church. She took swimming lessons, played soccer, and took ballet lessons. Sarah and her sister live with their mother, Jane, and their stepfather, Francis. Jane and Francis owned and operated an auto body shop on the same street where they lived. At about 8.30 p.m., a neighbor came over for cake and coffee. Jane was about to call the girls in, but she remembered they wanted to stay out and catch fireflies. So she let them stay out and play. At 8.50, Jane called for Marie and Sarah to come inside. But only Marie came home. Marie was surprised that Sarah wasn't home because she hadn't seen her in a while. Sarah had gotten into an argument with another child and she stormed off. Neighbors heard that Sarah was missing and they began to search for her. At 9.10 p.m., James called the police and reported Sarah missing. Two officers came to their house, but they didn't think it was a big deal. They thought that Sarah had just fallen asleep in a bush somewhere and she would come home at any time. At 11 p.m., a new sergeant came on duty. She called James and asked if Sarah had been found. James said that they hadn't found Sarah and she was frantic. The sergeant immediately sent more officers to the area and canine units were brought in. But they could not find any trace of six-year-old Sarah Avon. No one had seen anything unusual in the neighborhood that evening. It appeared that Sarah simply vanished into thin air. Sarah's mother thought that her kidnapper was possibly someone who lived in the neighborhood. She thought that this explained why no one saw anything unusual. Also, Sarah might have been more likely to go somewhere with someone she knew. While it was a plausible explanation, it did not lead to the discovery of her whereabouts or the identity of the kidnapper. For years, the case sat cold. Then in early 1993, a man named Robert Today went to the police in Joliet with a strange story. Today told the police that his uncle, Ernest Wilson Sr., was on his deathbed in Arkansas. Because of his condition, he could not talk. But it appeared he had something he wanted to communicate. So they gave him a piece of paper and a writing utensil. He drew a triangle, and then he drew a circle inside the triangle. No one knew what it meant. But then today, remember that his uncle and his cousins used to live in Joliet. They lived on Miller Ave, about a mile and a half from Sarah's home. They moved out of state less than a year after Sarah went missing. Today told the police that his uncle had several children. He had one son and several daughters. His daughters would babysit Sarah. Sarah was at their home two days before she went missing. The Wilson's family house in Joliet was on a triangular shaped lot. They said that later, Wilson's only son confided in him. He was 15 years old at the time of Sarah's disappearance. Today said that his cousin had a history of mental illness. Before his uncle's death, his cousin had spent 12 years in a psychiatric hospital in California. Today said that his cousin told him that he and another boy took Sarah back to his house. He admitted that he sexually molested Sarah in the basement of their house. He said that afterward, he went upstairs and she was still alive and he said he didn't kill her. The day concluded that his cousin most likely kidnapped and killed Sarah, and that his uncle buried Sarah's body on the property to protect his son. He thought that the drawing was his uncle's form of a deathbed confession, and it indicated where Sarah's body was buried on the property on Miller Avenue. The police thought that Robert Today's story was interesting, even though they found holes in it. 
When today approached them, the lot was vacant. There had been a fire two years earlier which destroyed the house and then the basement was filled in. The police brought search dogs and special sonar equipment to the lot. They found nothing to indicate that a body had been buried on the lot. But they decided it was worth investigating and they started excavating the lot. However, after several days of digging, they found nothing and they gave up on searching. Several people were critical of the search. One government official who was involved in the search did not think a large enough area was excavated. Another person who was critical of the search was a man who lived in the neighborhood when Sarah went missing. He was a teenager at the time and he knew the Wilson family. He had been a frequent guest in their home. He recalled that one night in 1981, which is the same year Sarah went missing, he was out on a late night walk and he saw Ernest Wilson Sr. doing something unusual. He was digging a large hole with a shovel. He was chest deep in the hole. He asked Wilson what he was doing. Wilson said he was digging a hole because he was planning on transplanting some sunflowers there. The man said that the incident happened so long ago that he didn't remember if he saw Wilson digging the hole around the time of Sarah's disappearance. The man also said that he went out another night and he saw Wilson doing some more strange yard work. He saw Wilson bulldozing some trees and piling dirt in a different area of their property. Later, the Wilson's above ground pool was moved to the area where he was doing the bulldozing. He thought that this was odd because the pool had been in a sunny spot and then it was moved into the shade. The man thought that Wilson might have moved Sarah's body from the original burial spot. The man noted one other odd thing about the Wilson home. For years in the basement, they had two alumina coolers. One was branded with 7UP logos and the other with Coca-Cola logos. At some point, he noticed that the 7UP cooler was missing. However, once again, he couldn't remember when all this happened because it happened over a decade earlier. When the man found out that the Wilson's former property was being excavated, he went to watch it. He did not think that the searchers were digging deep enough, so he told them about the strange nighttime yard work that Wilson had done. They told him to mind his own business and to go away. Nearly 40 years later, Sarah Avon has never been found dead or alive. If she is alive, she is 45 years old at the time of this video. Many people believe her body is in the 7-Up cooler and the cooler is buried on the lot where the Wilsons used to live on Miller Avenue. Number 3. Karen Beard In early 1991, Karen Beard was 35 years old. Karen had two daughters with her ex-husband, Reese Beard. Karen and Reese got divorced five years earlier in California. Their separation led to a bitter custody dispute. Both Reese and Karen accused each other of adultery, drug dealing, drug abuse, and alcoholism. In 1987, Karen missed a custody hearing and the custody of the two girls was given over to Reese. Not long after Reese got custody, he and the two girls moved back to his hometown of Kingston, Tennessee. Kingston, which is in Roan County, had a population of about 4,500 people. Reese's parents were prominent citizens in the county. His mother, Dr. Carolyn Beard, who was the director of the Roan County Health Department, and his father, Dr. Craig Beard, was a well-known dentist. Karen ended up following her ex-husband and her children to Roan County. She got an apartment in Harriman. Karen had a history of drug addiction. She had used cocaine and methamphetamine. 
But her family said in the early 1990s she had gone clean because she wanted to be a good mother. In early 1991, Karen was working as a waitress at a restaurant in Lenore City, Tennessee. She was fighting to get custody of her two daughters. Karen was seven and a half months pregnant. In January 1991, there was a custody hearing for Karen and she missed it. Karen's lawyer, Brenda Hall, thought it was strange that Karen would miss the hearing because Karen had worked so hard to try to get custody of her daughters and Hall thought she had a good chance of winning. So Hall reported Karen missing. Hall went with the police to Karen's apartment. They got inside of it and found nothing was out of sorts. There were no signs of a struggle and nothing had been stolen. In the apartment, they found Karen's purse, wallet, and car keys. Brenda Hall said it was eerie, like a poltergeist took her away and left everything else behind. The police then tried to retrace Karen's last steps. The last time she was seen alive was over a week earlier, on January 15, 1991. She had dropped off her daughters at the home of her former parents-in-law. The next day, Karen was supposed to work, but she didn't show up for her shift. Her co-workers asked the police to do a welfare check. An officer went over to her apartment and knocked on her door. No one answered, so he left. That same day, a towing company in the area got a phone call from a woman claiming to be Karen Beard. She gave them directions to her car and said she wanted it towed. But, for whatever reason, the car wasn't towed. The person who took the call listened to a recording of Karen's voice. He said that wasn't the voice of the woman who called him. Karen's car was found abandoned near the banks of the Clinch River, less than a mile from Karen's in-laws' home. There were no clues as to what happened to Karen in the car. It did not take long before the case went cold. The investigator said that they do not believe that Karen chose to disappear. Instead, they think she was murdered. An investigator with the district attorney's office said that he believes that Karen was taken to a home in Kingston where she was murdered and that her body was disposed of. The main focus of the investigation was Karen's ex-husband, Reese Beard. Karen's lawyer said that Karen was morally afraid of her ex-husband. Two detectives who worked on the case and an investigator from the district attorney's office said that they believed that more than one person was involved in the murder. They also think that someone in law enforcement was involved in the cover-up. One detective said, I always had a feeling that there was someone in the Beard family and someone in law enforcement too, who knew more than they told us. There was just too much cat and mouse going on. When we would go to talk to some people, they were always prepared to pass us off to someone else. The detective said that they had three suspects who they thought knew something about the disappearance. They were described as rough and unsavory characters. They were also Reese's friends. Several years after Karen disappeared, one of the suspects was dying of cancer in the hospital. Word reached the investigator with the district attorney's office that the man wanted to talk. But by the time the investigator got to the hospital, the man fell into a coma that he never woke up from and he died the next day. Another major question surrounding the case that remains unanswered is who was the father of the baby that Karen was carrying. Karen told her sister that Reese was the father. Reese's mother said she didn't even know for sure that Karen was pregnant, but she had heard rumors. She said that Reese had told her that if Karen was pregnant, he was not the father. 
It's been over 30 years since Karen Beard went missing. Her family believes she was murdered. Karen's sister didn't explain why she thought this, but she believes her sister's remains were put into a metal box and dumped into the river. Karen's family, including her two daughters, hopes that her remains will be found one day soon. Number 2. Darlene Tucker and Jensenia Stonehouse Oakville, Ontario, Canada is a town situated on the banks of Lake Ontario. It's in between Hamilton and Toronto. In the early 1980s, it was home to about 75,000 people. In early 1983, 16-year-old Darlene Yvonne Tucker lived in Oakville with her family. On Valentine's Day 1983, Darlene got into an argument with her mother. It turned out that Darlene was pregnant for the second time. She had already given birth to one child and put it up for adoption. After the argument, Darlene moved in with her boyfriend and his family. But that only lasted a few weeks. Darlene had supposedly been seeing a man who lived in Toronto and her boyfriend didn't like that. They got into a fight and Darlene left his house. After Darlene's boyfriend and his family didn't hear from her for a week, her boyfriend's father reported her missing. The police talked to Darlene's mother, Barbara. Barbara said that in the month after Darlene was reported missing, she called home several times. She had a call collect from a payphone in Huntsville. Huntsville is a tourist town about 150 miles north of Oakville. But after those phone calls, Darlene fell of contact with her family. Jensenia Stonehouse, who went by Jan, was a friend of Darlene's. Like Darlene, Jan was 16 years old. In the summer of 1983, Jan's mother was dying of liver cancer in the hospital. On August 19, 1983, Jan's father reported her missing. Jan's father heard that she may have run away from home because she was afraid because she was pregnant. Her brother said she was afraid of her mother dying. Jan's family was hoping she would visit her mother at least one more time. Sadly, Jan's mother passed away without seeing Jan. Jan did not contact her family in the wake of her mother's death. In fact, she never contacted her family again. In 1985, there was a confirmed sighting of Darlene Tucker. The police in Ontario consider a confirmed sighting to be someone who knew the subject before they disappeared. The witness said that Darlene was working as a waitress in downtown Toronto. There was one more confirmed sighting of Darlene and that was two years later in 1987. She was seen in the Huntsville area which is where she made the collect calls in the month after she left her boyfriend's home. What is notable about the sighting is that Darlene wasn't alone. Supposedly, she was with Jan Stonehouse. Jan's family had a connection to Huntsville because they had a trailer there. Since then, there have been other sightings of the two women, but none of the sightings have been confirmed. Darlene had money in a trust account that would go to her when she turned 18 but she never claimed the money. The families of both women believe that they are still alive. In 2014, Darlene's mother, Barbara, had a message she wanted to tell Darlene and she told it through missingkids.ca. She said, we don't want to disrupt your life. We just want to know that you're alive and well. We miss you and we love you. We want her to know that we are still thinking of her. In the years since Jan went missing, her father has also passed away. Jan's surviving family members are hoping that she will contact them if she is still alive. 
After an article about the disappearances was published in 2014, several tips came into the police. One tip said that the women were alive and living in Ontario under different names. The police followed up on these tips, but they didn't find the women. The following are descriptions of the young women at the time they disappeared in 1983. Darlene Tucker was white with blue slash hazel eyes and dark brown shoulder length hair. She was 5 foot 4 and weighed 119 pounds. She had a 1 inch scar above her right eyebrow and another 1 inch scar above her right knee. One of her more noticeable features is a gap between her front two teeth. Also, Darlene had an allergy that caused the skin on her hands to blister. Jan Stonehouse was white with green eyes and wavy shoulder length blonde hair. She was 5 foot 4 and weighed 110 pounds. It's been about 38 years since the families of Darlene Tucker and Jan Stonehouse have seen or heard from them. If they are alive at the time of this recording, Darlene and Jan would be 54 years old. Their families are hoping that they are still alive and that they'll contact them. Number 1. Selena Mays Selena Mays was born on May 28, 1984 in Miami, Florida. Her mother, Lynn Vitale, was an exotic dancer and her father, C.J. Mays, was a part-time musician. Selena weighed just two and a quarter pounds when she was born. Lynn and CJ were both drug addicts and CJ also drank. Their relationship was rocky and there were allegations of abuse. The family eventually moved to Palmyra, New Jersey. But Lynn and CJ did not end up staying together. After the split up, Selena lived with her mother, Lynn. Lynn managed to kick her drug habit in the early 1990s. She also managed to get a job as a custodian with the Palmyra School Board. Lynn and Selena attended church regularly and they did charity work. CJ also got heavily involved in religion. His sister was the leader of a Pentecostal church called the Gospel of Christ Ministries, Inc., and it was based in Mount Holly, New Jersey. The congregation had about 60 people. CJ got married, and his wife was the secretary of the church. CJ worked as the church's bookkeeper. In May 1994, Lynn suffered a brain aneurysm and died suddenly. Lynn's family fought for custody of Selena. But since CJ was her biological father, he was granted custody of her. Selena moved into her aunt's house in Willingboro, New Jersey, which isn't far from Mount Holly, where the church was located. Selena lived with her father, stepmother, aunt, cousin, and several other relatives. It was a strict household, and there were a lot of rules for Selena. For example, she was not allowed to go outside and play. Selena was also homeschooled. Despite the strict rules that surrounded her, something shocking happened just before Selena's 12th birthday. She became pregnant. She told the obstetrician that her boyfriend was 16 years old and not a member of the church. It's believed that's the only thing that Selena said about the father of the child. It was decided that Selena would keep the baby. Selena's due date was December 29, 1996. On December 13th, she went and saw her obstetrician. The next night, Selena was at home and she went to bed around 11 p.m. The next morning, CJ discovered that 12 year old Selena was missing. Pillows had been positioned under the blankets to make it look like she was sleeping in bed. She left behind some notable things, like her prenatal vitamins, her purse, 
and her favorite compact disc. Selena was reported missing that day. The authorities desperately wanted to find Selena because she was just two weeks shy of her due date. Since she was 12 years old, her body was not developed enough to give birth vaginally. But Selena's due date came and went and there was no word from her. Selena Mays has been missing ever since. There are many theories as to what happened to Selena Mays. Selena's mother's family believes that CJ and the church are hiding her. There were allegations from family of current members and former members that the church was cult-like. The church was also accused of using brainwashing techniques. CJ and his sister, who was the head of the church, denied that they were a brainwashing cult. The police noted that members of the church were uncooperative with their investigation. CJ told the media that the church was not the reason Selena ran away. CJ accused Selena's mother's family of being behind her disappearance. He thinks that they are hiding Selena and her child from him. Before Selena disappeared, CJ told her several times that he would do paternity tests if she didn't tell him who the father was. Instead of going through all that, Selena simply ran away with her mother's family's help. Another theory is that Selena is dead. Some people have speculated that she died in an amateur abortion. Another possibility is that the baby's father killed her and then hit her body so she wouldn't reveal his identity. If he were older than 18, he could have been charged with rape. But there is no evidence to substantiate any of these theories. The identity of the father of Selena's baby is also a mystery. One relative believes that the father is a boy whom Selena met while roller skating. The police think that the father is Selena's 21 year old cousin who lived with her. The man had fathered seven children with four different women. He denied being the father of Selena's baby. The police know that someone knows something about Selena's disappearance. They are hoping that person will come forward and shed some light on the mystery. It's been 24 years since Selena Mays went missing. If she gave birth and the child is still alive today, they would be 24 years old. Selena would be 36. There have been a few sightings of Selena since she went missing, but none of them have been confirmed. Selena was 12 years old when she went missing. She was 5 feet tall and weighed 120 pounds, but that was when she was 9 months pregnant. She is biracial with long black wavy hair and brown eyes. Her eyebrows grew into each other. Both sides of Selena's family said that they hope she is still alive and that she'll contact them just to let them know she's alive. Number 3. Pierre Merson In the fall of 1996, Pierre Merson was 21 years old and he lived in Thornhill, which is a city in the greater Toronto area. On Halloween night, Pierre was going out not just to enjoy the festivities, but he was also going out to celebrate recently graduating from a government course. That night, Pierre was dressed in green army fatigues, a green wool hat, an army poncho, and a long black wig. His mother, Norma, dropped him off at the Six Sports Bar in the neighboring city of Richmond Hill. Around 2 a.m., Pierre called his mother, Norma, and asked her to pick him up. She told him she would get him at an intersection near the bar. About 15 minutes after the call, Norma arrived at the intersection, but her son was nowhere to be found. There were other people outside the bar and the band was loading their equipment onto a truck. Norma asked of the patrons if they had seen her son. 
A few people said that they saw him leave a little while ago. Other people thought he had gotten into a taxi. Some other people thought he went to a nearby cafe. Norma went into the bar and looked around. On her table, she found her son's poncho, but no other trace of Pierre was found in the bar. Norma never saw her son again. She reported him missing that night. In 1997, the police said they had a suspect and they arrested him. However, he was released the same day due to lack of evidence. Pierre's family was devastated by his disappearance. Norma spent countless hours posting missing persons posters. Pierre's brother, Alexander, went door to door asking if anyone had any information about his brother's disappearance. Alexander eventually moved to Florida. Up until the bar permanently closed, the family held annual vigils. Pierre went missing in York Region and the York Region Police Department only has one cold case investigator. He said that Pierre didn't have any reason to disappear and his bank account has not been touched since that night. So he doesn't think he chose to disappear on his own accord. Pierre also didn't have any enemies. The investigator thinks that Pierre happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. This makes his case even more difficult because the person responsible for his disappearance probably had no connection to him. They were probably strangers to each other. Investigators believe that Pierre Masson is dead. If he isn't, at the time of this recording, he would be 46 years old. Pierre Marsan is described as 5'11", Caucasian male with brown hair and hazel eyes. Number 2. Patricia Spencer and Pamela Hobley Escoda is an unincorporated area in Michigan. It's situated at the mouth of the Osabo River and it's a popular spot for trout fishing. On Halloween Day 1969, Escada High School received a bomb threat, so the students were sent outside while the school was searched. Two students, 16-year-old Pamela Hobley and 15-year-old Patricia Spencer, decided to use the opportunity to leave school and skip their afternoon classes. The girls were considered acquaintances, but they weren't close friends. That evening, the high school was holding their homecoming football game and there was going to be a Halloween party afterward. Both Pamela and Patricia planned on attending the game and the party, but neither of them did and they did not return home that night. Their families reported them missing. Initially, the police thought that the girls might be runaways, but neither girl brought their purse, identification, or things like extra clothes with them. Also, both girls were close to their families and they had no reason to run away. When the young women didn't contact their families within days or weeks of their disappearance, the police realized that they may have met with foul play. The investigators tried their best to trace their last steps. A person came forward and he said he gave them a ride to a gas station that was a short distance from the school. The young women were last seen walking on a road not far from the gas station. No one has any idea where they were going. Sadly, the police had very few leads and it wasn't long before the case went cold. In 1985, 16 years after the girls disappeared, the police received a tip. They said that two local men murdered the girls. Then their bodies were buried near a bar that was a popular place for teenagers to have parties. The area was searched with cadaver dogs, but nothing of interest was found. A new investigator took over the case in 2010, 41 years after the young women went missing, but he didn't make much progress. There are simply not enough clues to go on. He said that there is a person of interest, but he did not reveal his identity or why he is considered a person of interest. 
Most people believe that the wrong person or persons picked the girls up. They were murdered and then their bodies were disposed of. The families of the two young women have accepted that they are probably dead. They are still hoping to get closure by finding out who killed them and what he, she, or they did to their bodies. It's been 52 years since Patricia Spencer and Pamela Hobley disappeared. If they are alive today, Patricia would be 67 and Pamela would be 68. Number 1. Hyun Jung Song Hyun Jung Song was born on February 25, 1980 in South Korea. In 1995, she moved to Springfield, Virginia to live with relatives. In the United States, she adopted the name Cindy. She graduated from high school and then enrolled at the Pennsylvania State University. She was majoring in integrative arts. On Halloween night 2001, Song, who was 21, went to a bar called Players Nightclub. She was wearing bunny ears, a pink sleeveless shirt with a picture of a rabbit on it, and a white tennis skirt with a cotton button tail on the back of it. Song left the bar at about 2 a.m. and then she went to a friend's home. She stayed there for at least 90 minutes. Then sometime between 3.30 and 4 a.m., one of Song's friends dropped her off at her residence on campus. Then 21-year-old Hun Jung Song vanished into thin air. Three days after she was last seen, Song's friends reported her missing. The police searched her room. They did not find any signs of forced entry or a struggle. They found Song's cell phone and it had been turned off. There were no incoming or echoing calls around the time she disappeared. Her purse with her credit cards, driver's license, and keys were missing. None of her friends had any idea who would want to hurt her. She didn't have any enemies or personal problems. Her friends said that she wasn't depressed, so they doubted that she would have taken her own life. There are several theories regarding what happened to Song. One is that she was kidnapped from her residence. Another theory is that she walked to a nearby store and she was kidnapped along the way. Months after Song disappeared, at the end of January 2002, the police announced that the case was inactive because there was no new leads to pursue. Two years later, the police got a promising lead. The police in Monroe County, Pennsylvania were investigating a home invasion. They narrowed in on a suspect, Paul Weekly. Weekly admitted that he and his partner, 30-year-old Hugo Slinsky, a convicted bank robber, committed the home invasion. Weekly told the police that Slinsky had a property in Kingston Township, Pennsylvania. He said that five bodies were buried on the property. The police went to the property and they found the remains of five people. Weekly told the police that Slinsky used to be involved in criminal activity with another man named Michael Kurkowski. Kurkowski had been a pharmacist but he had been arrested and convicted of selling painkillers without a prescription. Weekly said that early on November 1st, 2001, Slinsky and Krakowski were cruising around the campus where Song lived. Slinsky saw Song walking and thought that she was a prostitute, so they grabbed her. They ended up locking her in a walk-in safe and she died a few days later. DNA testing was done on the bodies found buried on Slinsky's property. Another remains were Hung Young Song. The police were not able to ask Michael Gorkowski if the accusations were true. One of the five bodies that they recovered was his body. On May 3, 2002, Slinsky and Weekly went to Gorkowski's home. Krakowski's girlfriend, 36-year-old Tammy Lynn Fassett, was there. They got Krakowski and Fassett inside and they bound them. They beat and tortured Krakowski until he revealed the location of the money 
from the sails of the painkillers. Then they used plastic ties to strangle 37-year-old Michael Krakowski and 36-year-old Tammy Lynn Fassett. Then they were buried on Selinski's property. Two other bodies that were buried on the property were 29-year-old Frank James and 22-year-old Adai Keeler. Weekly said that on May 14, 2003, Slinsky and another man, 33-year-old Pat Russin, robbed them and then shot them to death with shotguns. Then their bodies were buried in a pit and then the remains were buried on the property. The police have never publicly identified the fifth body that was buried on the property. Hugo Slinsky was charged with four counts of murder in addition to the charges stemming from the January 2003 home invasion. On October 10, 2003, Slinsky and another inmate managed to escape from jail by climbing down a rope made from bed sheets. Slinsky turned himself in three days later. A month later, Pat Russin pleaded guilty to two counts of third degree homicide. He was sentenced to 10 to 20 years of prison. In February 2006, Hugo Slinsky went to trial for the murders of the two drug dealers, Frank James and Adai Keeler. The trial lasted two weeks. Slinsky was acquitted in the murder of James, and the jury was deadlocked when it came to the murder of Keeler. He was convicted of abusing their corpses. In June 2008, Paul Weekly was sentenced to life in prison for his role in the murder of Michael Gorkowski and Tammy Lynn Fassett. In July 2009, Slinsky was found guilty regarding all the charges from the January 2003 home invasion. In September 2009, he was sentenced to 32 and a half years to 65 years of prison. Finally, in January 2015, Slinsky went to trial for the murders of Michael Krakowski and Tammy Lynn Fassett. He was ultimately found guilty of both murders. He was sentenced to life in prison. Hugo Slinsky has never said if he was involved in the disappearance of Hung Young Song. Paul Weekly said that Slinsky told him that he buried her body in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. The police said they have not confirmed what Weekly told them about Song's disappearance. They did say that he was truthful and accurate in everything else that he told them, so they have no reason to doubt him. As a result, the police think that Hugo Slinsky is a viable suspect in Song's disappearance. 48-year-old Hugo Slinsky is currently serving a sentence at the State Correctional Institution at Fayette in LaBelle, Pennsylvania. If Hong Young, Cindy Song, is still alive at the time of this video, she will be 41 years old.